Good morning and welcome to Youth Media Conference organized by Avantis and Young Media Sharks here in uh, Riga. Often we have uh, summer media camps where youngsters run around, do some workshops, listen to lectures uh, and uh, engage in media production. And then we have some events in Riga, some speeches, some also workshops. But uh, this time we have this uh, very first uh, conference. A youth media conference and uh, this is important because uh, we live in an age where youth is very active in creating media co uh, content and at the same time consuming media content and we are here to build a bridge between the two and kind of connect with the large media organizations to co incorporate and uh, engage with young media makers. None of this could happen without the support. And for several years, uh, our uh, one of the largest supporters uh, here in Latvia for youth media initiatives has been the, the embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. So please welcome uh, for the opening remarks, uh, the ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Her Excellency, Mrs. Claudia Peters. Well, yes, well, yes. Labrit conferences Dalitniaki un Klausitai, Merio Experti un Enthusiasti, Jauniashi. As Lioti Prietsaios, Jus Visus, Shodien, Zweigt Young Media Sharks, Jauniashu Media Conference, ISPEAS un Itzai Sinaiumi. Manis als Claudia Peterse un Es Ersmu Niederlandis Vesnietze, Latvia. Es Jerados Latvia Augusta un Esmus Esmu Dirdeusi Dauts iet ves moiosu stastu par Latvias jauniešem un viņu talantiem. Es vēl mācos runāt latviešu valodā, tādēļ es diemšel pariešu uz angļu valodu. As I was saying, I'm very, very happy to address you and to meet you all here today. I'm very proud to see that young media sharks are swimming out in the ocean. An open ocean of opportunities to be more precise, successfully organizing this high-level conference that will connect media experts, policy makers and young talents. Over the past two years, my embassy has been a partner of the Young Media Sharks Camp, organized by NGO Avantis. And it's a great pleasure to work with you all again. One might ask, why is the Dutch Embassy involved in this project? Because our countries, the Netherlands and Latvia, are solid partners. We are like-minded countries that share the same fundamental values. And we work together in European Union, in the United Nations and NATO, and many other organizations. Both of our countries benefit from strong and resilient societies, also in information space, and therefore, the Netherlands is an active partner of Latvian organizations that support strong and independent media. This week, we celebrated the International Day of Education. This day reminds us how important it is to never stop learning. And we can learn so much from each other, especially from young people. Youngsters are the ones who deeply care about their country, who understand the important issues and who know in what future society they want to live in. So dear youngsters, your creativity, enthusiasm and courage, combined with the freedom of expression is exactly what the world needs. We need you to think critically, analyze content, to never stop asking questions and to inspire the world with creative and refreshing ways of thinking. It is our task and my task today to encourage youngsters to speak up and make their voices heard. We believe that to the training of today's new generation is the basis for tomorrow's strong and professional world. Each one of us, government representatives, media professionals and youngsters play an important role in this process. To together we can create a dialogue, share experiences and face challenges, all to strengthen our information space. And this conference is an exact excellent example of how to do just this without any borders. It is also my pleasure to announce that tomorrow 
you can join an online masterclass by Dutch podcast producer Paolo Destilo, in which he will explain how he created his own podcast series called Europe Matters to get young people involved in EU current affairs. I would like to conclude by thanking the NGO Avantis and the organizers of the conference for their wonderful work. I wish you all fruitful discussions and now it is time to really get started. Valdies. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia, for, for opening uh, remarks uh, and uh, giving us the inspiration to start the uh, conference. And um, uh, for the next uh, opening speaker, I would like to invite uh, the mother of all media sharks here in Latvia. It's Ilona Bichewska, the founder of Avantis and founder of Young Media Sharks. Come inside, I will give you a microphone. Can I sit down? Yeah, you can sit down if you want. Sure. Uh, so, what this conference is about, actually, and why, why does it matter? Hello, everyone, and good morning, Labri. Uh, this conference we made because summer camp uh, was not possible. <laughs> and yeah, we know. <laughs> after seven uh, years of uh, educating young, youngsters age of 14, we already see how they grow, how they going to professional field and what challenges they are facing. From the one hand, there is youngsters who cannot maybe successfully enter to the market. And from other hand, I'm as a film and movie producer, see other part of the professional field where media and uh, adults, they are like reaching for youngsters and they can't get them. And I see, wow, what's the actually problem? <laughs> And uh, that's why this conference, we can uh, find out what's uh, been, uh, what research has been done on a topic. We will have uh, very good speakers uh, about how influence media youngsters and how uh, in long term. And then also we will have good examples how classical media can collaborate with uh, youngsters and uh, use the, their talent for public good. And I really hope that this conference will make a little magic to further uh, fr fruitful collaborations. Yeah, so it is about uh, understanding youth media, understanding youngsters, uh, learning, teaching uh, young media makers, and of course, building this bridge between the large media organizations and uh, young media creators. Yes, and uh, our guests will be university professors, students, also uh, YouTubers, and also uh, friends from uh, Europe, from large uh, media companies who already had experience for several years to make this collaboration happen. So we Latvia will want to be also in a top in Europe to be also leader in collaboration, media and use. That's why this conference. Great. And uh, let, let us remind uh, ourselves that this is uh, visible on several platforms actually. This is uh, visible on Facebook, on YouTube, on uh, LSM LV, which is public service media. Uh, platform in Latvia and also some parts of this conference will be visible to the uh, on, on TVNet as well, also internet platform. And if you want to see the full uh, schedule of the conference, you go to youngmediasharks.eu webpage where all the schedule, all the speakers and all the uh, workshops are there. This is happening for two days. Yep. Incredible. And and uh, one person who has been connected with, uh, with, uh, with, with Young Media Sharks, who is actually a Young Media Shark, and, but has been engaged for several years in this uh, uh, creating media content and seeing this from all perspectives is Artur Sienots. Uh, Artur, are you there? I'm here, do you hear me? Yes. So what do you think, Artur, is, uh, is what might we expect from uh, this conference? What would be the outcome? What might be the outcome? And what should be the outcome of this conference? Uh, well, I hope that this conference uh, will spotlight the opportunities for both sides, uh, for you and also for uh, the big media sharks. Uh, and I hope that because of this, uh, there will be a new content and new media projects made and it will give the necessary push for those who can decide to uh, create something or not. And I hope they will and it will be meaningful content and meaningful media projects. 
no matter uh, if it's uh, in YouTube or TikTok or, or, or in these huge media sites that we have in Latvia and in other places in Europe. I see, Arthur, that you are also doing a workshop later today and the title of this uh, workshop is very encouraging. It's uh, named Enthusi Enthusiasm is not a fuel in long term. So yes. what's behind this <laughs> title? Can you, can you briefly uh, tell about your wor specific workshop? Well, I, I don't want to give you like uh, unnecessary spoilers, so you will <laughs> You would come and, and see yourself uh, what I will talk about. But uh, long story short, I will give uh, the formula uh, from my perspective what you need to create uh, something, whatever it is. Uh, and so it can be um, like a long term project. So it won't stop for uh, such obstacles like money or uh, burnout or whatever it could be. So, th that's like long story short. Okay, great. I'm looking forward to your to your workshop. That's, this will be at uh, 4 o'clock uh, in, the, in the afternoon. So, thank you, Arturs. And um, I think we have done enough for, for uh, kind of pushing the, the conference to this very beginning. And I have to say that uh, the, the first part for the, these two days will be more like specifically for um, adults, for media organizations, for those who are working from this other side of uh, youngsters, uh, like engaging them in the media content. And let us have some understanding of where we are, what is the background of how they use the media, how they create the media, how they engage with the media. And we have the first uh, speaker today, uh, Anita, Anita Prieda from Latvian Internet Association, and she has done a research uh, around five countries uh, about uh, how kids and and youth and young people uh, experience and engage with the with the content uh, on internet regarding misinformation. That's what we are all scared about. They are sitting for hours and hours on internet, and we have no idea how much of this is true and it is not true. So. Let's see how, where we are with this and what are the main uh, concerns. So I'm giving the word to Anita Priede. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so I share my presentation. So, and then we can start. So, you can see, yes? Yes. Okay. So, uh, I'm very uh, happy to be here. My name is Janika Priede and I'm from uh, Latvian Safer Internet Center. And today I would like to tell you about the research of study, children's experience with misinformation online 2021. So, uh, uh, Latvian was one of the five countries that took part in these studies. Uh, and it was great by, to get better understanding of children's and youth's own perspectives of online and digital aspects of life by listening to them and through quantitative and qualitative creative methods. Uh, no more than ever, it is vital that children and youth have the necessary skills to find out uh, the right content and check the truth uh, of what they see online. In this study, we focus on young people's rights to information uh, by looking into children's and youth experience with misinformation online. So, uh, in autumn of 2021, more than 5,000 uh, 11 to 17 years old from five Nordic and Baltic countries participate in a digital survey. And it was the quantitative part of the research, the results of which you will see in the infographics below. And uh, more than 512 to 15 years old participates in co-creative workshops in schools to share their experience of misinformation online. And it's, this was the quality part of the research. And you will see the results in the young people's stories below. 
So, uh, the quantity findings in the report are based on surveys carried out with children and youth 11 till 17. Uh, in Finland, Sweden, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Uh, the surveys were run through Northstar online panels and uh, six languages, include Russian, in the Baltic countries. Interviews were in October. Each interview was about nine, eight minutes. So, and quality of findings are based on stories written by young people and grades uh, six, nine, and eight to as 12 or 15 years old. Their stories were written during workshops in schools uh, in each of these five participant countries. So uh, the young people work in pairs or groups of three and were asked to write about their own experience. Miro digital whiteboarding was used uh, giving the young people the opportunity to illustrate their stories with images, screenshots, memes, GIFs, like anything else relevant to their online experience. This is all, also my role in this research in Latvia. I run these workshops uh, from uh, one school in Riga uh, for grades six and uh, eight, and one regional school for also grades six and eight. The young people were asked to choose one of the following themes as a framework for their story. The question was like, my experience with misinformation relate to first, my hobbies and interests like influencer content, music, sport, video games. Second theme was uh, my experience with misinformation online relate what is going on in the world like news, public health, climate change, politics. And least but not least, uh, myself, my friends, or people at school, by like gossip, rumors, and secrets. And this was the format uh, in which young people submit their answers. Uh, you can see that the answers were very creative and interesting, and the young people in the workshops very uh, like this creative process. However, I cannot, uh, of course, show you their visual answers because there are copyrights. And this is just example. So what we found. Uh, the results are spread, uh, separate, separate into different themes. And first one is information exchange. Uh, so uh, Nine out of 10 children and young people say that they at least sometimes come across information online that they believe or know to be false or untrue. Like when you are looking for information online, does it happen that you come across information that you believe or know to be false or untrue? Uh, the answer was uh, very often, quite often, sometimes, really, or never. And you see, uh, all the countries have their answers. So, uh, next one, uh, and this is very interesting because uh, uh, online they believe or know to be false and untrue, but in Latvian, uh, young people report it most often, while Estonian uh, young people experience in the last of them. That was interesting. Um, Gossips about famous people is the most common type of information that young people face that they believe or know to be false. Facts about what's going on in the world come in second place. Uh, Latvia is a pink one and Lithuania is a, a blue one. In Latvia and Lithuania, young people say uh, they were more likely to be faced with false facts about what is happening in the world and uh, gossip about famous people come in second place. Uh, almost seven out of 10 young people share information they find online with others. This is somehow more common in the Baltics than Nordics. Uh, Sweden has the lowest percentage of uh, young people that share information with others. Uh, so do you share information that you find online with others and then is following up? Do you do something to check through or the information before you share it? Uh, one of third of young people 
do something to check if the information is trustworthy before sharing it. So, post information about what's going on in the world. For young people aged 12 to 15, misinformation uh, on serious issues can be really worried and have a negative impact on their daily lives. They are old enough to know that there are real threats that they should be aware of, but at the same time, it can be difficult of them to distinguish between correct information and the wildly overblown stories that circulate online. Like there is an uh, example from young people experience online from quality research in workshops. Uh, there is some experience in Finland. I watch a YouTube video about how the COVID-19 vaccines kill their children. There were a lot of dead kids in the video. I was very distressed. I have taken the vaccine myself. And as I am still alive, I can use my common sense to figure out that this was false information. And there is experience from Latvia. I read online that the polar ice caps will melt and flood the entire planet. Thinking that this was true, I started spread panic among my friends and school. My classmates and I begin putting together backpacks for survivors. In the end, our science teacher managed to convince us that even if the polar ice caps melted, it won't mean a food like that, and definitely not right now. About phishing and scams, in all countries and for all age groups, people are often tempted to click on a link to win something or get something for free. One of the most common examples is clicking on a link to get free in-game items uh, that give an advantage in gaming environment. Like there is experience from Sweden, a friend uh, got an offer via the gaming platform Steam to be able to get free skins in the click it in, on the link. He didn't think twice and clicked. A few hours later, they lost access to this gaming account and discovered something has changed the password so he couldn't no longer log in. When he found out it was fake, he immediately warned his group of friends that he had been scammed. Uh, rumors about famous people. Uh, according to the young people who participate in the workshops, news about famous people can be highly interesting and fun to share with others, and it's very exciting. When I was with the young people and working in the workshops, uh, the news about Kanye West and Jeffree Star was the most popular in uh, celebrities' gossip section uh, in Latvia. Uh, so there is one more example from Latvia. I saw the message for an unfamiliar account on Instagram that the band One Direction was getting back together. And I was very surprised and happy. I instantly sent the news to my friends and didn't even look to see if the news was true. But when I looked more closely at the comments, I saw that everyone was saying it was fake and that this can be made up. Then I Google and found out it was very false. So, about source and credibility. Uh, this actually is very important. Uh, um, well, now, bigger news sites are the most trusted online source by children and youth, especially in Finland, Sweden, and Estonia. Uh, here we can see the difference in media literacy traditions, because in Latvia only 39 of young people trust the news. Uh, we also see that young people in Latvia trust Wikipedia more than news. news. Uh, Latvia is a pink one, and we can see the difference to Latvia and Finland. Uh, no, Wikipedia is trusted by half of the young people. YouTube is trusted to higher degree in the Baltics, and same goes for Facebook. Uh, so, uh, this is interesting. Uh, YouTube is trusted to greater extent by boys and young people age uh, 11 till 13. 
And so we can see uh, the age group is purple and uh, girls are uh, blue and boys are pink. And you can see the YouTube uh, uh, boys like new, uh, in this age group, YouTube more than girls. Not like, but like um, uh, um, use like website, do you believe to be trustworthy? That is important. So about social media, according to the young people, stories on Instagram uh, is common channel where they see misinformation. The stories testify both. So, um, how false rumors about, about cel celebrities and spread and to uh, spread to ads with links about fake offers, which can be spread via post or message or on Instagram. Other common source of misinformation from the young people's stories is TikTok, where they encourage fake news as well as a fake uh, offers and ads. In Finland and the Baltics, uh, WhatsApp is also mentioned as a channel for spreading misinformation. So there is uh, one uh, experience from Finland. There is misinformation almost every day in the social media platforms we use, Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok. It's really sad because there are more and more young kids using social media most often, they want to pass on this incorrect information really quickly. So, about misinformation involving yourself and friends. Um, almost a third of young people have experienced something, someone sharing untrue or lies about themselves on social networks that made them feel uncomfortable. uncomfortable. And girls have experienced this slightly more than boys. Uh, but this is a sensitive, sensitive issue for 12 to 15 years old. Even fourth of young people has been the victim of misinformation themselves. Only a few of them have choose to write about it. Among the stories, there are situations where a group of young people post lies about other person just to be mean. This is typical bullying behavior and can cause serious harm. Sometimes it's difficult to figure out who the bully are. A similar type of misinformation mentioned by CAC youth is when people pretend to be someone else. This is young people of behavior is someone used to make a fool out of someone or to uh, start a rumor. One of even more serious note, it may also be grooming attempt. So there is experience from Latvia. Uh, someone create a chat about kid in our class uh, in school. It was filled with lies about the person. We felt surprised, but also insecure for someone. Uh, it was just a joke. You can actually protect yourself from this type of thing. People can do this and you may not even know about it. If you feel, find out about something like this, you should definitely tell the teacher or parent. You should not keep in yourself and if you are in the chat, you should not just sit and do nothing. So, about fact-checking and verifying information. Uh, young people most often fact-check information they see online if it's uh, for schoolwork. Uh, or relate to hobbies. Uh, only two in five children and you do something to fact check information that influencers post. So we can see uh, Latvia is pink one and we can see how often do you do uh, something to find out if the information is true or not. Uh, and there is uh, answers and you can see the context. So, uh, this is very uh, important because it means that we adults have a responsibility to the younger generation to be media literate because the most common way to check if information is true or not is to ask a parent or family member. 
Uh, and next one is uh, by looking to see in other websites, uh, say the same thing. So what you do typical, do you uh, want to check info online? It is true or not? Then we see uh, the parents uh, and family members is the uh, first one. And this is responsibility for like for us, like a grown-ups. Um, uh, the vast majority of young people, almost uh, nine out of 10, have not reposted false information to the website or social media platforms using reporting tools in place. Results are very similar between age groups and gender. Um, so, uh, about quantity uh, uh, research. According to the results of this um, research, misinformation is misinformation is significant problem for young people today. An overwhelming majority, 90 of 11 to 17 years old, say they have encouraged untrue information online. Clickbait is the most common type of false information young people have encouraged. More than 70 of children and youth have encouraged headlines that turn out to be far less exciting when they click on them. A more serious kind of false information is fake news about what's going on in the world. More than ever, every second young people has been exposed to fake news. And about quantity, uh, quality uh, research from stories by young people who protect participants in this research uh, workshops, we can see the emotions consequence of misinformation. COVID-19 and global warming are scary enough on their own without overselling and lies that can make young people far for their own and their family safety. Another worry for young people online is scams. Several stories reveal how young people have been tricked out of money or gaming currency. It is easy to fall for seemingly attractive offers online without thinking twice. So, we, the Latvian Safer Internet Center, have created materials that reflect the results of this research, as well as participants uh, practical tips how to check information online. I invite you to take a look at these materials on our website. Uh, they are in the Latin language, but they are very good and we are very proud of them. So, thank you for your time. I, I hope this was helpful. And um, yes, thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you, Anita, and uh, really uh, great to see such a comparative uh, survey. Anita, can you hear? Anita, can you hear me? I can hear okay, you. Yeah, because yeah. I just saw you were talking, but okay, that's fine. So yeah, I have a question uh, actually uh, by looking at this, and of course uh, we can say that this misinformation age kind of started and exploded in like eight, some seven, eight years ago, and we are still somewhere there, and it's getting bigger and bigger. And if we compare this with with pandemic, with with COVID pandemic. Uh, we can say that the misinformation spreads as quickly as, as, as viruses. So the call this like infodemic, uh, the, the spread of misinformation. Do you think there is a vaccine or a, a face mask kind of, kind of filtering element that we can apply to protect young people from this? Or this is something that everyone has to experience in their lives lives to get this immune booster so that they kind of uh, encounter this, they have these emotions, they have this bad experience for once, and then they are good for, for the rest of their life. What do you think? <laughs> That's very good, Harry. <laughs> what do you think? Um, 
tool or we, we can say media literacy is one thing, but is there anything else? What do you think? Can we, um, 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 can we improve this? Uh, in, in my personal uh, opinion is uh, that uh, we need, to, of course, education is the key, but uh, I think I like the new generation because they're very aware uh, of emotions and how they feel and, and mental health and stuff like that. And if the people can understand, okay, I see this clickbait and I feel very uh, uh, happy or very, very sad or very angry, then it's like uh, almost they can knowledge, okay, this information made me a little bit mad or stuff like that. I think it's... Uh, it's a lot of things what you need to know. And first of all, is like how you communication with yourself. And that's, I think, because in, in my opinion, but this is my opinion, media literacy is uh, soft skills. And if we uh, teach uh, kids and young people soft skills, then I think it uh, applies to information too, how they acknowledge information. Great, thank you. Thank you, Anita, and yes, uh, Making media is actually one part of uh, media literacy, and by making media, people and youngsters get aware what what kind of tool are in their hands where when they are posting something, and how how this tool can be used in in, in certain bad ways. And of course, if people are aware of this, then then they improve their media literacy, and they can fight and 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 encounter and and uh, get rid of the, the online stuff that's not very good. So uh, thank you, Anita, and uh, let's move on with our uh, conference. We have another speaker coming up. Uh, this will be from uh, Norway, Stephen Geis, and he will talk about the well-being while encountering social media. But let's uh, have a small little break just to make a coffee or tea or to have a snack or two so we will be back at uh, 11 o'clock latvian times that's uh, around uh, about 15 minutes from now so at 11 o'clock we have a presentation from steven guys about social media and the well-being of this young generation stick with us
Okay, we are back. At least I have a tea. I already drink it up, but I hope you have some some hot drink because it's uh, winter time outside and somewhere inside as well. Uh, but um, we continue our uh, youth media conference and uh, we noticed that there's some questions are popping up on uh, some platforms that are showing this uh, live video feed on Facebook and YouTube. You are very welcome to uh, ask questions. We will kind of round up those questions and try to uh, bring these questions up to say these panelists or or speakers that we have so and the next uh, speaker is uh, Stephen Stefan Geis uh, he's a associate professor at uh, Norwegian uh, University of Science and Technology uh, good morning Stefan and uh, you will talk about well-being while uh, using social media and uh, we know that young people use a lot of social media and are there any bad consequences to that? Well, there are, are some probably. So I will give you, uh, I will give you a word to you and uh, you, can, you can start your presentation which is uh, titled A Lost Generation, Long-Term Development of Well-Being Among Social Media Generation. Please, Stefan. Let's see if we can hear you, Stefan. We are checking if uh, the sound quality is good enough. Oh, wait, wait a, a second. second. Okay, we hear you. Good, good. Now you can start. You're hearing? Yes, okay, now that's, you can start. Uh, that's, ah, okay. okay, great. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the for the kind introduction. Um, and. Um, Yes, the, what you, the question you raised, that's very much uh, the question I and some uh, colleagues of mine uh, ask ourselves as well. And there's plenty of uh, research on the question, um, but uh, still some, um, some debates that aren't settled. And that's where, where uh, our study came in. But I want to zoom in um, a little bit more broadly and frame the, the topic a bit in uh, terms of less alarmism around the, uh, the question in uh, how uh, social media affects well-being among uh, the younger generation. Um, yeah, but, but let's see. First of all, um, we all, uh, I guess, recognize the phenomenon that there is major concern uh, about um, the, the uh, consequences and outcomes of uh, social media use of uh, uh, young people, particularly extreme um, intensity uh, of use. Um, probably in the, in the early uh, phase of uh, um, social media spread in society, there was quite some optimism. If you probably remember the, the Arab Spring movement and uh, the way social media were framed there. But um, what you hear now is probably more of the concerns and the negative phenomena that certainly occur. So there's phenomena like cyberbullying, um, like that people uh, waste their time and become unproductive uh, in their social environments, and that um, uh, real life social contacts um, get reduced. So all these phenomena occur. But uh, it's important for us researchers to put this into perspective because basically every kind of activity you do can be overdone and everything can have negative consequences when uh, overdone. Um, so uh, let's. Uh, uh, the, the purpose of the study is to look into the very broad effects and very broad patterns of effects of social media use for the broad mass of uh, young people. Um, and um, the, this negativity 
we see around the the debate uh, in the debates on social media and their their effects um there's two things that come into play there that we should be aware of when we reflect about that first of all there is a phenomenon that i would call the next generation skepticism uh, of us uh, the uh, generation before uh, you you might say um, so there is a relatively general pattern that what youth do is always wrong reason for concern kind of stupid or immoral and uh, from the older generation's point of view um, you probably have uh, heard at some uh, uh, time uh, that already Aristotle blamed the young people for doing everything wrong. Uh, just quoting a few sentences, uh, the young have exalted notions because they have not been humbled by life or learned its necessary limitations. Uh, they overdo everything. They love too much, hate too much, and the same with everything else. Um, so that's from uh, 300 uh, whatsoever before Christ, a long time ago, but a lot of these, these uh, thoughts and concerns ring a bell. And uh, it might be that social media use is just one of the phenomena that older generations anchor this uh, next generation skepticism in. So that's one thing we should be aware of. Um, and it's uh, not like this uh, uh, idealization of the past and the older generations is a, uh, a thing of the past. Um, we see it in, um, in uh, public opinion polls. Um, you see in this graph where this uh, blue line and the green line is there. And that's about how is moral in the US at the moment, that's the green line. And how will it be in the future? That's the blue line. And you see that consistently people kind of think everything's getting worse when it comes to morals, right? And um, that's probably also behind slogans like make America great again, like Nobody really knows when it was so great uh, for everyone. But uh, if you just suggest that there was a past where everything was great, uh, that's super and everything that's modern, um, that's kind of suspicious uh, in the first place. Uh, but what we uh, should also have in mind is uh, when it comes to morals and moral decay, like um, there is good reasons to say that new generations um, uh, impose uh, um, uh, other or uh, 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 different moral priorities and might do some of the ne necessary things uh, that the older generations didn't do. Uh, I'm thinking of the student protests in the 60s um, in Germany against the, the uh, uh, former Nazi establishment that was still in powerful positions in in the country or more recently uh, the um, the uh, climate uh, um, uh, um, climate protection movement so uh, we should take this this moral decay idea with a grain of salt and the other uh, skepticity <laughs> phenomenon uh, that we should be aware of is a general technology skepticism uh, that we have seen, for instance, um, with the advent of cinema, movies, television, um, all kinds of new technologies, particularly media technologies that young people get exposed to. So the pattern is that every new piece of technology will have dangerous effects, particularly on young people whom one views as uh, maybe a, um, a blank sheet that's more shapeable, right? So they don't have this strong uh, predispositions and attitudes yet, and therefore um, effects might surface more, more strongly among them. Um, yes, um, so a few examples of this technology skepticism uh, in when uh, uh, the first railroads were built, um, uh, doctors warned the railroad, uh, or uh, that was a preacher, a preacher warned the railroad comes from hell and anyone who travels this way will go straight to hell. And also physicians warned that passengers would risk uh, brain injury or pneumonia or other, other things. So there, there was some scare around the use of trains, which we wouldn't uh, wonder about very much uh, today. Um, 
there's all kinds of ideas that television makes people lazy, uh, makes people narcotic, but also makes people violent and aggressive. Um, so that's, uh, that's another example. The internet, it gets you addicted, it overloads you with uh, information and so on. And there's phenomena that kind of speak to that. I mean, internet addiction disorder is a reality, uh, uh, most people would probably say, um, but uh, the, uh, uh, one can't simply from the occurrence of negative phenomena assume that they are very white, widespread. Um, they are uh, uh, bad nevertheless for the people uh, affected. Um, gaming is another uh, uh, thing, gaming and school shootings, there's all kinds of speculations uh, in how they are related, but are they really, we don't really know that yet, also because it's a very uh, rare or relatively rare phenomenon, better if it was uh, even rarer or never occurred at all, but that makes it difficult to, to study it uh, from a quantitative uh, perspective. And we see very much the same thing going on uh, with social media and the uh, always on phenomenon where uh, people uh, kind of never uh, settle from uh, following their social media streams and so on. So that's certainly a novel phenomenon and a set of novel phenomena. Um, but uh, like with television, like with cinema, like with trains, <laughs> it's uh, probably very important how you use these technologies and not so much if you use them. Um, so that's always a thing to, to remember. Um, but of course, there is also really serious discussions of plausible mechanisms through which social media could have beneficial or adverse effects on young people, maybe also older people, but let's, let's stick to, uh, to younger people. And um, there's a lot of points, uh, they are all very interesting, um, um, but we see that there's also quite a few mechanisms in how social media might be helpful for youth in uh, various uh, uh, ways. So for instance, it enables global social contacts quite easily, um, and that uh, particularly for people with particular special interests or special expertises, that makes it much easier to exchange about that. Assume that you are a fan of a band that is not very popular in your school or in your place, but it's easy to find people with similar interests somewhere uh, on social media, um, and you can exchange with them, and that might be beneficial uh, for your mental health, uh, for instance. Um, it's probably easier for shy or less connected people to get into touch with others um, and uh, see how beneficial it is for communication in a lockdown during a global pandemic. So that's, that's certainly a plus. Um, it uh, also stimulated new modes of content generation. Uh, um, I assume that not so many people would have developed so good skills as photographers if it weren't to showcase their skills on Instagram. Um, it uh, might facilitate bottom-up organization and grassroots movements, all kinds of environmental groups and so on. Um, that could be a good, a good thing, or you could, you could think that is a good thing. Um, and um, people learn competencies and skills um, in these environments that might be helpful in their later life uh, privately or um, on the job for instance. So um, on the one hand, there is good reason to believe that social capital can be improved on social media, that new skills can be built, and that uh, we can trust uh, to some extent in the self-regulation of uh, persons that they find a way of using these, um, uh, these types of content um, in a way that benefits them or at least doesn't harm them. Um, that's at least the, the view of the more hopeful uh, uh, people and their arguments. Um, on the harmful side, we see, uh, we have that certainly there is competition for the time you can spend on different things, school, 
um, homework, uh, meeting with friends in the real world, and so on, uh, making, uh, doing sports, and so on. So this time displacement argument is a very powerful one. So all the time that you spend on social media is not really usable uh, for other purposes. And even if it's mobile and you can take it with you anywhere, uh, you are most likely not using social media while you're playing soccer. So uh, there's, there's these trade-offs and you might lose touch with the real world, with the real friends, the real family. So these, this type of argument contrasts the, the, the virtual environment very much with the real world environment. Um, um, but there's also concerns about broken attention management through content overload and overstimulation. So we, uh, people might just not be able to handle all the input they get. Um, and uh, a similar out of control mechanism would be addiction, loss of self-control in how much and how you use um, the, um, the, the tools that you have available. Um, of course, the lack of moral orientation argument and that um, online maybe norms are broken uh, more, uh, more easily uh, might even lead to such things as cyber mobbing where people might feel freer to act as perpetrator or at least onlooker. And that also uh, creates more victims probably. But of course, mobbing was a reality in the offline world before. Cyber mobbing uh, is not only a replacement of that, but maybe, or in, in many ways, also an extension of that, but um, it is related to a, a real world phenomenon, so to, so to say, not just a virtual one. Um, yeah, and uh, one more concern is that it encourages unrealistic social comparisons, uh, uh, social psychologists would say. So you follow all these celebrities and so on, and they take a lot of uh, care to present themselves in a positive light. Um, also, your friends uh, do the same, and you might always end up being dissatisfied with your life, your skills, um, and so on, your, your uh, attractiveness, uh, whatever. So this would emphasize that social capital gets lost, classical skills get lost, or their development gets impeded, um, and self-regulation will or might fail. Um, and that's, for me, at least, uh, what the core mechanism, the self-regulation mechanisms of individuals um, work very much like a thermostat in your, in your heating system. So it would always compare what do you want and what do you have? So which temperature do you want and which do you have and will then adjust. And people do very much the same. So they do things on social media. They want to achieve something with that. And then they appraise, did I get that or not? And then they change their behavior if they didn't get what they wanted. And as long as this loop works uh, sufficiently, uh, then uh, um, it's very likely that people find a way of using that in a productive or at least not in a harmful uh, fashion. Um, and um, that means, uh, in turn, that probably a very large share of people find a way of coping with uh, that environment quite okay. But there are certainly vulnerable people in many other contexts as well where this process fails to steer you towards a, a good outcome. Um, so um, the focus would probably need to be on these vulnerable um, sub uh, samples or subgroups um, that need some protection and some intervention and not on a broad phenomenon. So if we imagine that, this is not real numbers, that is just uh, uh, a speculation. So if you imagine that um, you have, um, our data are from Germany, so I'm using Germany as an example. Um, even if you assume that, um, that um, of the 8 million uh, people between 15 and 24 in Germany, 99% would cope well with all this. So 7.9 million people 
use this in a way that's not reason for concern, that in this larger population, it still means that you get 40,000 people probably um, who cope so badly that indicators of, for instance, well-being worsen considerably and there's reason for concern. And 40,000 people isn't something you should take uh, uh, not serious, right? So uh, there is probably a lot of need for intervention and monitoring, but probably not for the 99% uh, that uh, kind of cope good enough with, with all this by themselves, though it can still be improved, um, uh, I'm sure. So uh, the research questions and hypothesis um, uh, we came up with, um, they focus very much on this aspect of well-being, um, uh, uh, particularly with two indicators, mental health and life satisfaction. And I would just like to point out that there is a lot of areas of social media use where it could have negative consequences that we just didn't, um, didn't look into um, empirically. Um, so we didn't look at sleep. We didn't look at social life in terms of friends and romantic relationships. We didn't look at performance of uh, educational success, intelligence, job success, these kinds of things. So uh, this is just subjective well-being uh, uh, on uh, the one uh, uh, hand, one possible um, uh, dimension on which people could suffer from overusing social media. And the, the relatively simple model would be um, that we check out how does uh, an increase in the time budget for social media affect mental health measured as depressive symptomatology, so indicators that you might be depressive, um, and life satisfaction rated by yourself. But uh, if you think about it, it gets a little bit more complicated. On the one hand, we would need to look into other media young people tend to use quite a lot because they also strain your time budget. Um, so these, these time displacement mechanisms might not be so effective because the time you spend on social media, you don't spend on television or regular internet use outside of social media. So it, it's important to consider internet use and TV use as well in order to not mistake um, um, uh, the, or not get wrong this time budget argument. And in addition, we would have to control for other major factors that affect um, well-being. So if you are dissatisfied with your social, um, uh, social environment, are dissatisfied with your friends, for instance, that can uh, contribute a lot to depressive symptomatology or low life satisfaction um, and lack of self-esteem does the same. So um, that's important to consider as well. Um, the study um, I'm presenting um, featured three hypotheses and one research question. I would like to uh, focus very much on the second hypothesis that says, we have individuals that use the internet and social network services, so that social media more frequently um, than before. So over time, they increase their internet and social uh, media use. Um, and the expectation is that they will, their subjective well being would suffer. It would go down basically within their uh, history, uh, their personal history. Hypothesis one, in contrast, looks at differences between individuals. So those who use social media a lot versus those that usually use them only little, how does that affect their, uh, their uh, well being? Um, and uh, the research question is that, does it matter um, uh, whether we uh, include TV use, self-esteem, and quality of social relations into the equation? 
Um, a brief look into the methodology, like what did this study actually do? And that's quite interesting. It's, it's a, a, a very cool design, if you ask me. It wasn't my idea. So uh, what we did is a secondary analysis of this, this big study called PEAR-FAM. Um, so it's basically about the development of uh, young people in the context of their family and their social um um, challenges, uh, romantic relationships, uh, siblings, and so on. So it covers a lot. Um, and um, it is a panel survey. That means the same persons are interviewed several times. In this case, one year apart, nine times between 2008 and 2016. By now, there is three or four additional waves uh, that could be analyzed. Um, and we only look at one specific cohort of people, people be, uh, born between 1991 and 1993. So when Facebook uh, became widely available, uh, these people were um, something between 15 and uh, 14 and uh, 13 and 15. Um, just, just to, to show these are people that um, uh, 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 big part of their youth uh, social media were well available. So you could say they are the first generation uh, social media. Um, in such panel studies, there's a few problems um, that you have to face. So some people you want to interview again and again, they will just drop out. You can't reach them anymore, although they don't want to respond. So that's called panel mortality. They aren't really dying. <laughs> they are just, or, some maybe, but uh, uh, most of the time you just they are just dead for the panel in uh, uh, for panel purposes, and um, they might be replaced by statistical twins, so people with similar characteristics that you recruit later. Um, but our analysis is limited to those who participated from start to finish. Um, and we have to be aware that this kind of study mm, needs a lot of motivation to participate. So there is a systematic bias when you recruit and there's systematic bias in who drops out of the panel. So um, these are probably not uh, fully representative of this age group in Germany. That's uh, to be considered. They might, for instance, be um, more educated. That's a common, common, um, common factor that plays into the uh, participation rate. Good. Um, what uh, were the measurements like? They were very simple. Um, so one question was, how many hours did you watch TV this past week? How many hours did you spend on personal internet use past week? How many hours? And for those who have an online profile, there's a typo there, um, an online profile on uh, one of these, uh, on some social media, the list was adapted, but that was the one they started with, MySpace. So that, that rings uh, 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 some, some, uh, uh, some emotions <laughs> related to the past already. Uh, Facebook and SchülerVZ, which was popular in Germany at the time, but also doesn't exist anymore. And this was, uh, list was updated over time. Um, and then it was asked, how often do you visit the social network websites? And there is a, a six point scale from uh, a lot, like several times per day, to uh, very rarely uh, or less often, less than every few weeks. So that's the time budget. Then we have satisfaction with friends. How satisfied are you with the following domains in your life? And one of the items asked there was friends and social contacts. And you could respond on a 10 point scale from very dissatisfied to very satisfied. Um, Self-esteem was captured by rating, uh, like how much does the statement apply that sometimes I believe I'm worthless, I like myself just the way I am, and all in all, I'm pleased with myself. So um, the first one is about lack of self-esteem and the other two on relatively high self-esteem. And the higher you score in the end uh, on this scale, the higher your self-esteem. Um, and we have depressive symptomatology. So people who would say very often their mood is heavy, 
uh, they are depressed, they are sad, they are desperate or in a bad mood, uh, would score high on depressive symptomatology. Um, and those who are, uh, and they would also rarely say that they are happy, feel good, feel secure, calm and relaxed. And they would almost never feel that life is fun. So this also results in a score. And finally, life satisfaction. Now I'd like to ask you about your general satisfaction with life all in all. Um, and you could rate this between very dissatisfied and very satisfied on a 10 point scale. Um, and the logic of analysis is to break down um, the variation in answers on two factors, the so-called between effects. So the differences between individuals, independent of how they change over time, and the within effects, how in the individual life history of one person, um, these values change over time and how this relates to each other. I skip the last one, that's a bit more complicated to explain and it doesn't really play a role. So to imagine that, imagine you have person blue and person red. Person blue um, has these uh, responses on the 10 point scale, so uh, for life satisfaction. Let's imagine that. And so it goes up and down a little bit, but overall it gets down. And person red has some up and down as well, but in the end, it's more or less stable. For the between effects, you would just choose the uh, average over the whole time for each of the persons and compare them. And then you would say person blue is more satisfied with life than person red. So this is what you see down there. That's the data for the between effects, so to say. And for the within effects, you would disconsider the level of the person and the differences between the two persons and just check how they vary around their average. So there you just see where does it go uh, up and where does it go down for the different persons um, over time. So that's what we're most interested in. Those people who lose in life satisfaction or who lose over time in, uh, in or again, uh, get more depressed over time, is that related to their use of social media? And this was measured uh, not in all of the nine waves, but uh, the, the time budget was measured only in every other wave. Um, life satisfaction and satisfaction with friends was measured in every wave and depressive symptomatology was not measured in the first wave. Um, just uh, as a context, um, in the lower part of the table, I write how old the target group was at the time. So they started between 15 and 17 and they ended between 23 and 25. So that's uh, rather late in the adolescence period. Um, and below that, we have the millions of Facebook users in, in Germany at the time. Um, so you see this really uh, spans uh, the, the time when this became really, really popular uh, in the early 2010s. Probably there was the biggest breakthrough. Okay. Um, what are the results? Um, I, it's, a, it's a quite complicated table. I try to break it down a little bit. First, by looking at the prediction of depressive symptomatology. So what makes people uh, differ, differ in their degree of depressive symptomatology? That would be the between effects. And what makes in the life history of one person depressive symptomatology worse or better? So first of all, we look at different models. Um, first, we just include social media use and internet use in the equation. That explains only 2% of the variation in depressive symptomatology in those people. So it's not explaining a lot of the differences and not a lot of the change over time that we see. If we add television use, that adds one more percent. So we have 3% of the variation that we can attribute to media use. Then we add the control variables. 
how uh, you uh, satisfied you are with your friends and how much self-esteem you have. And this explains a lot. This explains a lot better how uh, uh, the depressive symptomatology changes over time and also how much it differs between persons. So you just have some people who have high self-esteem and are satisfied with their friends and, for, uh, and others don't have that and uh, they have a much higher chance to those who miss out on that have a much higher chance to develop depressive symptomatology. So 65% of the between person variation can be attributed to that. Time doesn't really play a role. So um, uh, that over time, Facebook, for instance, became more popular, social media uh, came uh, to be much more popular. Um, that's not a big deal. It doesn't explain why that people change and doesn't also doesn't explain the differences between people. Um, yes, so just, just as a context, the, the media effects we are dealing with, they are, if they are significant, they are very minor compared to those control variables. Um, the depressive symptomatology uh, received a score between one and 10. So one would mean people are not depressive at all. And 10 means they are very depressive in every way uh, they could indicate. Um, and uh, these models estimate that typically people have something around 3.4 as a score or something between three and, and five as a baseline score before you add other variables. Um, and um, TV use, if we add that, across these equations, it doesn't really explain anything, neither between individuals nor within individuals. So we can largely dismiss television as a cause of depressive symptomatology. And um, for internet use, we see a bit differently. Um, we see that those who use the internet more, they have significantly higher depressive symptomatology. But I will shortly demonstrate um, this is not a big effect. I, I'll show you, uh, show you the predictions uh, later on, uh, and that's quite, uh, uh, quite uh, interesting. Um, but in the life history of an individual, it also doesn't really play a role. So only if we don't consider all the control variables, then it seems to have an effect, but already when we add TV use, then it's no longer so clear. Um, and social media use has no, um, no visible effect on depressive symptomatology either. Um, if, we, if we try to predict nevertheless, like, how would it change individuals' depressive symptomatology if they became from non-users of these media to really heavy users. So imagine Daniela, she has never watched any television. Now she becomes a heavy user and watches TV 50 hours per week. Um, that would mean that her depressive symptomatology score would increase by only 0.25 points. And this effect is not significant, but if, it, uh, yeah, if we still take it seriously, it would only make this small of a difference. Or imagine Denise, she has never used the internet. Now she becomes a heavy user and uses the internet 50 hours per week. Um, and that would also increase her score by 0 0.25 points. Um, it's significant, but only in one of the models. And Martin has never used any social media. Now he becomes a heavy user and uses them several times per day. And his score would only increase by 0 0.08 points on the 10 point scale, not significant in any model. Okay, so uh, there, there is not much to be, to be gained from media use um, regarding depressive symptomatology. But that's probably already close to a clinical depression we might suspect there. So um, what about a softer indicator? What about satisfaction with life? Might that suffer? Um, and again, we can see um, the, the predictions and their quality. And there seems to be something more in there. So between person differences, 
can be attributed to 14 or 15 percent on media use. Then we add the controls, they add something, but not so much as before. So um, they mostly uh, explain the between person differences. So life satisfaction between persons differs because they vary in their self-esteem and because their satisfaction with friends is different. But within the person, it seems like media use might be the stronger factor, actually. And here we have relatively high scores that uh, as baseline scores, so around eight, means that satisfaction with life is very high if everything else is held constant. So it's eight on a scale from one to 10, good for the youth in, in Germany. But what happens when you use more TV? We see that both between persons and within persons, there is a significant negative impact. So using more television makes you less satisfied with your life over time and also explains why some people are more satisfied with their lives than others because they use television less, or at least it correlates with usage of television might of course be uh, to some degree a reflection of uh, uh, that people might resort to TV watching because they are satis dissatisfied with something else, but at least we controlled for satisfaction with friends and self-esteem. So that can't really be uh, uh, the, the, major, the major mechanism. And we see a similar pattern for internet use, particularly between persons but not so much in their individual life history. Uh, there, the effect, if you only use, uh, uh, only um, look at media input, yes, then there seems to be something. But if you add control variables, then it might also just be that your self-esteem goes down, your uh, internet use goes up, and therefore your satisfaction with life uh, goes down. And again, for social media use, we find nothing significant beyond the effects of internet use. So might be that this is just part of the internet use experience and the estimate for, for that. But uh, on top of internet use, um, social media use doesn't change much. Um, again, let's look at what this means, what sense we can make from those numbers. Michael has never watched any television. Now he becomes a heavy user and watches TV 50 hours per week. His life satisfaction score would decrease by 0 0.45 points. So this is quite a bit more than we uh, saw for the depressive symptomatology. Um, and yeah, so that's something we might consider, but that's television, that's not social media. Uh, Boris has never used the internet. Now he becomes a heavy user, he uses it 50 hours per week. Then his life satisfaction would decrease by 0 0.25 points. That's a similar estimate as we had for depressive symptomatology. Um, also, co uh, nothing we should probably dismiss easily, but it's no not a game changer. And Andrea, she has never used any social media. Now she becomes a heavy user, uses them several times per day, and her satisfaction with life would only decrease by 0 0.06 points on a 10-point scale. So that is negligible, I would say. Even if it was significant, which, uh, which it is not, but that's, uh, uh, that could be a, a result of the case numbers, but we had a decent sample size for this analysis. So uh, there's, there's uh, really nothing to doubt that. If there is an effect, it must be extremely small, which is what we found. Um, discussing these findings and putting them into perspective is very important to me because it's easy to misunderstand them. So does that mean don't worry, be happy? Can we all relax? Um, that's not a screen capture from Life of Brian. That's a, a copy-paste error, but you get get one uh, soon. Um, so, 
at least we can say in terms of well-being, we don't see any hints towards a lost generation, particularly not one that was lost on social media. So if it got lost, then it got lost on television, like their parents, or on internet, like the, uh, uh, the people born 10 years earlier. Um, so um, that's the one thing. We can't say this is a lost generation, because if it... Um, if it is a relevant phenomenon, it doesn't affect the broad majority of the, uh, of the young people as a lost generation would indicate. There is definitely, if there are problematic patterns, they are relatively rare. So also no, no reason to always look on the bright side of life despite that. There is by no means a reason to relax and don't do anything about uh, how uh, much and in what way young people use social media. That would be a misinterpretation of the study. Um, so I'd like to point out some major caveats. This is only the way the first German youth who had access to social media used social media in this nine-year period. And we can say that on average, that didn't harm or heighten their satisfaction with life or depressive symptomatology. That's fair to say. But that doesn't mean that there weren't individuals in the sample that suffered a lot and where depressive symptomatology came to a breakthrough or satisfaction with life suffered substantially as a cause or correlated with more social media use. Um, and what, uh, what's all, also fair to say is that um, these impacts of um, social media use are not just uh, disappearing if you control for satisfaction with friends or self-esteem. So, Because one likely mechanism would be you use social media a lot because your self-esteem is low or because you are dissatisfied with your real world friends. So you, you overuse social media um, and develop an extreme pattern. And that uh, contributes jointly. So the low self-esteem to begin with. And then in addition that you uh, uh, get uh, done, uh, that, you, that you move your social contacts to the internet and um, and so on. So that might be a mechanism, but we don't see any traces of that here, not on a broad scale. So it's not just that there would be an effect that uh, disappears once you control for self-esteem or satisfaction with friends. There is never a real effect of um, social media use that we, we find. But I already mentioned that certain vulnerable individual satisfaction with life may have de decreased substantially. And this was just canceled out by others who benefited. If you remember the normal distribution I uh, showed in the beginning, like there is probably people that use social media in a way that's extremely good. Like that's very good for their mental health. Um, uh, they benefit a lot from that if they use it right. And Others might have very problematic patterns and that cancels out and the broad majority has some problematic use and some unproblematic use and some productive use and that cancels out overall. Um, and um, I tried to, uh, to point your attention to that um, when I introduced the study, other kinds of negative effects we haven't really looked at. So what about attention? Is there attention deficits, ability to concentrate, school performance, job performance, uh, whatever you could think of? Um, we uh, just didn't look into that and there might be traces of negative or also positive consequences. We also have to consider that the outcome that we observe is from what really happened in that time frame. 2008 to 2016. And that was a time when there was also a lot of concern already around social media. And parents would advise their kids to be um, cautious. There would be uh, uh, attempts to increase 
youths, um, uh, uh, media literacy. There would be teachers who have an eye on that. Their peers are negotiating how to use uh, uh, these, uh, these uh, possibilities that social media give. If we let down that guard and aren't concerned anymore, it might be that much more problematic patterns occur. Also, the social media services themselves, you can say about their ethics, whatever you want, but you have to say that in uh, anticipation of restrictions they might get, legal restrictions or something, they kind of uh, uh, pioneered some um, some things that might contribute um, to the limitation of negative effects. Probably not enough, but um, that's certainly part of the game. And uh, our concerns about social media might have become a self-defeating prophecy in the sense that there might have been negative effects, broad uh, negative effects that were prevented because we were so concerned and launched countermeasures. Self-defeating prophecy. Um, so in ex post, it might seem like nothing, uh, the concern wasn't justified, but we don't know that. We don't know how it would have turned out without any countermeasures. And um, um, specific ways of using social media may very well be pretty harmful or pretty helpful in very specific ways that we have to um, uh, analyze separately. So this doesn't distinguish at all how and what people do on social media. It just asks how often they use it. And that means it puts together into the same box a lot of different behaviors, some of which might have positive or negative effects, and they kind of canceled out overall. Um, yes. Um, and a th little thought experiment. Um, would you show the movie portrait to the left um, to a four-year-old kid just because a study found that four-year-olds who regularly went to the movies were not less satisfied with life than other four-year-olds? I don't think so. So uh, we, we should take these uh, results for what they are. We don't have uh, indications of broad, widespread negative effects of social media use among young people over time. Um, but that doesn't mean that everything is good, everything is great, and um, we should just relax and let social media services do whatever they want. Far from it, um, it's, it's important to uh, monitor the process closely. Um, it's also important to know more about the specific kinds of content and practices that could have a detrimental effect. So um, if we acknowledge that there is positive things on social media and negative things, our priority should be to minimize the negative things and maximize the positive things so people could actually benefit a lot. Um, uh, 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 a good net effect. So we have some gross negative and gross positive effects and we could get a positive balance overall and actually uh, transform it into a, um, a medium uh, that, that uh, has gains for society, what they were probably designed to have in the beginning. Um, and we uh, certainly, we, we should know more about these potential positive effects and not only think about preventing the negative effect, also how to expand and maximize the positive effects. Um, yeah, for now, it seems that social media use is, compared to other media use behaviors, comparatively productive. <laughs> and um, this mixture, we need to move, know more about. And of course, vulnerable populations should be identified and studied and actively helped in the process. Yeah, if you want to know, know more about the specifics of the paper, this, uh, this is it, uh, published last year. Uh, the data are a bit aged um, as the, uh, it concludes in 2016, um, but new data are available and we may update our findings with the newest waves where people kind of move into the very late adolescence and see uh, what it does 
there it also includes indicators about quality of sleep and some other uh, things uh, you might uh, uh, use to um, to look into uh, the other mechanisms or other concerns that I pointed out in the beginning. So thank you very much for your attention. And we still have uh, some time for uh, comments, questions, discussions, or I can elaborate on uh, specific uh, things um, if you uh, uh, want to know more uh, details about components of the study. Thank you very much. Great, Stefan. And uh, we have actually had some questions already. Thank you for your presentation and thank you for sharing this uh, great study. Um, and we have some questions about the metho met methodology, which is a quite complex question. And I will ask uh, our volunteers to put that question into the uh, Zoom chat. But this, mm -hmm. one's, uh, uh, this one's also is a pretty easy one. Uh, how can we debunk these myths of the dangers of novelties in tech and media. That's the question about the train, basically. When we have this new yeah, yeah. technology coming to us and there are plenty of myths, how, how can we debunk this? Mm -hmm. so, so I think um, that this, is, this initial skepticism is a relatively normal process of self-regulation. So what I pointed out with the model, like you get inputs and you compare that to the goals and then you, you uh, see what how you react. And there is an inherent, uh, um, an inherent mechanism to fight off uh, novelties if they aren't really uh, productive, they don't seem to solve any problems and so on. So I think it's the, quite a natural response and um, it can be productive in several ways as well. So you might just dismiss innovations that don't, uh, that uh, can't make the point that they are helpful. So um, if you reflect on that, um, I don't think we have to dismiss those myths in advance, but when something new comes up and it becomes popular, um, uh, there should be uh, enough reflection capacity in society to not only uh, focus on the negative sides and fight them off, but be open to both positive and problematic consequences. So I don't think the general skepticism in the, in the beginning is such a bad thing, but we need to find a way of seriously debating these things rather than using scare tactics and so on. Because that's what the, the physicians in with the trains did, right? So they came forth with, yeah, your head explodes if, um, if uh, you, you get on a train and go by more than uh, 30 kilometers per hour. Um, and of course that scared people. Um, and uh, that's, that's something where uh, we need to be more, uh, more reflective about, um, particularly um, uh, when uh, this is uh, debated in newspapers. So uh, it's good to wait until there's data about such things but um, uh, often that takes quite some time and there you have some exposure to, to the technology already. And um, that's, uh, there's some skepticism and being awake isn't, isn't, isn't that problematic, but it shouldn't, shouldn't come to scare tactics. At least right. that's my, my have, point of view. Uh, several questions and I think they are already dropped in the Zoom chat as well. So, yeah. hello Stefan, I'm very grateful to be here to hear you speak about social media. I am sure you have heard about the metaverse that some people, including Mark Zuckerberg, want to realize. Do you think uh, there is a reason to be concerned about its impact on people's mental health? It actually mm -hmm. sounds scary a bit, metaverse. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yes, yes um that's that's very hard uh, to 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 say in advance um it's um certainly um a move into the direction of um uh, of uh, creating even more um um how should i say to dive even deeper into uh, into the virtual reality uh, uh, that you are creating, um, so that 
certainly uh, um, uh, is something one one has to monitor. Uh, but I'm still confident that um, self-regulation mechanisms will work relatively well in most people. So they might, as, as you just reacted, might just be skeptical and say, oh, that sounds kind of scary um, and uh, not, not try it out or only try it out and say, see, that's nothing for me. But um, uh, for uh, other people, they might find a way of uh, dealing with it. But I think for vulnerable groups, it would um, certainly, who, who are vulnerable to losing touch with reality in one way or the other, um, that's, uh, um, there would be a reason to be concerned, I think. Thank you very much. I still believe that it's, it's a process you cannot stop. It's like a universe expanding and the metaverse and virtual reality is it, it is expanding uh, too and it's probably better to be aware of that it's nothing you can change or do about it so we have uh, some more questions this is a specific one regarding analysis model you use so can you compare the impact of internet and tv versus social media fairly if the objective mm. was an increase from zero to five, uh, 50 hours for TV and internet and only zero to several times a day without a specific time, for instance, mm. could only add up to five hours a week. You, you can see this mm. question, right? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can see it. Uh, Anna, very, very good question. Um, uh, that is actually a weak point that we don't know the exact number of hours. So that's a limitation of the, the uh, uh, primary study that didn't, didn't inquire about the number of hours. It might also be hard for people to kind of judge the number of hours on social media because you uh, do that in pauses and whenever you ride the, uh, on the bus and stuff like this. So it's hard to estimate. Um, I guess that's why uh, the, the research team uh, used only this operationalization. And my idea was to um, kind of use the lowest uh, the scale from the lowest to the highest available value. Uh, the 50 hours, you could go above 50 hours, of course, but the week has uh, uh, 100, uh, 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 oh, I don't know how many hours a week has, but uh, 50 hours TV and internet use would be very extreme. Um, but if you think that's too high uh, to compare, you can just divide the number that I generated by say two, and then it's zero to 25 hours, which might be more uh, something that people could uh, 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 could uh, could reach. But unfortunately, there is no way to, um, to include into the data um, uh, a measure of hours per week for the social media use. Unfortunately, that question wasn't asked. Okay. And uh, here's another one uh, also uh, about the differentiation between the apps. So should we differentiate between apps and not look at social media as a something homogeneous in order to understand the impact on people's well-being? So there are differences between the social mm -hmm. media apps. For example, Twitter is more expressing ideas, opinions, attitudes. Instagram mm -hmm. is more visual side. So there are differences. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely. Look at these differences and take those differences into account. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So that's uh, another major limitation. It's only very broadly how much social media you use. So what we can uh, uh, deduct from that is the way people use social media. Now uh, that has the effect that we we found. But what kinds of uh, of apps they use. Or what I find is even more important, what exactly they do on social media. I mean, um, uh, Instagram, for instance, has an infrastructure and a network that is more visual centered in nature, but you could use it differently as well. You could use Facebook in a very visual manner as well if you really want it. So um, I think uh, probably the, the most important addition I would make is to ask about the frequency of very specific tasks and behavior you're doing on social media. So, and the network structure as well. So are you, um, 
mainly communicating uh, with your peers or is it that you follow other people? Do you follow the news? That makes a tremendous difference in uh, what social media use does. Okay, and uh, then we have, the, I think the last question is, can you advise some specific activities what we as youth, youth organizations can do to reduce the negative aspects of social media? impact mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. Um, I, I think so um, uh, again it comes down to this self-regulation mechanism um, and reflecting about what you really want to achieve with your social media use um, and be more aware of whether it actually does for you what you want it to do for you um, so it's a lot about defining uh, what's important to you and how you can achieve that. And then you can uh, goal directly modify your behaviors. Um, that might be difficult to do uh, in itself, but first there needs to be an awareness about patterns that for you personally might be problematic. Um, think about these uh, these possible negative consequences I mentioned, like lack of sleep, um, satisfaction with life, self-esteem, um, uh, attention. Um, so uh, where do you think that some of these problematic uh, patterns occur in your own usage? And what could you change in the way you use it? You could probably drop people from your list of friends, or you could unfollow uh, 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 certain news sites and so on that you feel can be problematic for you. And uh, on the other hand, you try to maximize your benefits, uh, like you are interested in uh, uh, working on electronic music with synthesizers, you will easily find people who are interested in that if you join the right groups and that can be a tremendous benefit for you for your individual interests to exchange with people who know what you uh, uh, what you want and what you need and what you want to talk about so that can be uh, extremely uh, extremely good for you and your mental health um, so uh, doing this maximization and optimization yourself in a self-conscious manner I think that would be my main advice and, and teaching people how to do that. Yeah, and ironically, there are apps and technolo technological tools to kind of remind you that you need to go out, have your daily steps, and uh, and yeah. and you have to take a break from the screen and and all of this. So, thank you, Stefan. Um, we had Stefan guys from uh, uh, Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Uh, I'm looking forward for your next uh, studies and next uh, papers. So thank you for joining us and sharing your um, knowledge and uh, study about the uh, well-being of youth while using social media. Uh, Thanks for having me. Yes, thank you. And uh, it's, uh, it's just about midday in Riga. It's 12.07. So... We will have a, a break until one o'clock or so. So we have a longer break for, uh, for all the conference attenders uh, who are probably sitting in the office or sitting at home or maybe in some cafeteria to have a lunch break. Uh, maybe go, go outside to have, a, to have some steps uh, for, for you. And, uh, and then we will come back at one o'clock. We have some experienced stories about developing uh, youth media and we will have a discussion panel about uh, other uh, experiences from media organizations and uh, young media content creators about uh, their their personal experience of how they have seen developing um, young media uh, content across uh, many platforms. So that's uh, going to happen at one o'clock. So let's have a break and we will return at one. See you then. Good luck with the rest of the conference. Bye bye. Bye.
Welcome back. It's one o'clock in Riga and we are back in our uh, digital studio and uh, talking about youth media because we have a youth media conference and we have plenty of discussions, plenty of workshops coming up later uh, this evening and we have a second day as well. But uh, let's have some fun at first uh, when we talk about serious things. We, we, we headed out uh, uh, to Riga streets where we found some uh, youngsters and we asked some really simple questions about media and uh, let's see what they had to answer. Man svārts ir Artūrs Jenots. Tiem apkaļ. Mūsdienās ir tik daudz dažādu mēdīju platformu un mēdīju veidu, ka dažkārt man pašam nākas tajos apjukt. Šodien es ar savu godāto komandu esam izgājuši ielās, lai pajautātu cilvēkiem, kas par šīm mēdīju lietām varētu zināt vislabāk. Jauniešiem. Kā jaunieši redz mēdīs? Kā viņi tajās, tajos orientējās? Kā viņi redz, kā mēs? Mazliet vecāk cilvēki par viņiem tajos orientējamies. One eternity later. Saka, Lūdzu, vai tu zini, kas ir mēdī? Nē, nezinu, bet mācos otrajā klasē. Bet, bet otrajā klasē tu noteikti zini, kas ir ziņas, pareizi? Jā, zinu. Vai tu kā otrās klases skolnieks patērē kaut kādas ziņas? Bet es saviem klases biedriem vienmēr stāstu par kaut ko. Piemēram, tā kā manā mājā notika vienreiz uguns grāks, mm -hmm. <laughs> vienu reizi. Tā teikt, kaut kas tam līdzīgs. Man interesanti ir arī žurnāls, cik po laikam atvērt tādas ir vai kaut ko tādas. Ja? Jā, 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 papīra formātā man ļoti patīk tieši mm -hmm. tā sajūta. Vai tu šogad esi lasījis kāds avīzes ar žurnālus? Nē. Nē. Vai tu pagaiši, kad esi lasījis kāds avīzes ar žurnālus? Nē. Aiz pagaiši, kad? Nē. Aiz aiz pagaiši, kad? Varbūt žurnāli junioriem. Kā jums šķiet, kāpēc avīzes un žurnālus vairāk tik bieži nepatērē? Avīzes lasa tikai omes. <laughs> tam, tam, tam. <laughs> and now let's switch to our reporter Peter Us in rainy London. Last time I held a newspaper in my hand yes. was years ago. Don't use newspapers or journals or anything like that. Sveikt, labdien! Es atvienojos Balošu kungs. Vai jūs man varētu atbildēt par mēdījiem, kāds jūs ikdienā patērējat? Tā pakaļ! Putniziņas nelas. Acīm redzot. And now let's switch to our reporter Lefteris from sunny Greece. Es skatījos jūs pētījāt, kas jums noteikti telefonā. Sakiet, cik jums ilgs ir screen times telefonam šodien bijis jau? Man arī jāpaskatās. Nu, ja vien tu nezini no galvas. Nu, droši vien mm, šodien. Two hours later. Divas stundas un sešas minūtes, jā. Kāda dāmas, tagad jums visām ir uzdevums izvilkt ārā savus telefons un apskatīties, cik jums šodien ir bijis screen times ilgs. Oh my gosh. Eventually. Um, nu, no, jā. Tā. 7 stundas tas ir daily average, bet cik ir šitais? Es aizdienu. 2 stundas 23 minūtes. Nav tik daudz. Nav tik daudz, nav tik daudz. 4 stundas 58 minūtes ir average. Tā, bet šodien ir sez... šitais? Nē, šitais ir tiek. Gandrīz 2 stundas. Tā, te ir 3 stundas average. Un, s... un šodien ir bijis... Kā nē? Paga? Ā, tu... šodien ir 3 stundas. Tā, te ir daily average ir 12. Tas ir... Skolā 13 stundas, ok, lai kāds šo es paskaitu, daily average. Kētas, gan viss pēc stundas ir. Daily? Nē. Ā, tas ir šodien. Tas ir šodien, 4, 4, 5. Tas ir daudz. Tas ir daudz. Tas ir daudz. Un tas ir kogā? 8 stundas 37 daily average. Un te nu mēs esam. And now let's switch to our reporter Lefteris from Sunny Greece. Tāpēc mums nav labu klipaķa, klip. Γιατί αν και τα άρθρα είναι θεωρώ καλύτερα για τον ανθρώπινο εγκέφαλο, δεν μου αρέσει πολύ ο τρόπος γραφής τους. 
Kā tev šķiet, kurš ir piesardzīgāks internetā, tu vai tev vecāki? Manuprāt, es. Vai tev vecāki ir pieļauši kaut kāds absolūti rūpas Nē. Nē. internetā? Nē, es viņus izglītoju. Tu viņus esi izglītojis? Jā. Jā. Kā, kā notika šis te izglītošanas process? Ļoti sarežģīti. <laughs> tas, 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 tas nav viegli. Lai jūsu dzīve internetā būtu drošāk nekā šo meiteņus rūciens pa kalniņu. Dāmas. Divu faktoru autentifikācija. Vai tu zini, kas ir divu faktoru autentifikācija? Autentifikācija. Vai tu zini, kas ir divu faktoru autentifikācija? <tos> And now let's switch to our reporter Lona from Romania. Well, I personally prefer Instagram because it's is uh, uh, the interface is more user friendly, uh, and well, most of youngsters today use it. We use it a lot more than Facebook. To zin kasir dio faktor autentifikaci. <laughs> ok, paga. Bet tev ir Instagram konts? Nē, no, nav. No. TikTok konts? Ir. Vai tev TikTok konts un ir divu faktoru autentifikāciju? Nē. <laughs> Man liekas, ka nav. Labi, tev ir bankas konts? Ir. Kā tu domā, vai tur ir divu faktoru, faktoru autentifikāciju? Bet es to nezinu. Bet man liekas, ka tur čistai ir. Es vienkārši tu esi saistīts ar mēdījā. Tad divu faktoru autentifikāciju, tad, kad tu, tu tā kā ielogojies iekšā ar parolu, un tad, tev, tad kad tu esi ielogojies ar parolu, tad tev vēl paprasa caur telefonu atnāk ziņu, vai tu tiešām tā kā gribi ielogoties iekšā. Jā, tas jā, tad man tā ir. Tad mums tāds ir. Vai tu klausies arī kāds podkāstus? Ā, šogad īsti vēl nav sanācis un arī... Bet pagaišu gadu? <laughs> um, es neatceros šo podkastu nosaukums. Varbūt pēc atrast, ka skatījies kādreiz pēdējā pilī. Tu varbūt kaut kas tam līdzīgs. Kur, kur pārsāk, kur krimēņš ir bijis? Man ļoti patīk, ir tāds HR podcasts, kuru vada Ilze Medne. Tas ir mans favorīti podcasts un laikam tas šobrīd, šajā brīdī, tas arī viss jau. Vai tu pati kādreiz esi domājusi veidot kaut kādus uh, saturiskus video? Jā, man bija YouTube accounts, un es tur par Covid un kaut ko stāstīju. Hmm. Uh, cik tu daudz uztaisīji video? Trīs, es domāju, kādas. Un kāpēc tu apstājies? Um, jo tas, es domāju, ka tas ir ļoti stulbi un <laughs> man nekas neiznāca. Vai tu zini, kas ir Artūrs Ienots? Nē, bet man liekas, ka arī viņš ir sportists vai populāra zvaigžņa. Nu, ko godāties skatītāji? Mans vārds joprojām ir Artūrs Sienots. Šobrīd gan es esmu krietni pārsalušāks nekā es biju pirmīt. Un ko nu mēs šodien esam noskaidrojuši? Galvenokārt jau to, cik liels ir jauniešu skrīntājums šodien bijis. Un vispār, cik viņam vidēji dienā tā cilks ir. Esam noskaidrojuši, cik daudz jaunieši lasa žurnālus un izrādās, ka tāda ir. Joprojām ir cilvēki, kas patērē praktiskos mēdījus un taustāmos mēdījus, tā kā turpinām drukāt ir jaunieši, kas tos lasa. Esam noskaidrojuši, ka liela daļa jauniešu informāciju iegūst TikTokā, Instagramā un citos sociālajos tīklos. Es domāju, ka raugoties ar šiem jauniešiem, kas mēdījus patērē un patērē tos ar gana kritisku aci, Nākotne ir gana gaiša. Turpinam asināt mūsu kritiskos prātus, turpinam izvērtēt mēdīju, kas mums ir visu laiku acu priekšā un kurus mēs patērējam, un lai mums brīnišķīga konference. Tiekamies! Ir augsts. Ir augsts. Tā pat du. Uh, wonderful video. Uh, I see that you are presenting and doing a workshop later today, so I, I, I'm curious to learn some tips and tricks of 
how to make uh, uh, such nice videos. And thank you for reminding us that this is actually International Youth Media Conference. And we have uh, plenty of uh, speakers and uh, panel dis uh, discussion members uh, coming up uh, later in the afternoon, coming from Sweden, Finland, also from the Netherlands. So a uh, uh, lot of things uh, coming up. But first part of the day, we devoted to a kind of research, academical research on 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 youth and how they engage with media. Now it is time to discuss how it is actually to work with the media production. And the first part of this uh, afternoon session, I will give uh, uh, a word to Ilona Bichevska. She is a um, conference organizer, but at the same time she has devoted so many years producing young media sharks and she has learned many, many experiences during those years. How it is to work with the youngsters, how it is to engage with media organizations, how to f do the fundraising, all of this she has seen it all. And uh, she's ready to um, share her experience with you. So Ilona, I see that you are not here anymore, you are on the screen. Hi Ilona, where are you? Oh, she's waiting to connect to the Zoom. Let's see. Give me one second. Well, there it is. So hopefully we will uh, we will see Elon in a bit. So yeah, I I think it's for around ten years, Young Media Sharks and. I have uh, seen some of these uh, summer camps and I know the spirit and the energy behind all of this and it is great to see uh, some of the uh, alumni uh, work their way up and start to work in the media industry and becoming a big, really big media shark. So I kind of feel that Ilona has already joined us. Yes. Is that true? Is that true? Not yet. She's connecting. At least she has a link and she's there. Ilona, do you hear us? Well, let me, uh, while we are waiting for Ilona to join, let me uh, talk about what we will have later today. So. I already mentioned some of the uh, workshops that we have regarding uh, media literacy. We will have Niklaus Svatra uh, about uh, not losing uh, yourself while fighting under the uh, under your place under the sun. Then we have Arthur's with this enthusiasm and uh, and the long-term fuel in the media business. And Edgar Fresh, one of the alumni of uh, Media Sharks, is also going to present uh, uh, about his experience working uh, uh, with YouTube content. But I see Elon is already there, so uh, welcome back, Elon, this time on the screen, uh, on, on Zoom. So I already, I already uh, in, in, in did the introduction, I will not repeat myself. You have seen it all, and now you have uh, you are ready to share your experience and share your views on how to work with youngsters, how to work with media organizations, and how to how to uh, <laughs> also uh, do this long term. So, from baby shark to hey, do you hear me? Uh, hello everyone, uh, nice uh, to talk to you again. Uh, I will share experience with uh, my work with youngsters for um, almost 20 years, starting with, as a youth organization, Avantis, 
and lately seven years uh, as young media sharks. Uh, why it's important for me to for young for work with young people? It's uh, important for my soul because uh, that's my audience. I I feel very happy to have young people around, and it's always good um, collaboration, exchanging ideas and uh, souls, and um, that keeps me alive and uh, happy for life. Uh, my background is uh, I'm a teacher by profession and uh, I wanted to work with youngsters but I uh, didn't see myself in a system in a school system at the time and then I created uh, together with partner young uh, young organization uh, Avantis and I'll share uh, our way how we work uh, and how it leads and our uh, also thoughts, what should be done in general to improve work with youth uh, and to, to make better results out of it. Uh, do you see my screen? Uh, not yet, we see you. And I'll share you my look screen. great, by the way. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I have slept almost three hours, so that's a good compliment. <laughs> so now we see your screen. Yes, uh, we are Avantis, and lately, uh, last seven years, we were focused on young talents and scouting and development. Uh, but the, briefly, history, uh, we started in 2002 by supporting uh, youth initiatives in sport, media, and music, mostly because we wanted uh, to get uh, youngsters proud to be a citizen of Latvia. And the, the main thing is that usually people are proud to be part of Latvia. It's in sport games or, uh, or big events and, and uh, music when we, we got some kind of uh, good, uh, good results. And we thought it also good uh, to support those youngsters at early age that, that we can support uh, new talent development. And also we created the large scale events that uh, it's possible to reach a larger audience. And also we wanted to create new personalities uh, who can be uh, also a voice uh, to, to reach youngsters. So. Uh, and also we create environments. One of our projects was to build uh, Griesingalm skate parks uh, in 2003 by local uh, community initiative, fundraising, uh, PR campaign. And now it's the biggest uh, park, uh, sport park in the Baltic. Also new talent development, uh, we supported youngsters who reached kind of levels themselves and they needed to get some support outside and we gave uh, we we made a big uh, contest for for submission and there are many kids applied and uh, for uh, some categories we gave like one a month scholarship for a year it's an initiative also by my partner Vestor Skozio this was his idea that the uh, those young talents should be supported. And for example, like uh, Nils Jansson now is the best uh, skater of the year. We have also Madar Sap, Saint Skateboard, uh, and many talents in musicians. And uh, Avant has also worked with uh, musicians uh, as an astronaut. But <laughs> our dream always be to reach larger uh, larger scale, not only in Latvia, but, but abroad, but we didn't succeed. And I did, I always thought why uh, talents from small country as Latvia can't reach global scale. I was like thinking why it's so, why we cannot be proud of some musicians, for example, in pop music <laughs> that we know, oh, that's, that's musician from Latvia. I still hope there will be one day, but not yet. And, uh, and also important issue is uh, filmmaking. We made the first film about 
emigration issues in 2003 that reaches like top scale popularity because of uh, essence of the topic because uh, many people wanted to leave the Latvia and we got some unique interviews from those who are United States to like fresh thoughts on uh, issues and it's totally independent content but we get and we reach uh, like very large audience and uh, while Latvia moved to you know, uh, European Union there was all uh, interest about Europe and those possibilities to get some support to 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 cover some stories from European Union but at the time I was uh, studying in uh, Baltic Media School in Tallinn and I thought, what could be a good idea? What is interesting to see? And then I thought, oh, we not much know about post-Soviet countries. We, and I was thinking Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, all those countries, what, was learned in my childhood, we are sisters and brothers, but not much uh, heard lately about those countries. It was in 2012. And I started the project uh, to find out what's going on in those countries. And I was really not happy about what I see when commercial, uh, when big countries coming to Latvia, for example, and make some stories. They jump like for two weeks and make some documentaries what's happened there but actually not this oh it's not always true <laughs> because what's happened in the country it's uh better know those people who live in the country and that's why this uh, 15 uh, short stories about life in post-soviet countries involved the 15 local filmmakers from from those region and it was 10 years ago, but by that time, I already find out from those local talent what's going on in their countries. Youngsters were very open-minded. They were free to tell real story situation. And I was really sh shocked actually that how much influence of uh, still Soviet remains are in most of their countries. And now, like 10 years after, we see situation in Belarus, Ukraine, and uh, 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 Kazakhstan, there is still on the power uh, older generation and young generation. They don't have enough voices to be heard and uh, their stories are not told enough. So. That's why my background, why I thought it's like working with youth, it's not only working with youth, it's definitely should involve uh, media and uh, young media talents to be heard about any issue. Um, and yes, when I, after this uh, journey in post-Soviet countries and realizing what's going there and realizing how happy we are in Latvia, in part of Soviet, uh, part of Europe Union, and with uh, big democracy, I got the chance to explore United States, still thinking, oh, there will be chance to get some Latvian musician known in, in United States, and we have so many talents, and why, why didn't we have a chance to, to be abroad? And then in uh, some university lesson in production, I uh, professor showed me that slide that really shocked me. <laughs> uh, professor uh, in pr pr production in uh, Arizona University, he said, okay, there is a situation in media, actually all media channels and news we, we see and uh, films we see and mu music, uh, it's all produced by just several companies whose main goal is to get, to get rich and uh, earn money. And of course, they do everything to get it. 
and what that uh, and they mostly influenced of course young people their new generation who uses media the most and uh, values what they see it's just mostly to to make other people more richer as they are already and i thought what we from small country as latvia what we can do about it we don't have such money we don't have a gas <laughs> uh, and i thought okay what i as a person uh, can do we can uh, make more strength like local community and local voices and uh, because no one else in uh, in the world are so much interested in latvia as we are and we only thing I thought it can be done from my side and from my organization side, we started from the ground, uh, collecting uh, young talents. Uh, we choose age 14, 18, because uh, there are youngsters still open-minded. They don't want, they don't know usually what they will choose for their profession. They uh, are uh, maybe also free to free to to explore and very good target audience to work with. So first, the camp uh, was really big success uh, by energy, by all this uh, all this content, and we continue that like for seven years. Uh, and what we notice is that young persons with camera, they are more welcomed also in a, in a, any kind of homes because journalists from from uh, traditional media, they are like hunters. <laughs> People usually, for example, uh, entrepreneurs, they are even afraid of 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 journalists because they like, oh, maybe something happened, I will be in yellow news or something. But youngsters coming from the like open heart, they're really willing to explore and they are interested in a person and they have a time and they have very good interaction with local community. So, and uh, eight years later, <laughs> Artur Sienets, it's one of the, our alumni, you will see his presentation later. Uh, we become like very, very, really, really uh, intense camp. It's like international seven days, uh, high creative contest and free participation. And we are happy that we have like top, top uh, lecturers or um, mentors to have. And um, yes, and we see already after seven years, we see results ritvars they're doing like uh, music video for uh, for big uh, music companies and uh, also young artists trust them very well like several music videos are done by this young man alumni from young media sharks there is a youtube master edgar fresh who tried hard to make like quality content interesting for everyone and he made it. I'm really happy that uh, he has like 27,000 subscribers and his content is very well made and he tries to be very useful for, for his audience. And we are also happy with, that we will have him uh, this afternoon. Uh, also, <laughs> Emil Alps, he took, uh, uh, he took a gap year after high school at the age of 18. And he decided to work on film and our all alumni Shark Network helped him with suggestions with cameras. And at the end of the day, he received the like local Oscar for best debut for his film, what he was made, made, made as 18 years old. And we also have a new, news, uh, news reporter on National News, Davids and uh, TV host Nancy. And uh, we also made a young media house. It was youth initiative and they 
uh, they uh, created content events and uh, also many broadcasts, even producing uh, uh, magazine. And it's all, all in all supported just from outside foundation like embassy, embassy many years, Germany embassy, last year, the Netherlands embassy, and every constant work for, uh, for uh, reaching uh, funding for those youth initiatives. But what we see that there is a, we can get from this foundation like uh, money for prototype, but we would like to have continuation of the project. But for example, this cooking uh, youth kitchen show, it's good examples that we started as a um, initiative to make prototype and then it continues already as a second season with Latin national broadcast. Yeah. And what benefits working uh, with youth involvement? It's always humor, energy, empathy, originality of ideas, enthusiasm. continue from here and say good motivation, special language, skills, power to change, humor, energy, and many more. Oh, digital skills, energy and time, will to grow. Yeah, somehow I see that uh, Ilona has frozen in her Zoom connection. I don't know what the issue behind this is, so we are eager to resolve this issue as soon as possible. So let's hope she will be able to continue. If not, we will have to take a small little break. I may remind uh, that uh, at two o'clock we have a panel discussion coming up which will focus on the uh, experiences and challenges creating youth content in the media. Basically, the same thing Elon is focusing uh, in her speech uh, right now and we will have uh, many guests uh, some of them will be live here in the studio uh, uh, and some will connect uh, from uh, from their uh, country such as Antti Hirvonen from from Finland uh, uh, Paolo from the Netherlands and uh, Justine Kreslinja from Sweden, we will also have somebody from uh, uh, PETCLV, Latvian Public Service Media for Youngsters, Elina Baltskara. She's now a content producer in the morning show there. And also Niklaus Vader, he's a uh, content creator in his own media company. So uh, there is a nice panel coming up uh, later on. That's around two o'clock. Uh, I need to ask our team, is there, uh, is there a situation when we can continue or there is a problem and we cannot uh, resolve this? At the we need to have a break for 10 minutes, so it's a great uh, time to uh, have another tea or a coffee or just to walk around your house. So let's uh, continue at 1.45.
And we are back. These 10 minutes was really quick, but I uh, made myself a tea, so I'm ready to continue. And hopefully Ilona is ready to continue too. And Ilona, you actually have only 10 minutes to wrap your presentation up. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, sorry, that was like <laughs> thumb light. Uh, yes, I just want to uh, conclude why is uh, from my experience what's the benef benefits working with you it's like huge uh, um they have like very good motivation originality of ideas i always like amazed how like uh, creative youngsters are um special language skills uh, it's not like English or uh, or Latvian. It's like digital language. You never know. They only understand what those three letters together mean sometimes. Uh, youth are enthusiastic and uh, they still have idealism. That's also important quality, what our society needs, especially now. Humor, empathy, energy. What I uh, noticed, but especially latest years that youths are very fragile they can be very open and one day they're like very close it's i don't know it's maybe also because of those digital uh digital i don't know digital lifestyle let's say um yes and uh, i would love i would encourage everyone to to have young people in a on a board as a to mentor to, to be part of some youth initiative uh, in any kind of way it's possible because this collaboration is essential and um, yeah it's only can light up uh, our society to, to, to brighter times let's say and I have also conclusions for some suggestions um, what I think needs to be supported it's a uh, Main thing I think is uh, youth workers, especially men, because there are many young women, maybe youth workers, but not so many men. So they said, okay, it's not like very uh, profitable job or something, but uh, we have to find a way that there's also good, um, good young men can be a mentors for uh, youngsters uh, in future. It's need to have to support uh, long-term initiatives because as I heard all around the NGOs, many people are born out about those long, short, like project-based uh, project, uh, <coughs> uh, operation. It's, uh, you, it's really uh, no, needs to find the, the way how to support project in long-term. Um, independent channels to collaboration youngsters with professionals that youngsters need to have some guidelines or some ethical things in about journalism and it should be like hands to hands um, also important things that we have network with young uh, talents uh, in uh, independent small countries uh, also countries what is uh, under let's say some under some war even uh, yes uh, i think it's very important that we have some local voices and young independent voices to be heard also for media it's good to have that you can spotlight youth initiatives and give them space to to promote their campaigns or initiatives. It's very crucial for young people that they can be heard and also as they work are noticed. Yes, and also for classical media, I can suggest that they have a hiring staff, some youngsters like youth workers who can uh attract more youngsters to the media channel and also be kind of between system and uh, those youngsters because 
uh, youngsters are uh, against the system. <laughs> larger, uh, larger media channel. I think the more difficult is for youngsters, young talent, original talent, free spirit, uh, personality to enter the system. Yeah, that's all for me. Well, thank you, Elon, and. Uh... Let us have some questions, <laughs> question and answer session. Now, I think it's uh, valuable to kind of warm up the next panel discussion, which will focus on, on youth content in the media and the challenges and the, and, and the experiences. And at the beginning of the conference, I mentioned this importance of building the bridge between the media organizations and youth media content creators. What do you think are the main main points to kind of improve these relationships to kind of allow young media content creators infiltrate inside the media organizations or at least their content to be taken uh, in the media to have a little bit bigger audience? Yes, I think uh, media nowadays also are struggling with the resources and especially human resources and many kind of information they have to cover. The main thing I think it's attention and it's special person stuff in a media that has qualities and empathy to work with youngsters because they, they need to have a understanding uh, and uh, dialogue and and easy com collaboration and then it's kind of been that's the way uh, i see it yes and media organizations shouldn't be afraid of <laughs> no, it's all <laughs> <laughs> that w they will mess something up, or <laughs> <laughs> that's why we need, they need to have some like responsible adults to take care of this the youth department because it's like totally different uh, job, I think. And adults who understand the psychology of the youngsters and and their lifestyles. Okay, thank you, Ilona. We have. Yeah. 10 minutes, uh, around, uh, around 10 minutes until the next uh, session, we have a panel discussion focusing on creating youth content in the media. Uh, I say thank you, and, uh, thank you. And, and let's have a small break once again, another tea, another snack, another walk around the house, or uh, paying attention to your cat or dog or kids or whatever you have uh, there in your house. So, and we will be back, yeah, at two o'clock. Stay tuned. Yeah. Stay tuned.
Okay, we are back. Youth Media Conference in Riga continues and we have this uh, very nice afternoon session, panel discussion, which will focus on creating uh, uh, youth content in the media. And we will talk about challenges and experiences while doing so. And we have five panelists, like a hybrid version of this uh, uh, whole set. Uh, we will have three people on Zoom and two in the studio, which you already see at the one part of one person <laughs> okay but uh, let's start with the with the panelists uh, that we have connected uh, from abroad and uh, first welcome to Andy Hirvonen uh, COO of uh, creative content and media at uh, Finnish public service media ILE hi Andy hi Carlis nice to Nice to be here and nice to see you again. Yes, nice. We to met see you years ago. Years yes. ago, and uh, it's it was it was a great time back in this youth media camp in Kuldiga. Uh, we have also Justine Kreisling joining us from Sweden. Hello, Justine. She's Hi. She's a <laughs> former R A R D editor, and you will tell us about your experience and what you are doing. Uh, at ARD uh, in a while, in, in a bit. We have also Paulo Destillo from, from the Netherlands, and Paulo is a producer of, um, of uh, Europe Matters podcast, which talks about some really serious stuff, and uh, we will talk about his experience also while creating uh, this kind of content. Hello, Paulo. Sveiki, thank you very much for uh, the invitation and to participate. Sveiki, Sveiki. We're looking forward to the discussion. And we have two guests from Latvia as well. Uh, we have Elina Baltskara from uh, PSLV, from Public Service uh, Media of Latvia, youth content creator and also a radio show producer and a host in the morning show. Hello, Elina. And uh, we have Niklav Svatra, creator, 22 creative producer and director uh, here in Latvia. Sveiks, Niklav. Hello. Hi. 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 Thanks, everyone. And uh, Niklav is, of course, uh, a video guy. So director, that means directing something, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. It does. Uh, okay. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's start with some que opening uh, questions, opening uh, remarks. And... While you are answering the question, you can briefly introduce yourself so that everyone knows what your experience with, with the youth content has been as well. So, Antti, let's start with you, actually. Um, I wanted to ask, what is the, the, what is the decision-making process behind media projects when you are thinking about media projects and where target audience will be youngsters? How do you test these ideas and how do you how do you make these decisions? Are you allowing youngsters also to participate in the decision making process? Yes. Um, first, I have worked with youth many years. Uh, I created Wiley Kioski Youth product a few years ago within uh, Wiley and it was quite successful and also I ran youth radio YLAX uh, in, in, in YLA so I have worked with youth maybe five at least five five years few few years ago but now I work as a uh, chief operating officer for big uh, creative content and media unit and trying to uh, kind of bring those learnings I got when working for youth brands into like adult for adult Wiley. So I think that has been really a nice path for me to take those learnings and now use them when working with drama or 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 reality or or documentary. But then but yes, teens have their say, but it varies depending on what is the product we are doing for them and um, in general we believe in an idea that it can't be like from us to them but like from them to them 
like from youth to youth. Uh, when we hire people to work for the brands for you, they must represent represent um, generation they are creating the content to. Uh, I think, and we think that in that way, content gets its credibility amongst wanted target audience. And it is the best way to ensure the diversity as well. And diversity is a is, is, um, big issue in, in, in Wiley. And we are trying to create um, as diverse content as we, as we can as public broadcaster. Uh, but um, we can't on every occasion hire just young people or even hire new skills to work for us. And that's why, for example, in drama productions for youth, we use our customer service team. There is four, four to five people working for us. And content production development network, it's also in-house network to, to, to help us with these issues. And with help from them, we hear the voice of teens. For example, using a live focus groups when creating new concepts or when we test casting or, or presenter of, of new show, for example. And sometimes we go live really quickly. For example, when I did Wiley Kioski, we did that quite often. You can take it, my daughter. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and ask the feedback from target audience in production and iterate the product in that way. It's like live beta testing. And the easiest environment to do that is, is social media, YouTube and Instagram. And, and, but when we do so, and if we do so, we have to be careful who we listen. Uh, who, who, um, we, we have to listen to the right, the right audience. The opinion, their opinion matters the most. Um, and, um, and, and one, one thing I want to also say, and thanks Thanks for the, the, the youth camp you, you created a few years ago. We also started within Wiley, Wiley Kioski Creator Week to strengthen the voice of youth. And, and now we are planning to do it again. An idea is that we spend a week with new media talents and create concepts for Wiley with them. And last time we found at least two really good new talents and now they work for Wiley and we have developed uh, successful media products with them, one podcast and, and one documentary series. So I think things have their say in many different ways, but we have to, of course, work more to ensure that it will continue in the future as well. Yes, the teens has the, have their say, and it's important to listen to them. It's great to hear that you developed many, many ideas from the camp as well. And um, it's good that the media organizations have s these, uh, these tools to kind of uh, uh, incorporate these opinions and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, feedback from the audience. Uh, Paolo, uh, you are joining us from the Netherlands. You are making a podcast, Europe Matters, and I looked through some of the episodes and I found that you are really talking about serious issues such as uh, politics, European Union future, there might be even uh, corruption and, and things like that. These are topics often not something young people are interested about. So my question to you is how you, how you engage your audience, how you engage youth in these complex topics? So uh, it all started off in March uh, of last year in, with Clubhouse, with the arrival of Clubhouse, the social media audio app uh, that rolled out in uh, Europe. And I had the fortune, uh, like the privilege to get an invitation and then I could have these rooms where I was talking about uh, these topics. And I thought that maybe two or three people would join these social digital rooms where people start talking and you, it's like a Zoom meeting, but without the faces. So you only hear the sound. And these rooms started having a lot of uh, popularity. So suddenly we, there were like 40, 80 100 people uh, joining in, like uh, listening to the discussions and sometimes having on, on, on the panel almost 20 people. 
that were waiting to have their say or ask their questions to the guests that we were having. So uh, from there, I saw that there is an interest in uh, Europe about these very um, tough topics because they are because for example uh, we start off with talking about colonialism and how uh, yeah the europe has still that colonial past with uh, countries from south america or africa and it gets very difficult also to try to explain what the effects are right so the idea with uh, europe matters was to really create a guidebook into understanding what's going on right now in the European continent. So if you look at our episodes, they're like how-to. It's like a how-to guide to understand specific uh, themes. So for example, our first one is how to conquer colonialism. So it means like understanding colonialism. Uh, but also uh, another episode is about how to con- uh, how to make a European laugh. So we interview a stand-up comedian from Romania uh, that does stand-up comedy in Berlin. And that's very interesting to get to know how uh, the European scene is evolving, not only, not only the stand-up comedian scene, uh, but also what it means to feel European. So in one, my second interview that I posted is a special interview I've had with um, Ilya Leonard Pfeiffer, which is a Dutch bestseller. Um, as you could know, my, my name is Italian, but I'm Dutch Italian. I uh, grew up in both countries and I live in the Netherlands. So uh, having the chance to interview someone that writes and does correspondence between Italy and the Netherlands was a, a great opportunity to really understand what it meant to be, to feel European, but also understanding my uh, Dutch and Italian roots. And um, as you said, no corruption and these topics. Uh, for example, our latest interview is with um, Noam Chomsky, and we talk about very, very serious stuff uh, like the Ukraine crisis. So the way we try to engage is by uh, slowly making also the content more short. So we're going to create shorts out of these uh, longer interviews. Um, we are uh, approaching TikTok. We're approaching Instagram Reels. Uh, we're still figuring it out. We just launched a month and a half ago uh, with a successful uh, crowdfunding before that. So that that's uh, also the uh, thing that actually managed to bring us forward. And um, so we try to engage with younger audiences by making also the content more listenable and also shorter and straight to the point because that's what younger generations want. They don't want to too long uh, things, so even though we started off with very long format of 40 to 45 minutes interviews. Your production is that you are on the platform, which is, which is naturally for, for young people like on podcasts on Spotify. Well, here we are in the, in the, in the studio, we have Elina who works in a radio, which we would consider sort of old media in, in terms of how you reach your, audience so Elena is it easy to work and and try to speak uh, with with youngsters in a in a in a like this traditional media setting and how do you how do you think how how many people are actually listening is it easy to reach youngsters in the radio Thank you, Carlos, for, for your question uh, and for naming uh, radio as an old media. <laughs> uh, it's classics, you know. Uh, but, uh, of course, there are very many challenges uh, when you are um, using old media to talk with young people. And um, to name a few, then um, the first, I would say, is uh, to be where your target audience is and at the same time to be who you are, you're a radio station. Because uh, if we talk about uh, young people, of course they are using social media a lot. So we put also a lot of resources in using it. We are producing content for, for Instagram, TikTok, Uh, YouTube, we are making also unique podcasts and that's the thing that we are putting our resources not only to kind of represent our radio shows in these platforms, but we are producing unique content for it. And uh, 
then there is radio. We also have to take care for it and uh, to find this balance between those uh, two things. I think it's uh, one of the biggest challenges that we have in our everyday life um, when thinking about uh, talking to our core audience uh, and that is young people. And um, the other thing I would say is can we uh, in some kind of way rebrand radio and not like our specific radio station but rebrand radio as a media itself because I think if we look at the qualities that are for social media that young people use that they are kind of into it's uh, building community for example radio is a perfect perfect media for it uh, you you kind of become friends with your listeners and listeners become uh, friends with each other and you can make this super fast communication just as you can in social media like I don't know a radio listener sends us a message and we can instantly reflect uh, to the question or to the idea that they have sent us and uh, so the com communication is super fast and you can also make this uh, connection between radio personalities and uh, uh, and listeners that's also something that social media does um, so there are very many things that radio actually has that also this modern media has uh, but we just have to kind of yes rebrand radio as media media uh, and to find ways how to put it in um, young media, uh, young people lifestyles because I think uh, radio is uh, is very uh, strongly connected to uh, um, specific person's lifestyle and if we can, I don't know, uh, market radio as um, live podcast with uh, a potential to discover new music it, it sounds a bit different right and it sounds um, not that old anymore <laughs> yes and and sometimes even uh, these old when i say old 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 things such as radio i mean sometimes these old things come up as a trend for youngsters like like the same with vinyl records who would thought that vinyl records will will come back and now it's kind of a trend and uh, yeah Elena works in the public service media and of course public service media needs to reach out for all of the public and it includes also young media and I wonder what is the experience uh, somewhere outside Latvia in some other countries and Justine you have worked with public media in in, uh, in in Sweden and in Germany. Tell us about your experience, how you see in other countries how this youth content is being incorporated into public service media. Um, yes, so this is a super in interesting question because um, public service as, as a phenomenon, it is so strictly regulated by rules and regulations and has a commitment to quality on a whole other way than um, private, private actors or individuals have. And I was working for a number of years for the German uh, public broadcaster in uh, Sweden. So we were reporting for ger the German public about the Nordic and the Baltic states. And um, it may not come as a big surprise to you, but Germans are not the best at the whole digital sphere. Um, so, is the quality really bad? No, no, you are still on. We hear you. All right, perfect. You. Perfect. Um, yes, so the, the German um, Germany is not the very best at the digital sphere. So, the whole... Um, public service world is st still very orientated towards the classical linear concept. And once um, you focus on the linear concept, you only you will always have a competition about airtime. Um, and in the end, there will always be one individual sitting there, an editor of sorts, deciding um, what will fit in these certain minutes of airtime. We only have 24 hours a day. Um, there will be a set amount of airtime, which means that they will need they will need to be able to sell in the content that will be produced. 
Um, and in Germany in particular, you can very well see strict hierarchies, uh, meaning that um, you start young and you start at the bottom and then you slowly climb up. And it's very rarely that you see young people in the deciding positions, um, which in itself is a huge problem. Um, and it, uh, the shift has come lately that they, they really want to turn around and move from a strictly linear to a cross medial concept. But the problem is, of course, that it's really hard to recycle video and actual um, like content, um, partially due to the simple fact that um, what is produced for um, the, the linear channels is mainly a lot longer and the digital requires to be much, much shorter. Um, a simple, simple problem such as uh, what you see on the linear channels is usually landscape and what you see in TV or like what you see on, on your phone is usually portrait mode. And um, the simple question in very, very important for Germany, of course, is will you be using subtitles or will you be using a voiceover? Which means that whenever you, um, whenever you produce content, you a lot of the time, a lot, of, a lot of the time, need to uh, produce it fresh um, for the digital world, which involves double the labor, double the costs, and double everything. Um, and yes, yeah, so in conclusion, my experience with including uh, youth into public service has been immensely difficult but it's happening and what needs to happen is a, an immense shift in mentality. So um, I'm super happy to hear from you, Auntie, for instance, um, how uh, Ule Wiley, has, um, Wiley has, has already managed to tackle that shift. Kudos. Yes, uh, thank you, Justine. Uh, and, and, and really, if you want to do things right, uh, like and 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 involve and engage with all types of people and, and all, all types of our audiences. It's an enormous effort actually to to put everything together. Um, but I think in some uh, media spheres, in some uh, sectors, we can say that uh, the the production actually might be easier than in public service media. And uh, and Niklas uh, Vatra is working as an independent media content creator in a videography, right? So what has been your experience? Uh, is it difficult? Is it easy to uh, find the, the right uh, language? What the audience wants to see on the screen? Tell us what you are doing and, and how you reach your audience. Um, well, I wouldn't say it's easy uh, to reach, <laughs> reach the um, people we want to reach. And uh, like shortly about myself, um, yeah, I'm an independent. I have a small team with four people, the uh, Creators 22. And um, yeah, I think we've been active for four years now. And as we started as a student group who just wanted to get into the into the field, we slowly developed from small video reviews to the, our last project was this summer making a TV series for youth, uh, for Latvian, Latvian National Television's YouTube project 16 plus. And um, even if like, 21st century with all smartphones and all different media types that we we can get and just consume. I would say it's it's easy to produce content, but it's hard to reach your audience because there's so so many things, and because of uh, influencers and Instagram and everything, um, it's just um, everything is fake, and it's hard to be that small space of personality in the world of fakes. Uh, in a way, so I think one thing that right now, at least from my point of view, uh, that youth production needs is just truth, uh, experiments, uh, not faking, uh, yeah, just just experimenting and um, getting ready to see some negative reactions because uh, this is the part that's gonna move us forward but this is from our Latvian uh, point of view because our traditional media at least in video production has been quite uh, um, I would say stable. it's been very linear and very 
the same for years now. So I think right now it's solely you can see in TV series and in uh, YouTube shows and, and, and so on that uh, slowly it's getting a bit more uh, creative and a, bit, a little bit more experimental. And I think this is the part that um, the youth really needs, just experiments and uh, being honest and fruitful and being yourself. Um, that's that's the that's the main thing I think for me. Well, all the media literacy activists would uh, would re be really glad to hear that uh, the that the trend out there with the young audience is that the content should be truthful, that the truth is actually a, becoming a trend, yeah. and people don't want any any fakes any uh, more. But uh, besides that, I'm I think that production and packaging. And design is very important in in youth content. And now, all of the who wants to jump in uh, from from this panel, everyone who, who who has something to add, how it is important and how costly is it to kind of have this right packaging of like nice, truthful content out there. So the packaging, the cost, design. How important, and it is easy to bear the costs. Who would like to jump in on this? Well, well, I can, I can tell something. I think the most difficult thing, at least for Wiley, and I think it's the same in all public media, is the delivery, not even packaging or, or even, even the, the tone of voice. We can do that, but the most difficult thing is the delivering into the right channel. And, and we know that the young, young, young audience spend their time on... We don't own those platform, platforms where they spend their time. And at the same time, it's really difficult for us to move our business into those platforms we don't own. And um, in, in, in Wiley, we have made the decision that we are now putting more effort into our own digital platforms instead of social media platforms and trying once again to find the ways to get those uh, those 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 youngsters young people to use our platform platforms and then we come to words like like truth and and trust and 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 these kind of things, and we want to believe that it could be um, the reason why 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 our our safe platforms are the are the good reason to to come and and, and consume content. And, and we have a pretty uh, successful streaming service, Wiley Arena, that is uh, bigger than Netflix in 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 Finland. But we um, think that. Um, Maybe news is the, is the even even more difficult difficult area to to get get young people to to consume our our news sites instead of uh, finding info from from Google and YouTube and that kind of channels. So I think the delivery is the is the biggest problem right now for us. Everyone agrees. I mean, from the independent production point of view, I, I think they they look public service media as a kind of a, already a delivery service isn't that true is it easy for for example Niklavs, you produced a cooking show and it's shown on ltv latvian public service media right now was it easy to get inside the show in the on well, the big screen well i wouldn't say it was i wouldn't say it was hard uh because right now latvian national television and, and this is a situation for us in Latvia, uh, that uh, yeah, Latvian national television, they're really interested in trying to um, get uh, youth audience in their they're trying to trying anything basically to to get it um, to get them. So um, in this case, we have a good opportunity that they are willing and open for any kind of ideas. And basically, um, if you're if you have a good idea and you go to them, it's probably that you could get funding for that. Of course, the question is how much you can get and uh, because of course everything costs. Um, but um, 
but I think in, 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 in here in Latvia, the delivery is not as hard as the, the story, I would say, and um, because there are a lot of good production uh, companies who are, who are making visually stunning and great work. But one thing that lacks, and I said, the truth is what people really want. It's the story that lacks uh, uh, for us that, you know, once there are a lot of things that you want to share with your friends, and that's the thing that you want to, you know, you want to grab someone's eye, someone's eye and, and um, the best uh, commercial for your product is um, basically eye-to-eye -eye contact and, and just messaging and talking with friends. I saw this great thing. Um, and story is the thing that really drives it as I have seen it. Uh, but I would say for, for us in Latvia, the delivery with so like news and, um, and uh, public services is quite, they're, uh, they're willing to do it. Uh, the problem is more that youth are not consuming that much news or something. They're, like you said, it's Instagram and uh, f just friendly connections more than, uh, than yeah, public, uh, public newsletters. So you have been successful by 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 making this uh, this cooking show your independent show on on a big screen. What has been other experience on YLE or or in in ARD or or in Latvian radio? Is it is it easier for uh, is it easy for uh, independent content creators to, to collaborate to infiltrate themselves inside? Uh, the 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 in the big big media sphere to kind of increase their delivery. Uh, Paolo, also your experience. Have you ever wanted your show to be on the on the on the big platform on the radio, for example? Paolo. Well, I don't know if it's uh, if there is a European radio. I don't know if it exists. No, it, it probably exists, but it's probably very uh, niche. And what I'm looking for is actually to get to people that are not so used to the European bubble. So that's a little bit the the our goal is really to get and reach people that are usually not so much in touch with uh, European institutions, European, uh, the Commission, European Parliament, and so forth. So getting on a bigger media platform, yes, that would be great, but then you would be restrained. So for the time being, I'm happy with the place where I'm at and how I want to develop the project. Um, as I, many people are uh, uh, getting a lot of uh, invitations, a lot of guests I'm, I'm uh, having. So. Um, at the moment, I'm really happy with what we're doing. One thing that I wanted to comment is um, the social media platforms, for example, TikTok and Instagram, when we try to you create your own content. And that's also what Justine said, like you have to landscape to, uh, uh, against the vertical content. So we very fo focused on the vertical content because that's our audience. Everybody's listening on the phone. But then... You create this very nice video. You think, oh, that's gonna, it's gonna be uh, have the same visualizations as before, but it's not. And it's not because you're not using the platform to create the video. And that's the biggest problem that I am facing right now, together with my team. But I'm uh, thinking of making a mix between self-produced media together with the platforms. But that's more time-consuming. So. Um, those are uh, more approachable like problems that you in, you encounter in the process. Uh, Justine, also, uh, independent content creators or or youngsters or young media content are they knocking on the door? Are they willing to be inside this big house? What has been your experience? Has you, have you seen experience this kind of thing, or maybe Elena, who would like to share? I can I can share that I've sadly seen much too little of it. Um, there are definitely uh, independent content creators, um, but the need to conform with a brand is so big that it is very difficult to come in with your own idea and actually pull it through. Um, 
Also, like, I love that you mentioned the notion of truth seeking in, um, like, as, as, a, as a hook for younglings, um, because I have found, like, my, my experience of, of the youth is that they, like, they're kind of twofold. They either are looking for an in-depth analysis of the truth to get to know to the bottom and more, or they only want to brush over the surface. And um, traditional um, old linear um, public service stations usually don't really manage to do these like either or. They have a like in between concept of um, news stories of one minute 20 or the uh, 45, like five minute um, shows about 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 a certain topic, but they rarely manage to to dig deep, um, and that is usually because um, the presentation of a topic um, can can stem out of two reasons. Usually, you either want to shock your um, audience, or you wish to confirm something that that, that that they already know, and you rarely get to get around these. Um, yeah, the, these these two notions. And Elena, you have been twice in this glass studio. For those who doesn't know, this serious request type of thing that's across Europe for the Christmas time, where where radio plays songs for donations and and DJs and the, and the media talks about serious issues, often like some kind of silent crisis. This is a serious content as well. And do you feel that this kind of thing digs deep so people actually understand uh, this topic completely or is, it just, or is it just fun and playing songs and, and, and just, and just the, the kind of pre-Christmas activity? So what's your experience while, while transforming uh, this serious content from traditional media landscape also to this multimedia platform landscape because the, the, the glass studio and the, everything that's happening inside is also shown on TV and on YouTube everywhere. Um, I think that one thing that is really important is that um, all the radio stations, public radio stations in Latvia, uh, we, we come together for this project. Also, uh, also TV comes together. So we, see, so we work to dig deep uh, months before the actual event, uh, before the actual going into the glass studio, uh, before Christmas. So it's a very, very big project. And then there are almost... Uh, 154 hours non-stop radio program which is as you said shown also in tv where we all the time talk only about one topic of course it digs deep uh, at the same time uh, we have to acknowledge that it's an exception it's a one it's a thing that we do once a year and uh, we can we have those resources to do it once a year and it asks a lot like people who are contributing to this project the number is uh, is um, very big it's more than 200 people working on it so we do it for those 7 days and uh, that helps us to bring some kind of topic into uh, into society and show it and talk about it. But uh, that is once a year, and we have to remember it uh, because, uh, yeah, I don't think that we are able to dig that deep on everyday basis. And are you infiltrating some also volunteers, really young people in this whole process, in the media process? How has been this experience for for the for this PTLV? Um, yes, we do it. We have some good friendships with uh, some universities, and um, we try to work together as much as possible. Uh, but there are of course challenges because they come for a few months uh, and um, for young people i think it is easier for them to work um, for projects when you see 
the start, the middle, and the ending. But then there is radio. <laughs> and radio is something that never ends. And it asks um, for different kind of thinking, different kind of um, way to work and to see content creation. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges also to try to um, show these young people who are interested in uh, public media, for example, or for traditional media as it is, uh, how it is different to work for a long-term thing uh, and from, yeah, from working for a specific project. It, it, this leads me to another question about the the transformation of of, of ideas uh, that young people who come to media or who presents or pitch some ideas to media, how much these ideas are being transformed in the time uh, over the time, how much the these adult bosses uh, which have to take decisions like kind of uh, change the whole idea that was in the very beginning who might who wants to share their experience I don't know Nick loves auntie uh, definitely that uh, with my experience with two projects one finished one still ongoing with the Latvian national television um, it's really hard, actually, because um, as uh, Justine said uh, as well, that uh, these big corp corporations, they're living in the middle ground, and especially when you are, you are Latvian, it's Latvia's national television, you, you, you have a name, and you know what's right, and uh, everyone who's working there um, are usually an older generation, and, uh, and uh, they know their ways, even if they have the you know, the youth energy and they want to do something for the youth, uh, it's really hard to make these ideas work. And uh, the most, uh, the biggest thing there is, uh, in, uh, in my opinion, is egos, uh, both from, um, from, from younglings and from, uh, from um, the big corporations and so on, because um, a lot of times, uh, and yeah, this is going to go both ways, uh, uh, I could go in uh, with many good projects and say I'm the best and I can do everything and you can get burned because you, you haven't been burned yet. And uh, the same goes with uh, big corporations and we know our ways, we have been here for years and we know what works and especially for these, um, as uh, Latvian National Te Television is making this 16 plus uh, channel which is for the youth and they're experimenting um, but they're sticking really poorly to their timelines and uh, like we need 20 minutes, no more, no less. Uh, we need, uh, it's really hard to work with these formats with them. Uh, but um, I think they're up, at some points they're forgetting that it's not a traditional media. There are no commercial breaks. You can start watching and finish it watching three days later. Um, what I have seen um, and, and formats in general right now are quite uh, vivid uh, because there are a lot of people using social media and these small yeah, small video snippets but what I've seen in uh, YouTube recently that these long three-hour videos not not so long but hour and so on have been raising in popularity and and these are videos that are going straight into one subject I have seen uh, snip, snippets of some quite hilarious and uh, amazing videos of a guy who's he has he started watching Pretty Little Liars since day one and making these huge uh, maps of every like things that ha happens in this uh, series and explaining everything and you can see that he's he knows more about the TV series and the storyline than even the creators of it. He has thought thought it way through and he has millions of views and um, and you can see that these niche long videos they they work even if on paper it seems like it wouldn't because the youth they don't want to see anything more than 15 minutes but actually if the topic is interesting everyone's going to sit there listen and if the person who's delivering it is interesting um, you can have success but yeah you have to risk it uh, you have to test it out but that's that's my experience yeah uh, auntie have how many times you have cut somebody's ego just because you need to fit this into 15 minutes or 45 minutes or 
whatever whatever is the is the whatever I Wiley needs from from the content creators. What about these well, youngsters? Don't. What are they good media workers? Actually, that, that, that that's the basic question here. Yes, I think they are, and I think we are maybe in a different situation than, for example, Latvian TV. I don't know, but we focus mainly on our own streaming service, Wiley Arena, and we don't um, create programs that much anymore on TV or even radio. We have turned our content production into digital really heavily. And our main platform where we create content is, is our own streaming service, Wiley Arena, we created 10 years ago, before Netflix and before BBC Player. And we are quite ahead uh, in, in, this, in this development. And, uh, and, and we see holes in our offering. We know who we don't reach and we have created we call them specs. It's like instructions for uh, for con con um, uh, production houses or independent con content creators, and we, we tell them that we we don't have this kind of a content. Could you could you offer offer this kind of concepts for us? And for example, right now, uh, half of our budget goes out. And half, half, half is, is used for salaries and intra and so on. So we are putting money out every year more and more, and and, and like interacting with with different kind of creators. And and um, I think I, I I don't see this situation that sad that maybe maybe someone else. So if the idea is good then you don't need to transform it. You don't need to cut anybody's ego down, right? No, and I think we have to go further. We, we, I, I can't see any ego, e ego in this, this discussion here in, 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 in Wiley, if okay. I understood what you mean with that. Okay. Uh, but uh, another part of, of, of young media producers creators is the budget and funding and often it's it's a question of between the the content and the donor's interest power i mean for you probably you have experienced this in your work is there any pressures or how you how how, how do you survive these pressures when you have to deal with with grants and 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 the paperwork and Anybody who will ask, is it worth to spend the money on this? Oh, it's it's very difficult, especially when you are starting. You have to have already results, which you have to show to be able to get um, a funding opportunity. Um, that's why also when we did our crowdfunding, which was through GoFundMe.com, uh, an American f uh, funding a crowdfunding uh, platform, um they it, it was also difficult to explain what we were wanted to do no the, we wanted to explain the project so uh what we did is like step by step explaining what we have done what we were doing uh, uh contacting uh, all the people writing and that's very time consuming especially if you're starting out you want to dedicate your time in the, doing for example in my case interviews uh finding guests preparing well for the interview, so reading content, books, uh, understanding well the topic, and then being able to ask the right questions, because that's the most important thing for at least in what I'm doing. Um, regarding the funding, yes, it's uh, complicated in the sense like, um, for example, there was a journalism fund from the European Union at the end of August, but I didn't I didn't have time to to apply for it, and uh, only in January. So the call ended in August, for example, twenty uh, sixth of August, and on the third of January they told who got uh, selected. So uh, that's like four or five months time uh, before you actually know you have won uh, the project, and then. 
there's still going to be time before you receive the money. So uh, those funds, uh, especially on a European level, are really for people that are already one, two years in the project and already feel like uh, stable enough to commit at least one day a week in writing down the project because you have to do a lot of work, paperwork. So uh, for the people out there that want to do a podcast and are thinking about getting European funds, think about it, uh, take your time. It's going to take a lot of time. Um, there's another opportunity, for example, uh, which we are going to participate in uh, is going to be the Charlemagne Youth Prize. So it play, it's every year. Uh, the deadline is on the 8th of February, I think. And so um, it's for young con uh, uh, projects that are involved within Europe. So it doesn't need to be within the media. And you can try and figure and maybe get a chance to win uh, a financial uh, prize. So there's like these different ways. And also what we are uh, doing now is really going to focus on Patreon. Um, com. So having patrons every week, a month, uh, supporters, getting affiliate links with the services that we use. Um, and also, and then of course, as you said, it's very important that relationship with your, uh, yeah, it's like supporters, but it's also customers, right? So you have to, uh, with some, you have a personal relationship and with others, you don't, and you have to always be a little bit careful on how you handle it. So um at the time being we still don't have i don't have uh too many issues i think the uh, maybe it's going to be later on when uh, people are want to want to have maybe a big star from the movie industry or uh that or i don't know from like as a guest and then it's going to be more complicated for me to justify such a decision for europe matters so uh, those are things that you have to consider okay very interesting very interesting experience we need to wrap up this panel discussion i have a one last question and we have only one answer available because we are running out of time so whoever raised uh, their hand first will get the chance to answer that last question but i i assume that uh, we might not get the answer as well but let's try so working with youngsters and producing some youth media content there might be some failures i want somebody from you i have i had some experiences back in the days but from from anybody of you who wants to share uh, their their uh failure but more importantly what you have learned from this like failure experienced so who anybody who raised the hand will get the chance to be the last person who will talk in this discussion so While you are thinking, who's gonna do it? Who's gonna do it? <laughs> gonna do it? <laughs> while while you are thinking about your failures, I I I I'm, uh, I I might come up with my own. And so we had uh, this uh, hip hop show on the on <laughs> on on public service media for the youngsters, and we had some bad words over there on 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 air. So we it didn't well went well. So uh, but. Uh, yeah, it uh, allowed me to experience uh, learn from this experience that you have to consider many things in advance. That things can go wrong from time to time, so you have to prepare mentally and 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 and, and uh, that uh, that it's not like always be a, a, a clean road. It, there might be some bumpy uh, uh, sector sections of the road as well. So. I don't see any raised hands here, so <laughs> I think we are uh, are allowed to 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 finish this. And I thank you all of you who joined us from the Netherlands, from Sweden, from uh, from uh, from Finland, and here from Latvia. Elina, Niklas, Anti, Justin, and Paolo. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge, sharing your experience, and helping building bridge between the big media organizations and the uh, youth media content creators. Thank you very much. And uh, now we have a, a little short little break and then we will have uh, media workshops and our very first media workshop will be from uh, Anita Prieda. She already had uh, her presentation about uh, uh, media literacy here in Latvia and how people encounter um, 
um, misinformation online but uh, later on she will talk about uh, media literacy and there will be special uh, media w literacy workshops so it will start uh, just around three o'clock so that's like three minutes from now so stick with us and have a glass of water or a small snack and let's continue after a small little break
Mūsu veiciens visiem trīs minūtes ir pagājušas, un mūsu konferences turpinās šajā brīdī jau latviešu valodējā, jo mums ir pieslēdzēs arī TV Nets. Sveiciens visiem, kas šo skatās TV Netā mēs šodien un rīt esam jauniešu mēdīju konferencē. Te ir gan akadēmiski pētījumi, gan pieredzes apmaiņi, gan arī meisterklases. Un šajā pēcpusdienā mēs fokusēsimies uz meisterklasēm. Anita Priede no interneta asociācijas, no droši interneta, jau šodien runāja par tām tendencēm, kas Latvijā ir saistībā ar jauniešiem un viltus ziņām ar dezinformāciju, cik daudz jauni cilvēki saprot, redz un cīnās ar visu to, kas notiek šajā laukā. Anita ir sagatavojusi mums nākamajās minūtēs arī meistara klasi, kā visas šīs prasmes atpazīt un cīnīties un nešērot viltu ziņas, kā visas šīs prasmes uzlabot. Tā kā, Anita, es vēlreiz mums prieks tevi redzēt un vārds tev un droši var stāstīt, kā mums ar to visu tik galā. Paldies, redzu vārdošanu. Es biju cerējies, bet tagad, kad mēs runāsim latviski, man vairs datoru sirī visliek neasistēs, bet tik un tā viņš visu laiku iesaistās un cenšās asistēt. Tā, es tūlīkās dalīšos ar ekrānu, un tad mēs varēsim sākt. Tā. Tā, tad jā, man sauc Anika Priede, es esmu no drošāka interneta, Latvijas drošāka interneta centra, un šodien es runāšu par sociālo mediju, mediju pratību. Un par mediju pratību ļoti bieži mēs dzirdam, bet tās mērķis ir stiprināt sabiedrības izturēt spēju pret nepatiesu informāciju. Ja pat tad, ja mēs saskramies ar informāciju, kura nav patiesa, kura nav uzticama, vai kur ir maldinoša vai kaitnieciska, tā mērķī pratības mērķis ir nodrošināt to, ka cilvēki vēl būtu prasmas un metodes, lai saskratēs ar kaut ko tādu, viņi zinātu, kā rīkoties un kā nerīkoties. Jo, ja mēs šodien es runāšu ļoti daudz par sociālajiem tīkliem, ja mēs runājam par sociālajiem medijiem, mēs tur piepildam ārkārtīgi dažādas vajadzības, nepieciešanību pēc komunikācijas un draudzības un atbalsta un uzmanības, kā arī izklaidas un izglītošanās. Tas nozīmē, ka tur ir ārkārtīgi plašs spektrs, ko mēs varam sev dot. Un Tas ir fantastiski, es pati arī esmu milzīgi internetu un sociālo mēdīju, tā teikt, fane. Un man liekas, ka tam ir ārkārtīgi milzīgi pievienotā vērtība, un tas, ka mēs varam visu laiku komunicēt ļoti globāli, un tas, ka mēs varam visu laiku sekot līdzi, kas notiek par tām lietām, kas mūs interesē, tas ir fantastiski. Bet, protams, mēs nevaram izbēgt no tā, ka tā zibinīgā un neierobežot tā informācijas apmaiņa ietver sevi arī riskus, kas saistīti ar atrastās informācijas kvalitāti un uzticamību. Un es gribēju šākt ar laiks, ko mēs pavadam sociālajos medijos. Man ārkārtīgi patika jūsu video pirms tam par to, ka jauniešiem prasīja pārbaudīt viņu laiku, ko viņu pavada pie telefoni jeb stream time, un šeit ir arī viens pētījums no Amerikas, kad jākopš pandēmijas sākuma jaunieši ir uz pusi vairāk pavadu laikus pie ekrāniem, neskaitot to laiku, ko viņi pavada pie mācībām, mācību vajadzībām, bet tīri spēlēt spēles, sociālie mēdīja, īziņa sūtīšana, video, čati, Sērpošana internetā jau viņa pirms pandēmijas tās bija vidēji 3,8 stundas, tad šobrīd tās ir vidēji 7,7. Tas nozīmē, ka viņš ir dubultojies šis laiks. Un es vēl prātu tagad palaistu video. Prātu palaistu video. Man liekas, kurš ļoti labākā es izskaidros par to, kāpēc ir tik grūti atrauties no šiem sociālajiem tīkliem. Un 
Mirklīti. Un ir Viņškarni būstis video latviešu valodā, un es pēc tam paskaidrošu, kas tur, nevis latviešu valodā, bet angļu valodā es paskaidrošu, kas tur būs teikts. Six easy steps to get us addicted to our phones. What are the most common design tricks used to addict us to our apps? Who's responsible for the way that we interact with our technology? And should we be blaming ourselves for not putting down our phones? We all know that warm, fuzzy feeling when someone likes your post. Simple design tactics can feed into this sense of being wanted, even if it's just to know that someone is typing a response. What do you feel when you see the typing bubble, the red confirmation, or that your photo has been liked? True stories take six times longer to reach people than fake ones. And if the story is worth reading, then who really cares if it's true or not? The point is that emotionally charged content gets clicks. And whether it's a cute cat, gifts, celebrity breakups, or a life hack, the internet is made of these bite-sized chunks of information. How easily would you follow a meme or clickbait? Did you know that what you see has been tested on thousands of people to find the best possible image, the most irresistible title to get you to click on it? friends or just followers. There's not much of a difference because we're all social creatures. Who doesn't want to be liked? Quantifying friends and interactions means that we will spend more time online so that we can nurture and extend our social circle. How often do you check how many people follow you? How often do you want to retweet, reblog, or forward to all of your followers to increase your own status? Whether hanging out with friends online or in a game, nobody wants to feel left out. Designing apps as social hubs with all the joys and fears of everyday life means that you want to stay involved. You don't want to miss out on new trends like stickers, limited releases, offers and other rewards. Everyone else is there. What are they doing? If you're not there, you might miss out. Sound and movement create a strong sense of urgency. Being available involves all the senses. Notifications come with movement and sounds, and they pop up to distract you through all your interconnected devices. And they're good at finding you in those moments when you're just thinking, what to do next? There's no dead end on the internet. Frictionless design combined with bottomless content means that we can stay online for hours without even thinking about it. Autoplay will make it easier to select the next irresistible thing to watch. Infinite scroll will satisfy your need for rewarding content. Pull to refresh is like a nice surprise waiting for you in every loading of the screen, and there is always the next thing to do, have, get, see, or achieve. The makers of apps, content, and platforms rely on our constant attention. This entire ecosystem depends on keeping us engaged. Value is assessed by how many users services have, what users do on their platform, and how often. Engineers, designers, and psychologists work together to make sure that we are constantly drawn in, designing for addiction. Does it matter how our data is used to nudge us, provoke us, and form our habits? Do we mind that our attention is turned into value? Is the instant reward worth the total Life's habits and behaviour. And are we to blame premium for not putting down download our phones? music or and listen offline have we been from hooked? any device? Whether you want to listen from your speakers, your TV, or your phone. Tā. Um, es ceru, ka jūs nedzirdējāt manu uh, Spotify reklāmu. Bet... Tā, tad šī bija fantastiska, fantastisks video, kurā mēs redzam, uh, cik ļoti pārdomātas uh, un uh, tā, cik ļoti pārdomātas un uh, ir šīs platformas, kas nozīmē, ka pasaulē gudrākie, labāk atmaksātie inženieri, psihologi, psihologi uh, veido šīs platformas uh, un viņas ir radītas, lai iegūtu no mums mūsu visvērtīgāko laiku. Uh, tāpēc vienmēr, kad tiek runāts par šo atbildību no lietotājiem, cik daudz laiku mēs pavadām šajos sociālajos medijos, uh, man liekas, ka tas uh, mums ir jāapzinās, uh, kad uh, Mēs esam ļoti, ļoti pārdomāta produkta lietotāji, un kā arī iepriekš jūs jautājāt video, tad, protams, tas ieteikums ir pirmkārt reāli paskatīties, cik tad laiks tiek pavadīts sociālajos medijos, un tad, protams, šajos iestatījumos ir iespējams uzlikt šos aplikāciju limitus, vai nu tur konkrēti 
piemēram, TikTokam man tas nestrādā, TikToku es vienkārši dzēšu ārā, jo ar visiem aplikācijas iestatījumiem es netiekalu, man viņš liekas pārāk aizraujoši, bet, nu, piemēram, jūs to varat, ja jums tā nav, tad, protams, šie te Twitterim, Instagramam, visiem mēs varam uzlikt šos aplikācijas, vismaz mēs saprotam to laiku, kas ir pagājis, kā arī dažādām spēlītēm. Man gan jāsaka, šī stunda 55 ir labākais rezultāts pēdējo jo mēneša laikā tieši, cik maz laika es esmu pavadījusi, tāpēc es ļoti lēpni viņu ielikt šajā prezentācijā. Tā, un, protams, mēs visu laiku meklējam kaut kādas metodas, kā varētu to iegrožot un kāpēc tik daudz laika nepavadīt sociālajos tīklos. Un viens no tādiem ļoti labiem veidiem ir, piemēram, nelietot telefonu guļam istabā, bet, piemēram, lietot modinātāju pulksteni. Jā. Jo tas ir interesanti, ka cilvēka vidējais uzmanības ilgums ir samazinājies no 12 sekundēm 2000. gadā līdz 8 sekundēm 2013. gadā un 6 sekundēm 2019. gadā. Un, diemžēl, tas ir mazāk nekā zelta zivtiņas uzmanības noturība 9 sekundēs. Un kāpēc tas ir svarīgi? No Irekas Baltijam mēs redzam, ka mēdīja pārslodzē ir ļoti labi apraktīts fenomens un daudz no mums reizēm jūtas noguruši no informācijas daudzumu, kuru viņi uzņēma ar sociālo mēdīju starpniecību. Un tas, kas ir pats svarīgākais mums visu laiku, ir tas spiediens, tā kā zināt visu, kas notiek, kas notiek mūsu iecienītajos seriālos, kas jauns noticis un iznācis ir Netflixā, kas notiek ar mūsu draugiem, kas notiek ar influencēriem, kas mums interesē, kas notiek ar radiem, kas vispār notiek ar universitātē vai kaut kur citur, un tas var nogurdināt, mums ļoti daudz, kam jāizsako līdzi, Un tas pats svarīgākais, ko es gribu pateikt, ir, ka tas vienkārši uzliek atbildību. Ir jāprot atbildīgi lietot mēdījus un uztvert informāciju, jo tas resurs mums ir viens, un mums tas internets dod ārkārtīgi fantastiskas iespējas, bet mums ir jāsaprot, ja mēs varam darīt visu, visu laiku, tad mums pašiem jāuzņemās tā atbildība. Jā, un pirmais, kas ir, kas ir ļoti svarīgi, ir emocija atpazīšana ir pirmais, manuprāt, vispār tas, lai adekvāti izlantu, kā rīkoties, un vai vispār reaģēt uz saņemto informāciju, jo mēs visu laiku esam ļoti dažādos informācijas burbuļos. Man liekas, mēs arī nevaram runāt, kad ir kaut kāds pareizais informācijas burbuļos, un tad ir kaut kāds nepareizais, jo mums visiem ir dažādas intereses un pārējās, influenci, ar kuriem mēs sekojam, piemēram, mēs ļoti daudz skatos Austrālijas YouTube, un tad, kad es, piemēram, sēžu ar savām draudzinēm, kurš ir tā paša vecuma, tāds pats dzīves vieta, līdzīgas intereses, es iespējams, es vispār citā informācijas burbulī nekā viņas, kaut mēs it kā pēc tādiem lokācijas un vecuma standartiem būtu viena un tāpat tā auditorija. Tāpēc vienmēr mums ir jāatcerās, ka vienalga, kurā burbulī mēs esam, ir kaut kādi pamati spēles noteikumi, kur vienkārši mums ir jāzina. Un kā tad tas sociālo tīklu platformu algoritums strādā, tas, ko mēs par viņu zinām, protams, ir ļoti daudz, kas, ko mēs arī nezinām, bet tas, ko mēs zinām, ir, ka viņš strādā pēc principa, ka es redzu to, ko es iepriekš esmu skatījies. Ja, piemēram, mēs izdomājam, ka nākošā es ceļojums, kuru gribās aizbraukt, ir Ēģipte, un mēs ierakstām Google meklētājā Ēģipte, Tad noteikums parādīs, ja es tur viesnīcas un ko tur apskatīt un ko tur garšīgi apēst un cik tam maksā aizbraukt uz Ēģiptu un kā tad var aizbraukt uz Ēģiptu. Bet tajā pašā laikā, ja mēs būsim žurnālisti un rakstīsim par sarežģietiem, kaut kādiem politiskajiem procesiem Ēģiptē, tas nozīmē to, ka mums ierakstot Google vārdu Ēģiptu parādītos pilnīgi citi informāciju. Jo mēs katrs savos sociālos tīklos redzam šo atšķirīgo saturu un atšķirīgas reklāmas līdz ar to, balstoties uz to, uz kādu saturu esam reaģējuši iepriekš. Kā mēs visi ļoti labi zinām, piemēram, arī mūsu mūzikas gauma tiek pielāgota mūsu mūsu tām iepriekšējām pieredzēm. Ik nedēļu Spotify mēs redzam tātad šīs dziesmas un ik gadu mēs varam saprast, kas tad bijis mūsu tas visu iecienītākais. 
Un mēs to varam, protams, izmantot arī savā labā, piemēram, Man ļoti patīk to darīt darba vajadzībām vai arī brīvā laika vajadzībām. Piemēram, man ļoti patīk ir pārgājienos, un tad es zinu, ja man vajag Latvija apļveidu trasa 20 km, tad es to ierakstu Google, un pēc pāri dienā man Facebookā Dombiedru grupās parādās specifiski šāda trasa pārgājienam, kas nozīmē, ka es tā to zinot, ka ja es ievadīšos atslēgu vārdus pēc pāris dienām, man būs šī specifiskā informācija, tas nozīmē, ka es viņu atradīšu daudz tādu specifiskāku un sev iespējams nodarīgāku. Nekā es būtu vienkārši ierakstījusi Google un skatījusies, kas pirmais man tur rādās. Un man patīk domāt par šiem sociālo mediju algoritmiem kā tādiem dresējiem dzīvnieciņiem no manas puses. Man tiešām patīk, ka es savā Netflixā es ļoti tā strikti atzīmēju visu, kas man nepatīk un visu, kas man patīk, lai man tieši rādītu tas saturs, kas man ļoti interesē. Ar Spotify tieši tāpat, tāpēc man liekas, ka mēs neesam tādi bezpalīdzīgi, mums ir ārkārtīgi daudz ietekmes tieši sociālajos mēdījos pie saturu, ko mēs patērējam, tāpēc tev, kā mums ir iespēja vienkārši to saturu pielāgot sev, lai viņš ir maksimāli interesants un vērtīgs. Tātad, bet kādu saturu mēs redzam? Mēs redzam saturu, ka mēs sekojam, mēs redzam saturu, kuru mums iesaka, un mēs redzam saturu, kuru mums rekomē. Piemēram, ja mēs ieiem Facebookā, tad pie katras reklāmas mēs varam nospiest augšā, tur labajā augšējā stūrītī ir trīs punkti, un mēs vienmēr varam redzēt, kāpēc es redzu šo reklāmu. Piemēram, šeit man ir tādā reklāma, kas ir līdzīga kā Spotify, arī mūzikas traumēšanas platforma, tātad es esmu bijusi viņu platformā vai viņu partneru platformās, es esmu komunicēju angliski vai man ir vairāk 18 gadu, es dzīvoju Latvijā, vai arī man ir šī pie galda reklama, tātad es esmu izrādījis interesi par ēdienu, es esmu sievieti no 2044 gadiem, es dzīvoju Latvijā, tātad tas nozīmē to, ka es esmu izrādījis interesi par šīm lietām, un tas nozīmē, ka viņas man arī rāda. Jā, un tātad, ja mēs runājam par mediju pratības pašiem pamatiem, kas ir vienkārši būtiski atšķirā zināt vienalga, ar kādu informāciju mēs saskaramies, tad tas pamatu pamats ir kā atšķirt viedokli no fakta. Viedoklis ir kāda cilvēka uzskats attieksme pret kādu notikumu. Nu, piemēram, tā ir ticība, tās ir aizdomas, tā ir ieteikumi, tās ir domas. Tās ir pretenzijas un tās ir arī sajūtas. Viedokļi var būt daudzi, viņi var atšķirties, viņi var mainīties, tur ļoti daudz viss kaut kas var notikt. Faktus ir iespējams pārbaudīt. Tie ir paties vai tie nav paties. Tie ir datumi, tie ir skaitļi, tie ir zinātniski pētījumi, tie ir likumi. Piemēram, ja es jums šodien teikšu, ka Latvijā ir fantastiski laikapstākļi, vai ka Latvijā ir tiešām briesmīgi laikapstākļi šobrīd Rīgā, tad tas būs mans viedoklis par to, kāda Latvijā šobrīd ir laikapstākļi, bet ja es ieju man telefonā, tā tad ir aplikācija, laikapstākļa aplikācija, un es paskatos, ka Rīgā pulkstienas 15. 21. ir trīs grādi, Tā tad tas ir fakts. Tas nemainās no tā, vai man tie liekas brīnišķīgi vai tiešām briesmīgi. Kas ir mans viedoklis fakts ir tāds, ka Rīgā konkrētā pulkstenī ir konkrēta gaisa temperatūra. Tagad es gribētu, lai jūs man pasakat, es nezinu, varbūt čakā ierakstiet, kā jums liekas, lai dziedētāji Billy Eliš Ir jauniešu iedvesmojošākā dziedātāja. Tas ir viedoklis vai tas ir pakts? Es gan šobrīd, kad man ir, es dalos ar prezentācijas, neredzu, mēs redzu. Jā. Viedoklis. Elis raksta viedoklis, Alis raksta viedoklis, Laura raksta viedoklis, Ilona raksta viedoklis. Burvīgi. Jā, tas nozīmē, ka mēs saprotam, ka šis ir viedoklis. Un 
un vienam tā ir bija lieliši, vienam viss pār varbūt viņi nepatīk, kādam citam ir kaut kas cits, kas viņam liekas visi iedvesmojošākais, tad tas ir viedoklis, kāda, katram tas var atšķirties. Uh, bet šis jau ir par iepriekšējo gremiju, mēs tagad visi gaidām nākošo, bet ja es jums saku, ka Los Angeles 14. martā notikusi ASV ierakstu industrijas balvas gremiju ceremoniju, un otro gadu pēc kārtas kategorijā gada ieraksts balvas aņēmus dziedātāji Billu Jelliš. Šogad par savu dziesmu Everything I Wanted, tad tas būtu viedoklis vai tas būtu fakt. Jā, es redzu, cilvēki raksta, ka tas būtu fakts tieši tā, tāpēc, ka šeit ir konkrētas izmērāmas lietas, ko mēs varam pārbaudīt. Un tā kā mēs esam medīpatības nodarbībā, mēs arī rakstam Google, kad Billy Jelliš grēmī 2021. Un mēs redzam, ka oficiālajā grēmī mājas lapā tiešām Record of the Year, ja gada ieraksts ir Everything I Wanted uh, by Billy Jelliš. Tātad uh, Billy Jelliš ir uzvarējis šo te godpilnu no balvu. Protams, ir ļoti forši runāt par uh, mūziķiem, uh, bet ja mēs runājam par saturu kā tādu faktu iekļaušanu apgalvojumā vēl negarantē, ka šis apgalvojums ir paties, jo ja es uh, tādā ļoti apgalvojumu formā teiku, Latvijā ir 4 miljoni iedzīvotāji, mēs jau visi saprast, ka nav. Un tas, ka es kaut ko apgalvoju, vēl nenozīmē, ka ja man šī tad teikuma uzbūvi ir kā apgalvojums, tas nenozīmē, ka tā ir patiesība. Pat, ja tur ir kaut kāds lietas, ko mēs varam izmērīt, un mēs viņus arī izmēram, mēs rakstam Google, ka Latvijā ir 4 miljoni iedzīvotāji. Mēs redzam, ka pēc centrālās statistikas pārvēlas datiem, nē, Latvijā 2020. gadā ir bijuši knapi 2 miljoni. Un tad, vispār par saturu, ko mēs varam, kā mēs to vispār varam vērtēt. Jo saturs arī atšķirās tādā ziņā, ka ir dažādas, dažādas tās tēmas. Un tā kā es iepriekš stāstīju par pētījumu, tad arī šodien šajā sadaļā es gribu tā kā sadalīt internetā pieejamo saturu tā tad trīs tādās kategorijās. Tātad pirmā ir informācija par vaļas priekiem un interesēm, bet tas ir saturs par sportu, par mūziku, par sekošanu influenceriem, par datoru spēlēm. Otrais ir informācija par notikumiem pasaulē. Tās ir tādas nopietnākas lietas, tās ir ziņas, tā ir politika, tas ir klimats, tā ir zinātne. Un trešais ir informācija par draugiem vai skolas piedriem, piemēram, tenkas, baumas vai noslēpuma. Un kas ir interesanti, ir veikts pētījums ASV, kad YouTube lietotāji jaunieši uzskata, ka viņu iemīļotais YouTube satura veidotājs saprot viņus labāk nekā viņu draugi. Un tas ir ļoti, to, to ir ļoti svarīgi atcerēties, kad, kā es iebraukšu menēju, Mēs sociālajos mēdījos piepildam ārkārtīgi daudz tādas vajadzības un arī tādas sociālās vajadzības, tāpēc mums ir jāsaprot, ka tad, ja cilvēks skatās, piemēram, influenci ar saturu, viņš var būt iespējams būs daudz nekritiskāks, jo arī tas, ko mēs pētījumā atklājām, ka tikai trīs no desmit jauniešiem pārbauda influenci ar pausto viedokļu patiesumu. Un tas vienkārši uh, nozīmē to, ka cilvēki klausās šajos influenceros, un tas ļoti bieži, ļoti forši. Uh, vienīgi tas arī konkrēti nozīmē to, ka influenceriem ir atbildīgi, jo cilvēki viņiem uzticās. Tātad, ja mēs saskramies ar informāciju, kas ir pa influenceri, ko mēs darām? Tad mēs meklējam, kā viņš pats komentē šo situāciju, un varbūt ir oficiāla atvainošanās vai paskaidrojums, uh, Jo, piemēram, kad mums bija pētījums tā, tad par misinformāciju, un ar ko saskarās jaunieši internetā 2021. gadā Latvijā šīs ten ziņas par Samantu Tīnu un par viņas veselības stāvo, ko bija uztraukuši daudz jauniešu, un tad viņi, jā, viņi bija uzzinājuši, ka viņai kā tur veselība kaut kas, un tad viņi bija gaidījuši, lai viņi pati paskaidro, un viņiem bija svarīgi, ka viņi pati paskaidro, un viņi dzirdinoja tātad šīs dziedātājs, kas notiek un kas ir tas kas tad īsti ir noticis. Um, otrais, kas ir ļoti bieži par tādiem hobijiem, ar ko cilvēki bieži saskarās un kur ir ļoti daudz šīs emocijas, 
ja informācija ir par kādu mūzikas albumu vai koncertu vai video spēli vai grāmatu, kas drīzumā iznāks. Jo tā vienmēr arī ir jāpārbaud oficiālajās pārstāvniecības mājaslapās un oficiālajos sociālos tīklos, jo atcerieties, ka fanu lapu informāciju nav oficiāli un reizēm var sagādāt vilšanos. Man bija nodarbība, kur man viena meitene stāstīja ļoti sirsnīgi, ka viņa bija redzējuši, ka būs Eminems Latvijā, ka Eminemam būs koncerts. Viņa teica vispār nepārbaudīja, kas to saka, jo viņa bija tik priecīga. Viņa saka, viņa visiem izsūtīja, visiem izsūtīja, ka Eminem koncerts būs Latvijā un nevarēja sagaidīt, kad viņš būs Latvijā. Un, protams, tad, ka tās emocijas pierim, viņa saprata, ka tā nav īsti patiesība, un, diemžēl, vēl minamis uz Latviju nebrauks. Bet tas ir ļoti cilvēcīgi, ka tev kaut kas ļoti patīk, un tu ļoti gribētu, lai tā būtu, ka tu aizmirstu pārbaudīt kaut kādus faktus. Kas ir ļoti forša lieta tieši par ārzemes labenībām un par aktuālām interneta ziņām ir tāds snūps. Kas nozīmē, ja tur ir kaut kādi cirkulēji, kaut kādas, tas nav par latviešu gan, bet tas ir par ārzemi, bet ja nu jūs redzat, ka cirkulēji TikTokā vai kaut kur ziņas par kādām internetas lavenībām vai par influenceriem vai par mūziķiem vai aktieriem, tad vai arī vispār kaut kādas dīvainas informācijas, kaut kādas interneta, kaut kādi viral video. Tad šis ir labs, laba vieta, kur ieskatīties un paskatīties, varbūt, ka viņi ir pārbaudījuši, tā ir vai nav taisnība. Jo, kā es iepriekš teicu, tādas lietas, piemēram, kā mūzika un mūsu hobija, mums tur ir ļoti daudz liela tā emocionālā piestaista, un tas ir forši, tas tiešām forši, bet mums jāatcerās, ka vienalga, lai mēs būtu emocionāli ļoti priecīgi vai ļoti dusmīgi, tad, kad mums ir ļoti spēcīgas emocijas, mums samazinās kritiskā domāšana, tā tas vienkārši ir. Un vai jūs man varat čatā ierakstīt, vai jūs spējat izlasīt to, kas šeit ir rakstīts? Jā, es redzu. Jā, ka cilvēks spēja izlasīt, kas ir ierakstīts čatā, jo, kā mēs zinām, mūsu prāts pats saliek, neticam sarežģītas puzas, izmantojot visu to informācijas fragmentus, kas tam ir pieejami. Un tie ir atkarīgi gan no konteksta, kādā redzam konkrēto informācijas vienību, gan mūsu atmiņām, iepriekšējai pieredzei un uztverei. Un tas ir ļoti svarīgi tieši šajā emocija jautājumā, jo, piemēram, man bija tāds konkrēts piemērs, ko man patīk stāstīt un ko man patīk dalīties tieši par to, kā tad, kad tev ir ļoti spēcīgas emocijas, tev samazinās uzmanības spēja kritiski domāt un izsvērt informāciju. Tātad es esmu liela dziedātāja Bejonces fane, un pirms sešiem gadiem viņiem iznāca treileris, kad viņiem būs filma. Un tas treileris, viņiem kopā ar vīri, čeiz ir būs filma, un tas treileris ir ļoti, ļoti labs. Nu tiešām, tur bija Sean Spence, un tur bija ļoti daudz aktieri no tādiem A-klases aktieriem, un tur tas sižets tik ass un spraigs, un es biju tik laimīgs nosotīt mums visiem saviem draugiem, ka nu tik mēs iesim, būs rītīgi forši, nevar sagaidīt šo filmu. Un... No Ireks Baltija ir, Ireks vispār ir šī fantastiskā emocija puķa. Tātad es esmu saskārusi ar informāciju, un tas ir tas, ko es tiešām aicinātu, tad, kad jūs saskaraties ar informāciju, kas jūs ļoti ir emocionāli kaut kā izsits no līdzsvaru, tad piefiksēt, kas ir tās emocijas, ar kurām jūs šobrīd saskaraties. Jo tātad es redzēju šo treileri, Es biju ārkārtīgi priecīgi, es visiem viņu izsūtīju, tātad es izjūtu ekstāzi, un es izjūtu prieku, un es izjūtu pārsteigumu, un es izjūtu interesi. Un tātad es viņu aizsūtīju saviem draugiem, un viens no draugiem man atbildēja, ka Ančuk tur beigās ir rakstīts milzīgiem burtiem, ka kamīgi nevar. Nu, tā, ka tas ir treileris, un pēc treileros beigās ir laiks, kad šis treileris, tā, kad būs redzams kīnoteatrī pilnajā filmā, un šajā trailerī milzīgiem burtiem ir rakstīts, kam viņi nevar. 
kas nozīmē, ka tāpēc, ka man bija ārkārtīgas pēcīgas emocijas, un es tik ļoti gribēju, lai tā ir taisnība, palaid garām tieši tāpat kā tajos tekstos, ka mēs spējam it kā uztver tekstu, balstoties uz to, ka mēs šo tekstu esam jau simt reiz redzējuši, mums ir kaut kādas jau iepriekšējais pieredzes, bet mums tik un tā ir jāatcerās, ka mēs esam sevišķi par informāciju, kas mums izraiz spēcīgas emocijas, ka mēs varam kļūdīties, ka mums samazinās šīs tentas priespējas, mums ir ļoti spēcīgas emocijas. Jā, tā tad arī šis ten piemērs no Latvijas, kad arī kāda meitina bija redzējusi, ka One Direction atkal apvienosies, tā tad mūzikas grupa, un viņa bija ārkārtīgi priecīga un pārsteigta, un arī, protams, jo ir šī prieks, un ir šī spēcīga emocija, un šeit gribas dalīties ar visiem, un viņa arī bija nosūtījuši jo ziņu saviem draugiem, pat nepaskatoties, vai tā ir patiesība, un kāda vērtīgā kapulpoja komentārs redzēja, ka visi saka, ka tas ir izdomājums, un tiešām pats tam pārbaudēt, tas tiešām bija nepatiesi. Otra lieta, kas ir ļoti svarīga, ir tā pikšķerēšana un krāpniecība, ar ko mēs varam saskaties sociālajos medijos, kas nozīmē, ka visu laiku ir iespējams sajumt kaut kādas vēstules, kur ir aicinājums uzklikšķināt, kaut ko iegādāties vai kaut ko iegūt pa velti, kaut ko uzvarēt. Un tas pārsarā ir ļoti bieži tieši saistībā ar spēlēm. Tātad draugs man atsūtīja viltu saiti, kas ļauj saņemt bezmaksas robuks, bet noklikšķinot uz saits mans konts tika uzlausts un es vairs nevarēju tam piekļūt. Lai gan varēja izveidot jaunu kontu, jūtos ļoti nomākts par apkrāpšanu un ieteiktu citiem nenodot tālāk šādas saites un neklikšķināt uz šādām saitēm, ja kaut kas tāds atgadās. Tātad atkal mēs saņemam saiti, ja mēs esam tādi ļoti racionāli, mēs, protams, sapratīsim, ka nav jāspiež. Bet ja tas ir kaut kas tāds, ko mēs gribam, ja tā spēle ir tāda, ko mēs spēlējam, mēs varam aizrauties un noklikšķināt, un tajā ir tas bīstamais. Jo, ja mēs kā auditorija vispār pamanam kā konkrētā ziņa vai attēls, lai mums justies, tas jau ir būtisks solis, lai šo informāciju spētu adekvāti vērtēt un rīkoties atbilstoši situācijai. Jo tas jo tas jau ir pusi no uzvars, jo mēs vienkārši saprotam, ka mēs ir jāvērtē visu laiku informāciju, ar kur mēs saskamies, mums ir jāvērtē. Tātad, zaši izstāstīšu par šajām trīs lietām, kas ir viltu ziņas, kas ir dezinformācija un kas ir misinformācija. Tātad, viltu ziņas ir izdomāta informācija, kurā nejau saistības ar realitāti. Man ies teiktu, ka šodien Rīgā bija deviņu baļu zemes trīci, tad tas ir pilnīgs izdomājums, tā ir viltu ziņa. Tā nav taisnība. Ar dezinformāciju gan ir daudz saražģītāka, tāpēc, ka dezinformācijā ir ļoti, ļoti svarīgs nodoms. Tas nozīmē to, ka dezinformācijas šis ten izplatītājs un radītājs viņš ļoti labi zina, ka viņš izplata un rada kaitniecišku informāciju, kaitniecišku informācijas apbiedrībai, bet viņš to dara konkrētu motivāciju vadīts, piemēram, lai iegūtu politisku varu, iegūtu slābu, iegūtu negūtu prātīgas līdzekļus. Un tur ir ļoti svarīgi, ka šis cilvēks ļoti labi zina, ko viņš dara un ka šī informācija, ko viņš izplata, ir nepatiesa. Ar mīsi informāciju tur ir sarežģītāk un tā ir tāda zona, kas man ļoti interesē, un kur mēs visi kā auditorija un kā lietotāju reizēm varam pakupt. Tā ir informācija, kuras izplatīšanas nolūks nav ļaundabīgs. Tas nozīmē, ka cilvēks kaut ko ir izlasījis, un viņš ir noticējis, ka tā ir taisnība, un viņš to izplata tālāk nevis tāpēc, vai tur iegūtu politisku varu, vai tur iegūtu kaut kādus naudas līdzekļus, bet viņš to dara tāpēc, ka viņš vienkārši tur informēt sabiedrību. Un tās ir tās trīs lietas, kuras atšķirās savā starpā. Tātad, mēs esam izrunājuši par influenceru saturu, un ko darīt tad, ja mēs uzzinām, ka kāds no mūsu iecienītākajiem mūziķiem Piemēram, uzstāsies Latvijā, tad mums tas ir jāpārbauda. Bet, ja informācija ir par notikumiem pasaulē, piemēram, ziņas, politika, klimats, zinātne, tā noteikti ir jāpārbauda oficiālajās mājaslapās. 
Un svarīgi ir salīdzināt internetā pieejamo informāciju ar vairāku uzticamu mēdīju sižetiem vai rakstiem. Lai papildus atstātījai informācijai sociālajos tīklu platformās var to salīdzināt ar informāciju, kuru profesionāli pētnieciskie žurnālisti jau ir iedzinājušies un izpētījuši šo tematu. Un tas ir ļoti svarīgi, ja mēs... Protams, mēs nevaram ka auditoriju pārbaudīt visu informāciju, kas tas nav fiziski iespējams. Runa ir par to, kad mēs esam uzgājuši informāciju, un mums tagad pirmkārt vai nu ļoti spēcīgas emocijas, vai arī mēs gribam ar viņu dalīties tālāk. Tātad šī mēdīja pratība ir šī izturēt spēju un spēju saprast, ka vai šī informācija ir jāpatot tālāk, vai šī informācija ir jāpārbaud, vai šī informācija ir jāvērtē. Un mēs varbūt varam paši pārbaudīt, vai Eminems būs vai nebūs Latvijā. Bet daudz sarežģītāk reizēm ir pārbaudīt šīs nopietnās ziņas par politiku, par klimatu, par zinātni. Tāpēc ir ļoti svarīgi, ka mēs tad balstamies uz tiešām pētniecīsku žurnālistiku, profesionālu žurnālistiku, kuri jau ir iedziļinājušies, kuriem jau ir bijis šis laika un zināšana resursus, lai to izdarītu. Jo par to, kas šobrīd notiek iepriekš, jau arī Kārlis jautāja, jā, tātad UNESCO ir izveidojis pat jaunu terminu kā dezinfodēmija, kas ir kā dezinformācijas un pandēmijas apvienojums, jo šī neskaidrība pa cilvēku drošībai svarīgām personiskām vai politiskām izvēlēm, diemžēl, ir dzīvībai bīstama. Un kāpēc es to tik, kāpēc es pieminu to, ka mums ir jāskatās tā tad uzticamu mēdīju šajās tad platformās, tāpēc, ka ir tāds vienmēr man ļoti patīk uz lietām skatīties ļoti tā plašāk, Un ir tāds presas brīvības indeksis, un tas ir ļoti, ļoti svarīgi, ka mēs redzam, kā valstis ir sarindots šajos presas brīvības indeksos, un tur ir 180 valsts, un Latvija ir 22. vietā. Un mums ir daudz lietas, kas ir demokrātija, un kā vispār, kā vispār pie mums ir, ir, protams, ļoti daudz, ko kritizēt, ļoti, ļoti daudz, kur augt, bet... Mums ir apmienoša situācija, un no 180 valstīm būtu 22. manieks, tas ir pietiekam uzticams tāds rādītājs, lai mēs varētu tā kā šis ir iemesls, kāpēc tad, kad mēs esam neziņā par kaut kādiem pasaules procesiem, kāpēc ir vērts ieskatīties pie Latvijas, ko Latvijas žurnālisti jau par to saka. Jo, diemžēl, pielika tāds informācijas apjoms, kuras autori nav zināmi, vai arī tiem nav redakcionālās un ētikas, redakcionālās atbildības un ētikas kodeks. Un tas, manieks, ir ārkārtīgi būtiski to saprast un mācīties atšķirt, jo ir milzīga atšķirība, lai, piemēram, cilvēks, kuram ir attiecīgā izglīti, vai kurš, piemēram, žurnālists, viņš ir iedzinājis kaut kā tematā, un tad viņš ir uztaisījis par to sižētu, un pēc tam redakcija vēl to ir gājusi caur, vai tur nav kaut kāds kļūdes, vai arī vienkārši ir kāds parasti cilvēks ierakstījis Facebookā rakstu, un pēc tam vēl klāt pieredz savus secinājumus par kaut kādām konkrētiem piemēriem. Tā ir tāda liela atšķirība, un tāpēc, man liekas, arī viena no tādām kvalitatīvas žurnālistikas tendencijām ir atzīt savus kļūdus. Tas nozīmē, ka mēs reizēm redzam, ka, piemēram, LSM vai žurnāls ir, ka viņi raksta tā, tad tajā konkrētajā rakstā es kļūdījos. Tas ir ļoti svarīgi, tas arī piedod šo te uzticamību, jo mums bija mēdīpratības konferences, un tur bija piemērs no Dānijas, un Dānijā, piemēram, sabiedriskajā mēdījā, ja viņi kļūdās, tad viņi par šo kļūdu ziņo auditorijā ik pa stundas tieši tāpēc, ka tas ir tāds drošības un uzticamības garants, ka mēs arī atzīstam, jo mēs vienkārši cilvēcīgi kļūdamies. Jo atspēkot nepaties ziņas, ir sarežģīts un laika ietilpīgs process. Piemēram, ierakstu mikroblogošanas vietu nē Twitter, kuri satur nepaties informācija, izplatās ir sešas reizes lielāk ātrumi nekā paties informācija iekļaujošu tvītu. Viltu ziņājumi par 70% lielāk iespēju tapt izplatītām vai saņemt pozitīvu vērtējumu nekā patiesajām ziņām. Un noteikti, Tagad ir jautājums, kas tiek pārbaudīts. Tiek pārbaudīti fakti, tātad visi šie cipari, šie likuma projekti, šie kaut kādi mērījumi, datumi, cilvēku skaits. Tās ir lietas, kas ir kā fakti, un kurš ir iespējams pārbaudīt. Tātad apgalbojumi un ļoti bieži 
tiek pievērst uzmanību arī secinājumiem, jo reizēm varbūt fakts ir pareizi, bet secinājums ir ļoti pārspīlēts vai ļoti dramatizēts, un tur tiek pieļauts man kaut kāds apzināts vai neapzināts loģikas kļūdes. Piemēram, mēs skatāmies no pretnieciskā žurnālistikas, tad piemērs par to, ka viedokļi netiek pārbaudīt, jo, kā mēs zinām, mēs esam demokrātiski valsts un katrs ir teikt, ko viņš ir krīgi pēc būtības, bet piemēram, ja kāds saka, ka Covid-19 ierobežojumi ir pārspīlēti, tas ir viedoklis, bet ja kāds saka, ka koronavīrus neeksistē, mēs, nu, tad pētnieciskā žurnālistikā pārbaudu atgalvojumu, ka vīrus neeksistē, tātad viņi pārbaudu kā faktu, ka vīrus neeksistē. Tātad atkal šie te piemēri šoreiz latviski, kad meita no Somijas bija redzējusi, kad YouTube redzēja video, kā Covid vakcīna nogalina visus bērnus, video klipā bija daudz mirušu bērnu, tas bija ļoti satraucoši. Pats esmu vakcinējusi un tā, kā esmu vēl dzīves, var izmantot savu veselo saprātu, lai nostrādot, ka tā nebija nepatiesa, ka tā bija nepatiesa informācija. Te arī no Latvijas, kad internetā jauniens bija izlasījis, ka ledāja izkusīs, un apkūdinās visu zemes lodi un domāja, ka tā ir patiesas informācija. Sacēlis panika skolā, sācis kravāt mugursomu izdzīvošanā un beigās tikai ar dabas zinības skolētāji izdevās un pārliecināt, ka pat jau ledā izkursīs, tas neradīs tādas kūdas un noteikti ne tagad. Tātad. Bet, ja mēs izrunājam, ko darīja tad, ja informācija ir par kādiem hobijiem, ko darīja tad, ja mēs saskramies ar informāciju, kas ir mums mulsinoša par notikumiem pasaulē, un ja mēs saskramies ar informāciju par kādu tev zinām, paziņu vai skolu biedru, tad, protams, protams, primāri ir pajautā cilvēkam, par kuru baumas ir izplatītas, vai tās ir pārties, un vienmēr, Tad jāiedomājās tās personas vietā, par kuru baumas ir izplatītas un censties nebūt vienaudzīgiem. Piemēram, šeit ir no jauniešu pieredzes sociālajos medijos, ar ko viņi ir saskāršies. Piemēram, mani draudzeni pievieno ar mani savu kontam. Man neredās nekādas aizdomas, bet izrādījās, ka tas ir vilts konts. To izveidoja kāds, kurš uzdevās par manu draudzeni un izlikās par viņu. Tas tika darīts, lai tikai paņirgātos par viņu, un viņai šajā kontā tika atālot kā neglīta. Tas nozīmē, ka kāds vienkārši bija izdomājis izlikties par kādu citu. Kā arī kāds draugs izplatīja baumas, ka vēlas ir mani kauties un ir mani piekāvis. Viņš par to atsūtīja ziņu arī man, un gal galvēs saprata, ka viņš melo, un tās bija nepatiesas baumas. Es sāku domāt, ka viņš ir slikts cilvēks. Un te es gribu nedaudz, nedaudz pieskarties vārdu brīvībā, bet nevis tā tādā juridiskā, bet vienkārši tādā auditorijas veidā, kad cilvēki reizēm līdz neziņā par to, ko īsti nozīmē tiesības uz vārdu brīvību. Un tas nenozīmē, ka neviens nedrīkst aizrādīt, ka, piemēram, ja tur ir kaut kāda nepieklaika izteicieni, kā arī nedrīkst, nu, cilvēki drīkst izslēgt no privātās WhatsApp grupas, ja kāds ir aizvainots to administrāciju, ka arī skolās un darba vietās var tikt pieņemt iekšējās kārtības noteikumi par uzvedību tās telpās un teritorijā, bet vārdu brīvība ir pa kaut ko citu. Tas sniedz iespēju izteikt kritisku viedoklu par pastāvošo situāciju, kas ir ļoti tāds demokrātijas pamatu pamats. Tā ir iespēja atvērt internetu pārūku un piekrūt te jebkurā internetu adresē. Tas arī mums Latvijā ir milzīgs, ka mēs tā varam. Pirmkārt, mums ir labs internets, un otrkārt, mums ir brīvu pieeja viņam tam. Tā arī ir iespēja šodien mums vispār tikties un vispār runāt par mēdīju pratības nozīmi un kā to uzlabot. Tātad, bet arī ļoti svarīgi, ka tavu vārdu brīvī beidzas brīdī, ka tu aizskat citu cilvēku tiesības, un to mums vajag atcerēties ļoti dažādos aspektos. Tātad, ko mēs daram, kad mēs esam sapratuši, ka tā informācija, mēs esam ar viņu sastapušies, un mēs viņu esam pārbaudījuši, un mēs esam atraduši metodus un palīgu līdzekļus, kā viņu pārbaudīt. Tad pirmais. Ja informācija izrādās patiesa, 
tad ņemiet to vērā un rīkojieties atbildoši saviem ieskatiem un, 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 un viss kārtībā. Bet, ja informācija izrādās nepatiesa, nekādā gadījumā nedalieties par šo informāciju tālāk un atkal nākal tas ir tas, ko es tiešām aicinu darīt sabiedrībai, kad, ja mums gadījumā saskarmies ar ziņām, uh, mēs izejam visam cauri, ka tas mums izraisa ļoti spēcīgas emocijas, varbūt mēs esam ļoti dusmīgi, varbūt mēs esam ļoti aizskaitināti, jo kā mēs zinām, piemēram, ir tādi klikšķu vākšanas virsraksti un klikšķu vākšanas biznesi, kas ir veidoti un būvēt uz to, uh, ka viņi rada saturu, uh, kurš izraisīs ļoti spēcīgas emocijas, kurš neatvaisa no savas virsrakstas, kurš iespējams vispār nav taisnība, bet tas tiek darīts tikai ar vienu mērķi, lai cilvēki tikt musināt un viņu uzklikšķināt. Un ja mēs esam to visu pamanījuši, ja mēs esam pamanījuši, ka mēs esam ļoti satrakojušies, bet mēs to rakstu esam nu labi atvēruši, bet mēs esam sapratuši, ka nu, te jau varbūt nav viens pat fakts, vai arī esam salīdzinājuši, kas ko, kaut kur citur sāk, un izgājuši visam tam cauri, tad esam tā sabiedrība daļa, kur neizdalās tālāk ar informāciju, ja mēs saprotam, un esam pamanījuši, un ja viņa nav uh, patiesa. Kā arī, protams, ja informācija izrādās nepatiesa, ziņo par šo ieraku sociālo tīku administrācijai, arī citi lietotāji neuzčertos uz šo nepatieso informāciju, kā no rītas stāstīja par pētījumu, tikai, piemēram, jaunieši vidū 9 no 10 jauniešiem neizmanto šīs tam iespējas, tāpēc es aicinātu, ka, ja nu gadījumā jūs saskaties ar informāciju sociālos medijos, tad nospiedzot tos trīs punktiņus augšajā labajā stūrī, gan Facebookā, gan TikTokā, gan Instagramā jūs varat ziņot par to, ka tas ir neatbilstoši saturs, vai nu tā ir naida runa, vai nu tā ir nepatiesa informācija. Un to es arī aicinātu darīt, ka mēs tā kā, ka mēs redzam, mēs uzspiežam un pasakam, ka kaut kas nav kārtībā. Tātad, jā, mums tā drošā internetā ir izveidoti ieteikumi a, par to, kā pārbaudīt informāciju internetā. To jūs droši varat arī saicināt apskatīties, kā arī mums ir a, a, mājas labi, kur, ja nu gadījumā ir kaut kas notiek, nepilngadīgām uh, personām tieši, jo internet drošības jautājumos jūs droši varat vērsties pie mums, uh, un arī mums ir jaunieši padomi, kuriem mēs ik pa laikam prasam, vai piemēram šī vai tā kampaņa ir saprotam, un ja jūs gadījumā gribat arī būt viens no uh, jauniešu padomu dalībniekiem, tad arī droši varat rakstīt uz jā, droši internets. Bet tagad uh, skatos, ka uh, paldies par uzmanību, es pateicu, man liekas visu, ko es gribēju pateikt, Es ļoti ceru, ka tas jums noderēs. Paldies, Lāls. Kuru tu dari? Es pieņem, ka tu daudz braukā arī. Es neidzirdu. Jā, paldies, Anita, par, par tavu prezentāciju un par tavu darbu. Un, uh, tiešām, droši vien braudz braukājot apkārt pa Latviju, pa skolām, tiekoties ar jauniešiem uh, un visu šo stāstot, mācot, rādot, Īsi, kāda ir tā jauniešu reakcija viņiem? Ir tas wow klikšķis, ka jā, mēs to nezinājām? Nu, zini kā, ziniet kā, ir tā, ka um, neskatoties uz to, ka mums Latvijā ir ļoti labs internets, mums ir jāņem vērā, ka, uh, piemēram, tās prasmas ir ļoti, ļoti atšķirīgas. Uh, un ir jaunieši, kuriem tas ir tā kā prums, ka mēs zinām un, un viss ir kārtībā. Bet, protams, ir jaunieši, kuri jā, kuri, kuri ir aizgā, izrast, redzējuši kaut ko tiktokā ilgi par to domājuši, domājot, ka tā ir taisnība, un nav pat meklējuši kaut kādu uh, papildus resursu, kā to pārbaudīt. Tāpēc šīs atšķirības ir ļoti dažādas uh, starp jauniešiem. Bet vispār, uh, man liekas, ka ar jauniešiem uh, ļoti daudz, kas ir arī kārtībā, jo viņi daudz labāk funkcionē šajos uh, sociālajos mēdījos. Un reizēm var viņi pamācīt kādu uh, savu vecāku vai vecvecāku arī kā uh, tik galā ar visām dezinformācijas lietām. Anit, liels tev paldies par šo meisteri klasi. Mēs uh, jauniešu mēdīju konferencē, kuru var vērot gan Facebookā, gan LSM-ā, gan TV netā, gan YouTube-ā, gan Facebookā, gan visur citur. Mēs turpinām ar nākamo mūsu darbnīcu un uh, Niklāvi, jūs jau pirms brīža dzirdējāt mūsu paneļu diskusijā. Niklāvs Vētra, radošais producents uh, no Creators 22. 
nāk jau šeit mūsu studijā un ir gatavs stāstīt par to, kā entuziasms, kā nepazaudēt sevi, cīnoties par vietu zem saules. Bet pirms tam mēs uztaisam mazu, mazu pārtraukumiņu. Jā, burtiski vienu, divas minūtes un mazs pārtraukums un tad jau Niklaus būs studijā. Mūsu nākamā, mūsu nākamā darbnīca saucas, kā nepazaudēt sevi, cīņoties par vietu zem saules, un tu tiek, tik tiešām par vietu zem saules ir jācīnās, ir sevišķi, ja tu cīnies par uzmanību, cīnies sociālajos mēdījos, cīnies jebkurā citā mēdīja platformā, kur satura ir daudz, skatītāju ir tik, cik ir, un laiks viņu dzīvēs arī ir tik, cik ir. Nu, nevaram mēs pārkāvt 24, 7, nu nekādīgi. Par to visu, kādi ir šie te apstākļi un kā nepazaudēt šajā visā procesā, radošajā procesā sevi, Niklaus Vētra, Creators 22. Lūdzu! Sveiki, sveiki, labdien, sveiki, labdien. Nu ko, jā, es esmu pirmām kādā. Aiziet, jā, 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 sveiki visiem, sveiki visiem, kas un kā. Jā, man prezentācija tas nosaukums tāds ir, kā nepazaudēt sevi cīņā par vietu zemes saules, bet tas, ko es vairāk te vēlos pastāstīt, ir pirmām kārtām vispār, kā es uzsāku savu karjeru, kas salīdzinoši, nu, pagaidām vēl ir īsas, es ceru, ka viņa būs gara vēl un ar visādiem notikumiem bagāta. Bet tas, ko es stāstīšu un tas, ko es jums prezentēšu, nebūt, nebūs kaut kādas pareizās atbildes, kuras kuras atrisinās visas problēmas, jo tomēr mūsu katru situācijas ir citādākas. Bet jā, es pastāstīšu par savu pieredzi, pirmām kārtām par savām kļūdām un uzvarām un no mūsu komandas kļūdām un uzvarām un cerams, kā tas noderēs. Nedaudz jā, par Creators 22 pastāstīšu par komandu. Komanda ir tā, tad... Kā mēs vispār sākām? Tas esmu es, Niklaus Vētra, ir mūsu producents Mārtiņš Goldbergs, mūsu operātors Mārtiņš Kilnieks un mūsu vidēris un ģeniāls cilvēks Kārtis Dīdriksons. Mēs savu darbību kā tā uzsākām augstskolā sēžot un skatoties kaut kādas, nu, sēžot lekcijās, un mēs domājam, ka kāds ir labākais veids, kā sākt vispār savu darbību nozerē pirmām kārtām, un mēs izdomājam, ka labāk 
ir jāsāk paralēli studijām, kaut kas jau darīt tomēr nozerēdams, gaidīt un, 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 un tērēt lieku laiku. Līdz ar to mēs uzsākām savu kompāniju, kas, protams, sākās ar to, ka filmējām mazus atskatus, darījām visu, ko vien varējām, jo te, nu, ne teorētiski, bet reāli, tas skills, kas mums bija, bija ļoti maz, bet mēs viņu pakāpni skaudzējām un mācījāmies ar katru projektu. Um, un, 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 manuprāt, komandas darbs ir tīpaši šajā nozerē ļoti svarīgs un uh, viens no galvenajiem aspektiem vispār, uh, lai, uh, lai izdzīvot nozerē, jo esot, esot vienam uh, nozerē, kur ir diezgan, diezgan ātri un dinamiski, tas ir, tas ir ļoti smagi, uh, gan fiziski, gan mentāli. Uh, kā arī mēs kolēģis Mārtiņš Golbergs teica, katrā komandā noteikti ir jābūt vismaz vienam skateparka bērnam, uh, jo visur, ko mē, visiem, visām komandām un arī mūsu, mūsu pašiem tādi ir trīs. Um, skateparka bērni parasti iedot tev papildus kaut kādu nedaudz uh, trakulību un uh, nedaudz tādu reālās dzīves un ielu piemēru, um, kas uh, bieži vien šis skatu punkts nodien. Bet tas vairāk kā tāds uh, jogas gan es teiktu. Um, bet uh, aizliek tai zaus. Um, pastāstīšu nedaudz ko par savu mūsu pirmajiem projektiem, kā sāku, kā teicu, sākumā mēs uh, nodarbojamies ar maziem uh, atskatiem un, un mācījāmies vispār uh, arodu. Un, un pirmais projekts, par ko es vēlos pastāstīt, ir uh, ci- grupas citizēni mūzikas videoklips Karsts. Mēs jau bijām iepriekš ar viņiem sadarbojušies un, un, un šis bija uh, Jā, grupa mūs uzrunāja par to, ka mūsu budžets ir 300 eiro, kas ir diezgan smieklīga summa, un uh, mums vajag videoklipu grupai karsts, uh, ne uz grupai, bet uh, mūzikas klipam karsts. Um, līdz ar to, man liekas, ka mēs šo visu ideju un montāžu un visu izdarījām divās nedēļās, kas bija ļoti ārs laiks, manuprāt, vismaz tā, kā es to uzskatu tagad. Um, Un, un, un pieredze mums tiešām bija neliela, bija uh, daudz problēmas, kuras bija jārisina, bija maz laika, jo vienas dienas filmēšanas tikai. Un, un, un ja jūs zinat grupu citu zēnu, jūs zinat, ka viņi ir diezgan tāda kolerīta un uh, tāda smieklīga personāža. Līdz ar to arī uh, pats uzdevums bija izveidot mūzikas klipu, kas ir uh, nu, tik pat kolerīts, cik viņi. Um, Izveidojām mūzikas klipu, divās nedēļās dabojām visu gapa, gatavu, plus mīnas viss tika radīts uz entuziasmu. Un, uh, un kaut kā tā pirmā mācība, ko es iemācījos, bija ieraugot no šo komandu, komentāru, kā jau latviešiem kaut kāds randam huiņu video uh, ar labu māku aizmugrē. Un es šo uztveru par ļoti labu komplementu, jo uzdāmas mums bija uztaisīt randomu rēcīgu video klipu, bet maks aizmugrē nebija. Un jā, kādam skatītājam likās, ka aizmugrē maks. Tas ir ļoti labs rādītājs, un, 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 un to mēs arī um, ar prieku, ar to, ka uztajāmies tālāk. Um, tālāk mūsu vispār visa attīstība jau pakāpniski gāja tālāk un tālāk, ka mēs sākām uzņemt lielākus projektus, un tāds pirmais komandējums projekts bija taisīt uh, folk rock grupas uh, auļi uh, mūzikas klipa Austrijā. Uh, šī ir tā vieta, kur nāk iekšā ļoti svarīga lieta um, komandas darbs, un, 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 un pre-productions saucamais, jo, jo šajā procesā ir, ir ļoti daudz dienas, kas ir jāizpilda, un tajā brīdī, kad uzsāca darba bieži vien šajā industrijā, mēģina izsasties ar mēdījiem, um, ir bieži cilvēks kas vēlās darīt lietas vienu, jo es jau varu izdarīt pilnībā visu, uh, bet realitātē, ka tev ir jā, jāveic uh, lokācijas kautīgas ārzemēs, uh, uh, Nu, tu teorētu nebrauks lokācijas kaut ārzemēs, tu viņu taisīsi virtuāli, un tev būs zīmē kadrējums, kas ir multifunkcionāli. Un uh, tev ir jānodrošina visi tehniskie risinājumi, un vis, uh, visas ņemšanās un tehniskās ķībās, kas notiek uz vietas, ir diezgan uh, ievērojums. Uh, klipa uh, uzbūva pati kā par sevi bija diezgan, diezgan sarežģīta, jo viņa bija tāda ne, ļoti tradicionāla folk, folk, folk uzdevums, uh, kur bija grupa auļi un uh, Austrijas uh, jodelētājas Albīns uh, ar uh, mums bija pilns ar dejotājiem, uh, mums bija sanāk atbrauc no Latvijas dejotāja grupa uh, ar autobusu uz Austrijas Alpiem, kur mēs jau bijām divas dienas lokācijas skautojuši un pielāgojušies visu. Un mums bija trīs dienas, lai jūs filmētu videoklipu ar uh, ļoti daudz kadriem, ar uh, Ļoti daudz tehniskiem sarežījumiem. Mēs pirmo reizi testējām visādas tehnis, tehnikas, tehniskas lietas, ar kurām mēs sapņojām filmēt uh, iepriekš. Uh, līdz ar to uh, 
bija trīs dienas, kopā trīs dienās mēs gulējām desmit stundas, jo kamēr uh, viens no komandas skrūvēja tehniku nākamajā dienā, kāds ir izcināja problēmas ar uh, kadrējumiem vai skatījās, um, ko iesākt uh, nākamajā dienā. Uh, bija, tas bija diezgan intensīvi un, un, un tā ir viena no īpašībām, kas, un, kas arī šim tirgumu piemīt, ir jābūt gatavam uz to, ka tev būs jāiet uh, tā saucamais all in. Um, Mēdī tirgus ir diezgan sarežģīts un tas nav tāds uh, 9 to 5 uh, stilā, ka tu varēsi paņemt sešos, pateikt, mans laiks ir beidzies un uh, paldies, es vairs uh, nefunktie, ne, ne, nefunkcionēšu, tāpēc uh, to ir svarīgi apzināties, ka šis ir ļoti tāds uh, intensīvs uh, augšā un lejā uh, darbs, kurā uzsākt vispār savu darbību. Ja. Um, tālāk mēs... Uh, Nedaudz jau sapratām vairāk mūsu virzienu, ko mēs vēlamies, un ja mēs līdz šim filmējām mūzikas klipus, tad mēs uh, apzinājāmies, ka mums gribas kaut ko radīt, kaut ko vairāk ar pievienoto vērtību uh, savā ziņā, jo mūzikas klips nāk un iet, bet uh, māksla un, un piedalīšanās uh, tādos svarīgos notikumos Latvijas uh, mākslas un pat Eiropas mākslas scēnā, mums likās kā ideāla versija, kurā, jā, ideāla vieta, kur piedalīties un mēģināt uh, uzrežot uh, kaut kādu interesantu saturu. Um, pie šī jāsaka, jā, ka viens no svarīgs, svarīgs aspekts uh, esot, uh, esot uh, mēdījos ir vienmēr um, komunicēt un turēt uh, strādāt pēc iespējas vairāk cilvēkiem, kādi jums ir uh, iespējami nepalikt vienās savos grožos savā vienā komandā, jo kontakti, kuras jūs iegūstat, uh, noteikti nāks atpakaļ pie jums. Um, strādājot ar Ibok, arī šeit noderējumu, mans iepriekšējais teiktais, vienmēr vai kādu skateparku cilvēku uh, savā komandā, jo pirmajā brainstorm mītingā, kas mums bija ar Iboku, viņi mums pateica diezgan nu, galvenais aspekts, kāpēc viņi izvēlējās mūs bija. Nu, mums patīk, ka jūs skateot, un jūs tas skatapunkts tāds interesants ir uz lietām. Uh, līdz ar to mēs nonācām pirmo reizi pie mākslas projektu, kur mēs varējām izpausties citādāk. Um, Un, un, un jau vairāk no, noslīpēt to savu stilu, kas ir, um, un no kurienes mēs vairāk jau radām to atziņu, un kas arī at, at, attiecās uz to tēmu, kā nepazaudēt sevi, tīņā par vietu zem saules, ir, es nevaru būt tas, kas es neesmu. Mūsdienās un it īpaši 21. gads viņas ir ātriem mēdījiem, un kā mēs redzam, cik visi apkārt mums ir stilīgi, ir uh, viegli pazaudēt uh, savas iekšējās vērtības un uh, bieži vien liekas, ka, lai izdotos jebkurā industrijā sasniegt virsotnes, tev ir jā, jātēlo un jābūt kādam citam. Um, bet uh, kopā ar uh, Ribokas uh, mikropilsoņu projektu mēs un es un man komanda mēs sākām apzināties vairāk, ka mēs nevaram būt tie, kas mēs neesam. Uh, jāiečekojās ar sevi un ir svarīgi visā savā darba procesā ik pa laikam uh, Jā, apskatīties, ko tu esi izdarījis un uh, ko tu vēlies darīt tālāk, uzstādīt nākamos mērķus, uh, gan mazākus, gan lielākus. Galvenais, lai tev ir sajūta, ka tu uh, kusties tālāk ar uh, virzienā, kurā tu vēlies atrasties. Um, un runājot par virzienu, kurā, vēlme, kurā mēs vēlamies atrasties, um, kopā ar šo projektu mēs sapratām arī vairāk mūsu stilistiku un mirzienu kas ir viens no audio-vizuālo mēdīju, man liekas, nu, svarīgākajām lietām, ka tu esi operātors vai režisors vai, vai producents. Um, tev ir jāzina, kā, kāds ir tā, kāds, kāda ir tā tava stilistika. Tā kā mēs bijām jā, skateparka bērni, un mans viens no mīļākajiem video formātiem ir uh, standard, uh, standard Definition 4.3 izskats, kas ir... Uh, VX kameras formāts, ko izmanto skateboard industrijā, mēs sapratām, ka mēs vairāk vēlamies doties analogā, analogā virzienā, skatīties, ko mums dod dažādi vizuāli paņēmieni un vizuālā valoda, kur mēs izmantojam gan fotogrāfijas, gan dažādas kolāžas, gan miksējam modernāk kvalitātes vai no mūsdienu tehnoloģijas ar augstas kvalitātes kamerām, ar vec, vecākām kamerām kā viņi savā starpā veido stāstu un kur viņas ir nepieciešams izmantot, lai kaut kāds noteikti stāstu momentus papildināt un iedot viņas, jā, iedot viņiem papildus dziļumu. Tāpēc, jā, ir ļoti svarīgi savā procesā 
kā es jau iepriekš teicu, iečakoties ar sevi un ne tikai uzstādīt mērķi nākotnē, bet saprast, kas ir tavs stiprās puses, kas ir tavs vājās puses. Dažreiz tās arī neap, nebūs vienāds ar to, ka ar tavām interesēm, jo bieži vien ir tā, ka tev ir kāda vājā puse, bet tā ir tava interese un virziens, kurā tu vēlies mācīties. Un tā kā šis, šī visa industrija ir tiešām ļoti dinamiski, ir svarīgi vienmēr turpināt mācīties un šajā gadījumā mūsu mācīšanās virziens bija ap, apzināt un saprast, kā mēs varam izmantot, nu jau teikt tā vecākas tehnoloģijas sev par labu un savos, savos turpmākajos darbos. Um, jā, šis vairāk arī par to, ka, ko jau es pieminēju, ka nevajag skriet pakaļ citiem, jo bieži vien liekas tā, ka citi daudz darba labāk, bet ir tiešām jāskrien pakaļ sevi, jo šajā visā, visā juceklī, kas ir 21. gadsimts, bieži vien sanāk nedaudz pazaudēt savu to patieso ceļu, tāpēc ir ļoti svarīgi iečakoties ar sevi. Um, tālāk jau vairāk tieši par, vispār par tēmu un par jauniešiem radīt saturu, jo iepriekš šeit tas tie bija mūzikas, klīpi un mākslas projekti, tad šeit jau tie ir... Šeit jau sākam runāt par projektiem, kurus, kuros mēs esam ielikuši sirdi un dvēseli um, ar mērķi skatītājiem dot pēc iespējas uh, patīkamāku un uh, foršāku baudījumu. Uh, šis te uh, mūzes projekts uh, Domofons, kas ir uh, mūzikas platforma, radās, Sanāk, kad, kad sākās vispār visas Covid un lockdowns vai ne, kaut kādā 2020. gadā. Um, uh, kad mēs skatījāmies, ka gan latviešu mēdī, gan, gan arī ārdzemēs ir daudz dažādi interesanti mūzikas, uh, mūzikas platformas kā Colors vai NTS radio un ar viņiem dažādiem kont- kontenta uh, izveidēm, uh, gan Tiny Desk Sessions un tā kā visiem mums ir uh, ļoti uh, tuva šī te mūzikas tēma, un mēs ļoti selektīvi izvēlamies, ko mēs klausamies, un, un vienmēr dalamies viena, vien, ar, viens ar otru ar mūziku. Mums likās, ka šis ir beidzot tas moments, kad a, mums ir jāliek savu kāju arī šajā te mūzikas industrijā iekšā un jāizveido savu platformu, a, kas ir domofons. A, kā mēs a, vispār sākām visu šo, šo pasākumu no idejas līdz realizācijai un pirmajā filmēšanas dienā ir pagaida divas nedēļas. Um, viss sākās ar cilvēkiem, tiem pašiem citi. Mēs ar mūsu komandu izdomājam, ka hei, tā esam mūzikas, mūzikas uh, raidījumi vai koncerti ieraksts ar uh, pievienoto interviju aspektu. Un uh, pāris zvani uh, tajai pašai grupai citi zēni un beigās viss spēlīgi daudz lielāks un, un, un intensīvāks nekā mēs to bijām plānojuši. Jo mēs gribējām uztaisīt kaut kādu mazu vienkārši projektiņu bet kas beigās bija uh, trīs filmēšanas dienas Covid visos apstākļos ar dažādām, sanāk, pirmajā sezonā mums bija astoņas grupas, uh, bija, bija gan podkāsts, bija gan pēc koncerna intervijas, um, kas, uh, kas bija ļoti tāds interesants, uh, interesants process, jā, tieši tieši Covid laikos. Un, un ko es ar šo es vēlo, vēlos pateikt, ir svarīgi tajā ceļā, sevis nepazaudēšanas ceļā ir svarīgi miksēt un darboties starp komerciāliem produktiem, kas tev nes finansiālu ieguldījumu un finansiālu atbalstu vispār kā tā kompānijai, vai tu, jā, kas tev nes naudu un ir svarīgi paralēli attīstīt savas individuālās vēlmes un eksperimentēt un doties iekšā savos ceļos un neceļos un, un izmēģināt, um, izmēģināt dažādas aspektus. Pēc pirmās sezonas mēs saptām, ka mēs esam daudz kļūdījušies gan vizuālajā izskatā, gan, gan formātā, līdz ar to mēs nāsījām arī otro sezonu, kur mēs nu jau gājām gaišākā vizualitātē, mēs izdomājām, ka ir citādākas kameras tehnikas jāizmanto, ir ir uh, dzīvē, dzīvās uh, bungas, kur tu var palaist savu aplausu, lai tev nav tik, uh, nav tik vientuļi, jo kon- viss bija, tas bija moments, kad koncerti vienkārši neeksistēja. Līdz ar to tad mēs tur izklādējāmies ar to, ka tu nospēlē dziesmu, uzspēlē, es uzspēlē savu pats aplausu mašīnu, savā starpā visas grupas, parasti arī nedaudz par to iesmē, kas bija tāds interesants koncepts. Un, uh, um, kaut kādos momentos tas nevar būt nebija tik... Uh, 
nu, viņš ir, viņš ir feiga, bet, bet tas ir savā ziņā kaut kas jauns, un mēs esam priecīgi, ka mēs iztestējām kaut ko, kaut ko tām līdzīgu. Um, un tad tālāk mēs arī izdomājam, ka turpinājām sekot vienkārši, vai sirdsbalsī radīt produktus, kurus mēs vienkārši paši vēlamies patērēt un klausīties. Uh, mēs uztaisījām arī DJ setu, domofonu, kas ir domofonu steips, uh, kur jā, vienkārši mēs vēlamies paklausīties mūziku un, 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 un ar pilnu nebaidījāmies darīt un uh, pāris dienu laikā uzorganizējām, uztaisījām setu, dabojām tehniku un, un, un zvanījāmies apkārt, kas mums var palīdzēt, lai radītu kaut kādu interesantu saturu uh, gan sev, gan citiem uh, jauniešiem un ne tikai. Uh, līdz ar to ir svarīgi, jā, lai tu radi un um, savā darbā atspoguļot to, kas tev paša, ko tu pats vēlies redzēt un uh, kas, tev, uh, kas tev patīk un, un nav svarīgi, ka, ka tu saskaries ar kaut kādām negācijām ceļ, ceļ, šajā, šajā posmā. Jo, protams, ne viss, ko tu taisīsi, būs uh, patiks visiem. Um, ne, tu saņēms komentārus, uh, kas, tas, kas, kas tas par mēslu vai, vai, vai tam līdzīgi, bet um, atceries, ka primāri um, tev pašam ir jālapojies ar to, ko tu esi darījis, un nevienam nevajadzētu laust uh, šo te uzskatu. Um, un tad tālāk arī skatījāties mūsu diskusijas paneli divos, kur mēs nedaudz pieskārāmies arī šajai tema tikai, kas ir um, radošās industrijas pārstāvjiem, um, sākot sadarbību ar televīziju, uh, bieži vien ir diezgan grūts, uh, grūts ceļš priekšā, jo televīzija ir vienādības zīme ar birokrātiju un, um, un uh, kreatīvās uh, galvas bieži vien uh, diezgan, pret, nu, diezgan daudzās pret uh, birokrātijas galvām un pret cilvēkiem, kas balstās uh, visos savos pieņēmumus uz datiem. Um, līdz ar to uh, pirmais projekts, par ko es vēlos pastāstīt, ir uh, Virtu bez kāpost, kas ir um, Latvijas televīzijas 16 plus raidījums uh, jauniešiem, kur mūsu jaunā televīzijas seja Nancy garkā ņem rokā nāžas un, un uh, aicina pie sevis daudz uh, dažādas pazīstamākas un nepazīstamākas cilvēkus um, pagatavot interesants receptus jauniešiem, kas ir uh, budžetā līdz 10 eiro. Attiecīgi mūsu mērķa auditorija, mēs, mēs domājam, ka jā, ir uh, tradicionālajā mērķā ir ļoti daudz dažādu TV raidījumu, kur ir uh, mērķā vak- vakariņš četratā un tur kur ir tā sabiedrībai savā savā ziņā nesasniedzam. Pārsvarā tur tiek atrādītas dārgas receptes vai, vai ko tik nevar darīt. Bet, kas ir realitātē ikdienā, es nezinu, man prieks, kurš ikdienā ēda katru dienu steikus un, un skaistas, skaistas ēdienas, bet, bet kā studentam, kā jaunietim, kuram vēl tas naudas maks varbūt nav tik biesis, Mēs redzējām iespējamību uztaisīt uh, televīzijas jā, raidījumu, kur uh, mēs uh, uh, fokusējāmies tieši uz šo nišu. Um, kas te ar bija interesanti ir sadarbība ar televīziju, ka televīzijai, televīzijai ir ļoti milzīgas birokrātijas, uh, uh, televīzijai ļoti liela birokrātija, un uh, šajā ziņā, ka mēs kā mazā, um, varētu teikt aģentūra, mēdīja kompānija ar, ar, ar pāris cilvēkiem devāmies iekšā šajā te milzīgajā ēkā, kur tev ir jāatskaitās entajiem cilvēkiem un, un televīzijā kā tā Latvijā visi ir pieraduši um, noteiktam, noteiktam formātam, noteiktam izskatam un, un kaut kādā ziņā viņiem noteikti liekas, ka viņu gājiens ir pareizais. Um, Un, un ka viņiem ir tā galvenā teikšana. Līdz ar to šeit bija tāds kaut kāds pirmās nesaskaņas, ar kurām mēs, saskā... nesaskaņas, ar kurām mēs saskārāmies, ka um, kāda ir tā cīņa noturēties, ir, ir jāpastāv par savu ideju, un, ir, un tavām idejām ir jābūt argumentētām, un tāpat, ja kāds uh, kol... televīzija šajā gadījumā vai kāda cita kompānija stāsts tev par to, ka, um, ka tava ideja šis te nedara, 
tad vienmēr ir jāvaicā pēc argumentiem, un ja tev spēja argumentēt, tad tev ir nedaudz jāpārdomā savu ideju, un tāpat arī tev pašam bieži vien ir jāspēja argumentēt, kāpēc šī ideja strādās, un kam jābūt nedaudz patiesākam par to, ka mums vajag šādi, jo tas būs kruti, tas modernajā pasaulē, diemžēl, nestrādā un to var darīt savos individuālajos projektos. Televīzija arī ļoti, man liekas, izteikti ir bēl no jaunā un nezināmā. Lai gan šajā gadījumā mums ar Latvijas televīziju mums veidojās ļoti labu sadarbību, viņi turpinās aizvien. Cīņa par dažādu formātu uzstādījumiem un kā tos labāk pasniegt ir nebeidzama, lai gan es pieņem, mēs strādājam gan ar virtuvis kāpos, gan ar projektu, ko es stāstīšu nākamo. Kaut kā šī birokrātijas cīņa diži nesamezinās pakāpnisku uzticības līmenes aug, bet ir jābūt gatavam šajā industrijā cīnīties par savu un brīžiem arī piekāpties piekāpties brīžiem arī piekāpties tieši tā. Ir jauna kontenta radīšanā viena lieta, kas ir jā, 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 par ko ir jādomā, ir risks un eksperimenti. Ir viegli radīt kontentu, kas jau ir bijis vai pēc vienas un tās pašas, pēc vienu tās pašas scenārija vai uzradot daudz dažādas seriālas, raidījumas un ko tik vēl nē. Bet ir svarīgi riskēt un eksperimentēt ar savu darbu, kur arī nāk tāds no mārketinga puses, tāds Coca-Cola modēls, kas ir 70, 20, 10, kur 70% no tavu darba ir zama riska, naudas nesēja, kā saka, 20% ir inotatīvas idejas un 10% ir liels, ir liels risks, kur tu vainu vari pazaudēt šajā gadījumā naudu vai arī vai arī projekti, vai arī tas ir kaut kas tāds, kas izsitīsies tirgu diezgan intensīvi. Un šis arī kaut kas tāds, par ko es, kas, man liekas, ir interesants modelis, ko pielietot arī savā ikdienas darbā, tīpaši radošajā nozarē, jo šādi izmantoja tos 10% no savu darba ar lielu risku projektiem, Gadīsies apdedzināties, bet tajā pašā brīdī gadīsies arī pērlis, kuras tavu kopējo izskatu un tavu reputāciju paaugstinās un vienā brīdī jau nonāksim pie situācijas, kad cilvēki vēlēsies tavu darbu un tā vidēja nevis tavu tikai realizāciju. Un, protams, ir papīra pret cilvēcību, kas arī nav jābaidās no viens puses arī pret birokrātiju, jo jo tā mūsu pasaule ir diezgan interesanti uzbūvēta, un lai gan papīriski ir tiešām ļoti gari procesi, lai noslēgtu līgumu ar tādām kompānijām un korporācijām, kā pieņemsim televīziju vai kādām citām, bet jāsprot, ka otrā pusē ir tie paši cilvēki, kur arī vēlās, lai produkts ir izdevies, kur nevēlās, es uzskatu, ka neviens īsti man nevēlās nekad apčakarēt, un ir jānāk pretī vienam otram, un tāpat arī televīzija šajā gadījumā mums ir ļoti daudz nācis pretī ar tieši savu darbību. Šeit arī man tāds neliela atkāp par to, kas ir labs darbinieks, vai ne, un kā arī kas ir svarīgi varbūt jaunajiem cilvēkiem un jaunajiem iesācējiem, iespējams kādam citam arī noderēs savā šobrīdējā karjerā, ka es neatceros, kas to ir teicis, man nesen šo te stāstīju, bet tu esi labs darbinieks, ja tu iekļaujies termiņos, kas ir svarīgi, tīpaši radošajā industrijā, kad tiešām tie termiņi ir ātri un skrejoši. Tu esi labs darbinieks, ja tu esi pildi savu darbu konsekventi kvalitatīvi, ik pa laikam runājot arī par lielu risku darbiem, tu saņem Nu, tu uztaisi kaut kādu ekskluzīvu pērlu, teiksim tā vai ne, un kaut kas, kas ir tiešām ļoti kvalitīvi, un trešā lieta, kas ir svarīga, ir komunikācija. Jo, ja tu esi labi, ja tu esi ar tevi ir patīkama un viegli komunicēt, un visa komunikācija ir ērta un forša, tad tas ir vienkārši tu esi perfekts darbinieks vai padotais vai nu kā, nu kuram tas notiek. Bet, kas ir šajos visos lielajos projektos, ir jāatcerās, ka 
Arī, ja tev ir tikai divas no šīm te, uh, lietām, tu tāpat esi ļoti vērtīgs, uh, vērtīgs um, šim projektam, jo, ja tev ir laba komunikācija un ļoti, un ļoti laba kvalitāte, tad arī ar termiņiem nāks cilvēku pretī. Ja tev ir izpildi visu laiku termiņos un uh, tu dara visu kvalitīvi, tad tavai komunikācijai bieži vien nav jābūt tajā augstākajai galvenais, lai darbs ir izpildīts. Un tāpat, ja tev ir visi pildi termiņos un tev komunikācija ir brīnišķīga, bet kāds projekts pēkšņi nav izdevies tik labi, kā tu vēlējies, tad cilvēkiem tāpat gribēsies ar tevi strādāt visdrīzāk. Um, un šeit tāda lieta, kas ir mums visiem individuāli arī un ceļā, ceļā uz kaut kādu savu, savu, savu patiesības meklējumu industrijā, ir ego. Kas, Gan lielās kompānijās, gan arī uh, mazākās komandās un arī savā komandā Creators 22 mēs esam sastapušies ar to, ka um, ego ir tas, kas ir vislielākais šķērslis un kas tev neļauj uh, sasniegt savu pilno potenciālu. Uh, ko es domāju ar ego? Tas ir arī tas pats, uh, par ko mēs runājām iepriekš, uh, vai nu, par ko es runāju iepriekš, uh, uh, ka Bieži vien mēs sekojam kaut kādiem trendiem un mēs tā kā internetā mēs bieži redzam cilvēks, kam izdodās viss un, un kas pārsvarā jau, kas liek griezties pasaulē ar naudu, kur ir, um, kur ir, kur, kur ir vienkārši ļoti labi, ļoti labi darbojās industrijā. Mēs sākam vairāk mēģināt līdzināties viņiem un aizmirstam par sevi, bet tas ego iznībā tev melo, jo Vienā brīdī ir ļoti liela iespēja, un es pēc savas pieredzes var teikt, ka tā diezgan ir, ka tajā brīdī, kad seko intensīvi kaut kādiem um, labās prakses piemēriem un, un kas strādā citiem, tu ļoti atver pazaudēt to sevi un primāri savu vēlmi darīt un atrasties industrijā vienā, kurā tu atrodies, vai tā radošā industrija vai, vai tu strādā pie Excel, bet tajā brīdī, kad tu sāc tēlot kaut ko, kas tu neesi, tā var pazaudēt tā ātri vispār savu motivāciju darboties. Um, un un, un, un uh, līdz ar to tāda atkāpa, ko es iesaku jums visiem arī apskatīt, ir šāda grāmata New Earth, uh, kur uh, Tolle raksta par ego, un jums tas, tas ir noderīgs visiem cilvēkiem 100% un uh, palīdzēs arī savā ceļā, kā nepazaudēt sevi, cīnoties par vietu. Uh, industrijā uh, šī grāmata atļaus vairāk saprast gan sevi, gan savu motivāciju, gan tos citus cilvēkus, kur bieži vien sanāk, ir tiešām uh, cilvēki, ar kuriem ir ļoti grūti sastrādāties. Um, uh, tālāk, uh, arī, kas ir svarīgi, īpaši jaunajiem, ja, jaunajiem cilvēkiem, jaunajiem censoņiem uh, industrijā, ir, ka nevienmēr tas ir uh, it's not about the craft, it's about the mindset. Uh, nevienmēr ir svarīgi, ka tev ir tehnoloģijiem, ka tu visi izpildi vislabākajās veido, vislabākajā izpildījumā, bet uh, tavs mindsets un tava atdevi ir viena no svarīgākajām lietām, jo visu, visu var iemācīties, bet labu atdevi un, un, un respektu pret darbu un respektu pret cik tiem cilvēkiem uh, novērtē daudz augstāk nekā tev, tev, tev profesionālo darbību. Uh, un kā pēdējais, uh, pēdējais uh, piemērs no kaut kādas jā, tās manas karjeras virzības ir um, Mūsu pēdējais projekts, kas ir seriāls ierāmēs Latvijas televīzijai, kur, kur jā, šis bija ļoti smags projekts, un, 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 un šis bija tiešām kaut, kaut kas tāds, kur bija ļoti viegli pazaudēties un ļoti viegli pazaudēt interesi, man liekas, par, par vispār savu, dar, par savu darbu darīšanu, jo mēs uzražojām, piedalījāmies konkursā Latvijas televīzijai, uh, kurā, uh, nu, faktis, seriāla tapšana notika, viņiem vajadzēja notikt seši mēnešu laikā, bet viņš pārcēlās par pusotru gadu, un, uh, un šis bija kaut kāds viens no tiem darbiem, kas bija, nu, vairāk svarīgs nevis naudas izteiksmē, bet uh, tieši uh, pieredzes, un, 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 un ir bie, katram individuāli ir jāizvērtē, kurš darbs ir vērtīgs, lai tas būtu... Uh, par kur ir jāmaksā un par kur, kurš ir vērtīgs, kur tavs laiks ir vērtīgs, lai uh, izpildītu uh, ideju. Um, jā, tad ir jāsvērtē, ka tavs laiks ir vērtīgs, nav cistēks, un kad idejas izveidē. Um, no šī viss procesa uh, manas kaut kādas atziņas ir, kā um, 
es visā savā karjā noteikti tas pieļāvs ļoti daudz kļūdas un lielākā daļa, no ko es, ko, ko es esmu iemācījies, ir tiešām ar visu, ko es stāstu, es darīju pretēji, uh, savā ziņā varētu teikt. Un, uh, manuprāt, ir ļoti svarīgi, lai, lai nepazaudētu sevi un lai tev turpinātos tā dzirgstelē un, un vēlme darboties industrijā uh, vienā, kurā tu atrodies, ir uh, spēlēt ar savām stiprajām pusēm, uh, izveidot komandu, tev nav jābūt uh, kurpēji visu, visām pēdām, tev ir jābūt tikai tev ir jābūt savā nišā un tev ir jāpilda savas darbs uh, uzmanīgi un labi. Un šeit ļoti labi nāk jā, komandas darbs kopā, kur, ja tu atrodi forši cilvēks, ar ko tev patīk strādāt, ka viens var mūsu gadījumā fokusēties par kameras departmentu, viens var fokusēties par režiju, uzturēties par tām lietām. Un, um, un arī, kad tev rodās vairāk pieredze uz laukumu, tad es saprotu, ka um, jā, katram ir jāspēlē savas stiprās puses un, 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 un arī jāzina kaut kādu hierarhiju. Um, person, personīgi un gan jauniem uzņēmējiem, gan visiem, vienmēr ir svarīgs biznesa plāns un personīgiem mazie un lielie mērķi, kurus uzstādīt. Um, ir svarīgi arī tiešām uzstādīt mazus mērķus, nevis tikai to, ka es vēlos nokļūt Hollywoodā, un tas ir milzīgs mērķis, ko ļoti viegli ir pazaudēt. Bet tajā brīdī, kad šo lielo mērķi sadala par mazākiem, es vēlos apgūt tur jaunu tehniku šeit, vai es vēlos uzzināt kaut ko vairāk par uh, vizuālo valodu. Um, to ir daudz vienkāršāk uzsākt, to ir daudz vienkāršāk paveikt un lēnām veidot to savu lielā mērķi um, piepildījumu kas arī tev pašam konstanti būs lielāk uh, sāprenta par to, kāpēc tu esi šeit, kāpēc tu darbojies un, uh, un, jā, un, un ko iesākt. Um, svarīgi arī ir tīpaši, es zinu, ka es piedzīvoju pārdegumu pēdējo faktiski visu savas karjeras laikā, jo es nezināju, kad ašķi ir darbu un atpūt, un tas ir ļoti svarīgi, lai nepazaudētu vispār savu interesi un, un, un savu, savu mērķi. Ir, uh, atšķirt darbu no atpūtes, lai gan kreatīviem meklēt jā, savu kaut kādu darba ritmu, lai gan kreatīvajā nozarē parasti sāk strādāt 247, bet ir svarīgi atpūsties un, un pavadīt savu brīvo laiku ar saviem hobijiem, ar citiem cilvēkiem, jaunām pieredzēm, iepazīties ar cilvēkiem, jo tas ir tas, kas veidos tev vairāk stāsts arī un vairāk kontekstu, ko tu varēsi izmantot tālāk savā karjerā. Um, Noteikti arī nevajag baidīties no izmaiņām tīpaši jaunā vecumā, jo, kad es sāku studēt risebā, man likās, ka es gribēšu montēt un sēdēt pie kameras un, un darboties līdz man, um, līdz es sapratu, ka īstenībā mans uh, bēlmas iet citur un lai gan es biju skatu pateicis uh, savai ģimenei bez maz vai es tagad būšu baigais montētājs, uh, uh, svarīgi ir turēt, jā, saprast, uh, Iečakoties ar sevi, skatīties, kas tev patiesībā interesē, ir ok, ja tev mainās intereses, ir svarīgi ar par tām komunicēt un uh, darīt visu, lai tu atrodies tajā vidē, kur tu vēlies atrasties. Um, jā, atbildība un hierarhija šis ir, kas ir svarīgs komandās, darboties, uh, darbojoties. Uh, tas, ir, tas ir vienkārši darba struktūra. Uh, sākumā liekas, ka kam viņi vispār nepieciešami, tīpaši kā jaunam tur videogrāfam, piemēram. Bet uh, darba struktūra un, un hierarhija palīdzēs daudz ātrāk sasniegt savus mērķus un apzināties, uh, kā tā lielā pasaule strādā. Un, 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 un tas tiešām respekts vienam pret otru ir ļoti svarīgs. Um, jā, nekad nebeidz mācīties vienmēr apgūst jaunas lietas, ja tev interesē, ja tu redzi kādas trendas vai kaut kādas um, kičīgas lietas onlainā. Um, vai vienalga tiešām, kas tevi interesē, um, dar to, meklē laiku, um, tu esi prioritāte numur viens uh, un, 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 un lai, lai viss būtu kārtībā. Un svarīgākais laikam ir tas, ka, lai ko tu dari, lepojies ar to, pat ja kaut kas neizdevās, uh, mācies no savām kļūdām, uh, jā, neslēpies esi lepas par to, ko tu dari. Uh, ne visiem tas vienmēr patīks, bet svarīgākais ir uh, dienas beigās uh, tu pats. Um, bet jā, man teikt, man īstenībā un pļāpāt par šīm tēmām mums var daudz un tādā īsā laika posmā iekļauties ir grūti, bet šis ir kaut kāds mans kopējais uh, atskats, ko es varbūt tas iemācījies uh, šajā te visā pasākumā, ko sauc par industriju. Um,
Man bija sajūta, ka es ne, nepārtraucu runāt, jo vienkārši pārāk daudz, ko es vēlos pateikt, un vispār pat nepaspēju pieskārties topikiem, ko es vēlējos pacelt. Tu vēlējies dalīties. Man ir, protams, miljonus, da, miljonus jautājumi par, par to formālo, neformālo izglītību, bet tagad dodot tādu iedvesmojošu stāstu nu, jauniešiem, jauniem mēdīju cilvēkiem, kas vēl tikai veidojās un aug. Uzreiz man tāds jautājums, cik tu pats esi šādas sarunas klausies vai iedvesmojies un meklējis, un cik tas ir nozīmīgs šajā procesā? Ā, nu vispār tas sarunas, un, un tas sarunas ir ļoti iet kopā no ar, ar mentālo veselību, vai ne, jo tas ir, tas ir tas primārais, man liekas, primārā nepieciešamība. Es esmu diezgan daudz, gan klausījies, gan piedalījies, un ļoti daudz man ir bijis sarunas tieši ar uh, cilvēkiem, kas ir bijuši vai nu... Um, vai nu līdzīgās situācijās vai ir paši bijuši radošajā industrijā un aizgājuši no tās prom. Um, sarunāties ar saviem draugiem, izteikt problēmas, skatīties, uh, apzināties savus kļūdes, izcelt viņas gaismā, vaicāt uh, par sav, saviem radītajiem video kritiskus uh, uh, feedback sesijas ar draugiem. Tiešām nevis, jo vienmēr jau parasti, ja kāds kaut ko uztais, vai ne, tas tā kā, vā, tu esi tāds malacis, baigi labi baig lab, uh, visu izdarī. Kas ir super, tas tev paceļ to arī ego un tu esi priecīgs, bet uh, realitātē, lai attīstītos un lai visu saprast, ir svarīgi uh, gan jā, daisīt šīs te diskusijas un kritiskākas vairāk sarunas uh, un noteikti neņem, neņem par pilnu un uh, neizties aizvainotam uh, par to visu. Bet, uh, Jā. Tā jau arī ir, kad no kļūdām, kļūdām mācās, no kritikas mācās, ja? tā atšķirības ar kritizēšanu un kritiku. Paldies, Niklāv! Mums jau daga nepacietībā un berzē rokas arī, arī Jēnots, viņš arī grib izstāstīt savu pieredzi par to, kā neizdekt visā šajā darbā, kurā brīdī entuziasmus ir forši, kurā brīdī tam vajadzētu tā kā, tā kā veikties. Paldies, Niklāv, ka tu dalījies ar savu stāstu. Mums neliels pārtraukums, kamēr, kamēr puiši sagatavosies visam, kas sekos. Tad, tad ieturām divas, trīs minūtītes un būtībā nekur tālu no ekrāna neaizējam. 35. sākam Artūrs Jenots būs. Baigi netik vis.
Nu, es ceru, ka visiem ir silti, visi ir salējuši siltas tējas ietinošos siltos pledos centrālā apkura ir uz pilnu jaudu un visiem viss ir vislabākajā kārtībā. Mūsu vakar programma turpinās un, un runa būs par entuziasmu, kas nav ilgtermiņa degviela, tā tad runa visticamāk ar tur būs par naudu, kurā brīdī tas naudas faktors, naudas jautājums ienāk iekšā tajā mindsetā, un kurā brīdī mēs saprotam, ka ir ne tikai jādara, bet arī ir jāpelna. Vai ne? Jā, nu, gan, gan, gan drīz precīzi. Tur nav tikai runa par naudu, tur būs runa vēl par dažiem elementiem, bet loģiski, ka nauda ir viens no šiem lielajiem fundamentālajiem elementiem manā stāstā. Labi, tad es dodu vārdu tev un izstāstu ne tikai par naudu un ne tikai par entuziasmu un degvielu, bet arī par citām lietām. Aiziet! Yes, neģināšu. Paldies! Tā, pagam, man ir jānošēro ekrāns, vai ne, vispirms. Tā, 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 es nošēroju šito. Šēr. Vai jūs man redzat? Vai jūs šito redzat? Redzam, redzam. Whatsappā redzu, ko tu raksti. Ā, ah, jā, jā rekur prezentāts. <laughs> ok, brīnišķīgi. Sveicināti labāk ar visi, kas šo te tiešraid skatās no brīnišķīgās Young Media Sharks konferences. Konferences jauniešiem un ne tikai jauniešiem, arī medijiem un mediju jomas pārstāvjiem. Mans vārds ir Artūrs Jenots un es domāju, pirms mēs sākam mums vajadzētu iepazīties, bet man ir viens tāds niķis. Es protu visādas lietas un visādas lietas man sanāk viegli, bet ir daudz vēl vairāk ir tāda lieta, kas man sanāk diezgan grūti. Vieno tām lietām, kas man ļoti grūti vedas, ir runāt pašam par sevi. Tāpēc, draugi mīļie, kaut kas man, tomēr man par sevi ir jāpastāst, bet lai man būtu vieglāk šodien, esmu sagatavojis maz video. Es ceru, ka skaņi būs, sakiet, ja nav. Play. Sveiki! Manis cauc Artūrs Jenots. Es piedzimu Limbažos 1994. gada 30. mājā. Īsi pēc... Skaņa, beidzās skaņa, pazūdās skaņa, pirms tam bija skaņa. Kāpēc tā? Sveik! <laughs> Manis sauc Artūrs Jenots. Es piedzimu Limbažos 1994. gada 30. mājā, īsi pēc brokstīm. Man ļoti patika multenes, spēlēties ar saldātiņiem un kucīšiem, skatīties filmus, kur cīnās ar sobeniem un ātras un bez šēlstības. Mācījos Limbažu trešajā vidusskolā. Skolas laikā spēlēja basketbolu, daudz rakstīšu pieks un mācījos tikai to, kas interesē. Pabeidzot skolu, tiku piedalīties jauniešu nometē Young Media Shucks. Tad iestājos Rīgas strādiņu universitātē uz multimēdīju komunikāciju. Pēc diviem mēnešiem un vairākiem neuzrakstītiem referātiem sapratu, ka nebūs. Un uzreiz pārgāju uz Rīsabas audiovizuālās mākslas novirzdienu. Pēc septiņiem mēnešiem tur sapratu, ka arī tas nebūs. Laikam izglītības iegūšana nav manas dzīves ceš. Es nodomāju. Mama teica, ka viss labi, bet gribēja zināt, ko es darīšu tālāk. Es nezināju, kā būs, bet zināju, ka kaut ko jau darīšu. Un es darī. Ar draugiem turpinājām vidusskolā iesākto projektu revolucināri. Iestājos improvizācijas teātrī, kurā nospēlēja aptuveni četrus gadus. Ar Ansi, Edavārdiem, Grebkeni un Ahu un strādājām pie Latvijas hipo bloga Tinta Zops. Filmēja videoklips dažādiem Latvijas reperiem, producēja studentu filmas, reklāmas un mūzikas klipus, rakstīja publikācijas delfiem par Latvijas hipo, sāku rakstīt pats savu rapu un izdevu savu pirmo albumu. Tad vienā brīdī tā visa bija par daudz un es izdeku. Loģisks risinājums apātījai un ciešams formas depresijai bija doties prom. Uz Spāniju, lai kopā ar draugu Edgar ar kājām no Francijas līdz pat Atlantijas okeānam šķērsot visu valsti Santiago ceļā. Par spīti apātījai un depresijai sāku krāt naudu ceļam darot visu, ko iespējams par naudu izdarīt un nopietni gatavoju sevi fiziski. Atbraucot atpakaļ no Spānijas, sāku strādāt ziedoņu muzejā par projektu vadītāju, muzejnieku, video operātoru un reizēm fotogrāfu. Pēc divu gadu pauzes izdevu vēl vienu albumu un kopš tā gada neesmu pārtraucis rakstīt un darboties muzikā. Pēc gada muzejā sapratu, ka jāiet savus ceļš un es kļūvu par jūtūberi un influenceri. 
Ar Edgaru kopā izveidojām projektu Karsts Karsts, kas līdz šim ir bijis Latvijas lielākais hip-hop medijs. Sapratu, ka mīlestība ir ok, un izveidoju podkāstu sarunas par mīlestību, lai par to parunātos ar citiem. Tad es apricējos ar pasaulē labāko sievieti. Kategorijā – pasaules labākās sievieti. Tad pasaulē uznāca COVID-19, nācās sēdēt mājās, kur spēlējos ar Photoshop, izveidoju dzīvo saruna šo bazars nūle, kopā ar internetu pasmējāmies par amorālus video un izdomāju, ka varētu kaut ko pamācīties. Vēl man ļoti garšo rūjienas šokolādes saldējums, patīku Monsters and Men, rūdeni brauc baltīt uz līmežiem, nevis siguldu, man patīk videospēles un es ļoti ceru, ka viņi nesačak, ka es 2021. gadā solītot cūkārkas mistēriju. Tas tad arī viss kopš 1994. gada līdz 2021. gada. Man ir savu mājaslab. Arturs Ienots, punkts LV. Kaut ko sapņo, kaut ko murbo vienlaicīgi. Tā. Es ceru, ka jūs dzirdējāt visu, kas bija jādzirt. Vai kāds man var atbildēt? Vai Kārlis ir tur? Es esmu Kārlis. šeit. Es esmu šeit. Dzirdējāt? Bija Dzirdējām. Okay? Ir ok. Brīnišķīgi. Ir ok, brīnišķīgi. Tas arī visu, ko man vajadzēja zināt. Uh, šo te video es gatavoju priekš uh, uh, skolas, ko es ne, nesen pabeidzu, Latvian Art Director School, kas ir uh, lielākā, droši vien visjēdzīgākā, man liekas arī vienīgā uh, reklāmista skola Latvijā, uh, kur, uh, kur, kur ir iespējams apgūt uh, visu, kas saistīts ar reklāmas industriju. Un tā kā man arī tad bija grūti par sevi kaut ko pastāstīt, tad es uztaisīju šādu te video. Tas video ir mazliet novacojis, nu par kaut kādu gadu, jo gada laika kā daudz, kas ir noticis, Mēram, projekts, kas, kas ir beidzies. Es biju vēl vienreiz Spānijā un izdarīju vēlreiz tieši to pašu. Tikai citādi. Um, un gan jau, ka vēl kaut kas, viss kaut kas ir. Man ir vēl viens albums iznācis. Un gan jau vēl kaut kas ir noticis gadu laikā. Garš, gads ir bijis patiešām garš. Lūk, um, ko vēl par to piebilst? Nu, laikam neko. Tas esmu es, Artūrs Ienots. Sveiki, labvakar. Ķersimies klāt šim visam, ko es šodien gribu jums pastāstīt, un tas ir par, par šo te, man tā tēma ir par entuziasmu un to, ka tā entuziasms nav ilgtermiņa degviela. Ar to domājot, ka viena ar entuziasmu nepietiek, lai veidot kaut kāds projektus ilgtermiņā. Nu, un projekts, kas man šo te iemāci, ir droši vien viens no lielākajiem līdz šim projektiem manā dzīvē. Karsts, karsts, kas ir, kā jau es minēju, līdz šim lielākais hip-hop medijs, kāds Latvijā ir bijis, kur es veidoju kopā ar nevienu citu, manu draugu, manu brāvu no citas mātes, Edgars Pudiņu jeb Idusu Abru. Uh, varbūt jūs viņu zinat no Ghetto Games brīvru un betliem. Lūk, karsts, karsts, un šis ir stāsts par karsts, karsts, un to, cik liels vai prāts tas viss bija. Tātad par karsts, karsts pašiem, pašiem pirmsākumiem. Uh, tā bija 2018. gada vasar, kad mēs ar Edgaru satikāmies, sapratām, ka kaut kas ir jāveido, kaut ko paralēli tajā brīdī jau darījām. Uh, dažādos projektos, gan mūzikā, gan uh, citā satura izveidošanā YouTube un, un rakstiskajos mēdījos. Un satikāmies, sapratām, ka kaut kas ir jātais. Uh, Stās cīsumā nonācām pie tā, ka mums ir jātais podkāsts par Latvijas hip-hop. Mums tā tēma ļoti interesē, ļoti, ļoti patīk un likās, ir loģiski, ka kaut kam tādam ir jābūt, jo uz to brīdi Latvijas hip-hopā nekā tāda īsti nebija. Nu, un tā nu mēs saņēmāmies, salikām savus galvas kopā, savus prasmes kopā lai kaut ko tādu izveidot, un izveidojām pilotu sezonu, četru, četru epizožu sezonu video formātā, mums palīdzēja vēl divi šārki, Ritvars Stankevičs un Artūrs Valdmans to visu filmēt, mēs intervējām, um, intervējām Latvijas hip-hop tā brīža aktuālo kaut kas izpildītājs, Un, ja godīgi, mēs tajā brīdī vispār nezinājām, ko mēs darām. Tā kā kaut ko jau mēs līdz tam brīdim bijām darījuši, un mums bija um, kaut kāds priekšzināšanas par to, ko mēs darām, jau bija, bet nu, tā lielos vilcienos nu, mēs ļoti improvizējām uz to. Mēs uztaisījām četras epizodes un sapratām, ka nebūs. <laughs> Tāpēc, ka tas viss prasīja nenormālo darbu, nenormālo atdevi, um, gan fiziskā ziņā, gan laika ziņā, Un mēs īsti neredzējām, kā, mēs, kā tas varētu būt mums izdevīgi. It kā cilvēki teica, ka ir baigi forši, bet mēs sapratām, ka, nu, ka tur vajag kaut kādu arī tam finansiālu pamatu, lai tas viss notiktu un tam līdzīgi. 
Mēs uz brīdi to pārtraucām. Tad vairākas mēnešas pēc šī te visa man zvanī Ilon Bičevski, es nezinu, vai jūs zināt, bet uh, viņi ir viena no vaininiekiem tam visam, kas šodien šeit notiek un ka jūs šo visu varat redzēt. Ilona man zvanī un, un teica, ka ir nepieciešams izveidot uh, raidījumu un vai mēs būtu ar mieru izveidot raidījumu par hip-hopu. Uh, mēs varētu veidot tā, tā kā gada atskatu par visu, kas 18. gadā noticis. Un tā kā tur uh, viens no iemesliem, kāpēc mēs piekritām, uh, bija nauda, jo Ilona teica, ka viņi mums var samaksāt un mums bija tāds, kāpēc nē, mums beidzot kāds var samaksāt un šī tēma mums patīk. Lūk, uh, Un uh, tur bija vēl visādi labi bonusi, bet uh, tā kā tur tu rādīji to raidījumu televīzijā un vēl viss kaut kas, um, uh, bet uh, tas uz doto brīdi nav tik būtiski. Mēs uztaisījām šo te raidījumu, dabūjām naudu un atkal pārtraucām tur tā kā darīt. Um, līdz mani uzrunāja viens, uh, viens draugs un teica, ka skarts, skarts bija baigi krutu štēli. Uh, baigi žēl, ka tas viss ir apstājies. Un tā nu es zvanīju Edgaram un teicu klausies. Mums, man liekas, kaut ko vajadzētu darīt. Un viņš man teica, jā, vajadzētu gan, man ar tā šķiet. Mēs nolēmām, darīsim, tikai darīsim loģiskāk, darīsim tā, lai mums nesāp, darīsim tā, lai mēs to varam fiziski izdarīt un mentāli izdarīt. Un mēs 19. gadu pavasarī sākām, atsākām veidot podkāstus. Šoreiz bez videoformāta, kas vienmēr ir liels čakars, nu vairāk vai mazāk. Uh, tas viss būtu tikai audio formātā, epizodes iznāks katru pirmdienu, uh, varam sataisīt pat vairākas epizodes uz priekšu un tā tālāk un tā tālāk. Un tā mēs sākām katru pirmdienu izdot uh, karsts karsts podkasta epizodes. Brīnišķīgs laiks, mēs maucām tā kā negudri, visu laiku darījām, darījām, tas skatītāji pūks krājās, auditorija krājās, uh, cilvēki vēl vairāk mūs sāk atbalstīt un... Uh, Līdz mēs nonācām brīdim, ka nu jau gandrīz jau bija gads apkārt, mēs katru pirmdienu bijām izdevuši pa epizodai un gads bija apkārt un mēs jūtāmies tā, tā ka nu uz kuriem tad viss šitas te iet, jo kaut kāds ieguldi bija mums finansiāls tam visam, tajā visā bija jāveic un mums bija grūti tā kā tam visam finanses atrast un, un tad mēs sapratām, ka tas viss ir jāpaceļ jaunā līmenī, lai mēs tam vieglāk varam piesaistīt finanses. Liekas, varbūt sākumā tīra ok plāns, bet pacelt kaut ko jaunā līmenī nozīmē ieguldīties krietni vairāk gan laika ziņā, iespējams arī finanšu ziņā un pavisam noteikti arī mentālās kapacitātes ziņā. Lūk, bet joprojām bez kaut kāda, bez kaut kāda tāda lielcerības starp, kur varētu parādīties tam visam finanses, kas varētu šo visu foršāk balstīt, un lai mums būtu spēka, spēks to vispār visu turpināt darīt. Nu, lūk, bet par spīti tam, 2020. gadā mēs sākām veidot jaunas formātus, pieņēmām šo te lielo izaicinājumu, un mūsu tajā pīķa laikā mēs veidojām četrus dažādas formātus. Viens bija karts karts podkasts, viens bija tāds īs īs veida saturs, saucās mana tinte, kur reper nāca stāstīt par saviem tetovējumiem. Vēl viens arī īsais formāts, kas bija karts karts jautājums, kur reper nāca atbildēt uz blic jautājumiem. Ātras jautājums, ātri atbildi ne tikai par hiphopu un viņu karjeru, bet tur no sērijas, ko tu šodien ēdi brokstīs, vai ko tev garšo ēst brokstīs un tam līdzīgi. Un pacēlām mazliet to podkastu spēli tādā bišķi citā līmenī un sākām veidot uh, intervijas, kur mūsu nemaz nav. Uh, tie ir tāpēc, ka mēs bijām uh, tā izpumpējušies piedeloties katrā podkastā, ka izdomājam, ok, izkāpjam mazliet ārā no, no visu šī te, neesam iekšā paši tai saturā, uh, un kameras priekšā vai, vai audio, uh, ka vienkārši, kur ir šis te mūziķis, šis te repers, un lūk, kur ir viņi stāsts, mūsu jautājumi un, un tam līdzīgi. Plus tam visam klāt nāca arī visu laiku blakus bija sociotīkli, uh, vēl izveidojām Facebook uh, forumu, nu, visu laiku bija kaut kas, ko darīt uh, šajā visā sakarā. Lūk, uh, daži ātrie jautājumi, uh, kurus jūs noteikti gribētu man uzdot, bet kurus es uzdošu pats sev. Cik daudz uh, laika mēs veltījām, uh, veidojot karsts karsts, teju katru dienu. Katra nedēļa bija vairāk vai mazāk saistīta ar karsts karsts. Jauna satura filmēšana, satura montāža, mums visam bija grafiks, pirmdienās iznāk tāds saturs, otrdienās tāds, trešdienās tāds un tā tālāk un tā tālāk. Un loģiski tas viss prasa laiku un to laiku to visu izveidot un reizēm arī nofilmēt. Tagad tas bija nedēļas garumā. 
ņemstiņš visu laiku un tā visu laiku tajā kāmju ritenī. Cik daudz cilvēku bija komandā? Veseli divi. Es un Abra. Vai mēs darījām visu paši? Jā, mēs darījām visu paši. Jenots uzņēmās visu, kas bija saistīts ar, ar filmēšanu, ar montāžu, ar vizuālo materiālu izstrādāšanu, paša projekta vadību, kamēr Abra uzņēmās arī daļēji projektu vadību, reperu tur sarunāšanu uz, uz epizodēm un saturu kopīrēt rakstīšanu un, 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 un vispār sagatavošanos, saturistas sagatavošanos intervijām, podkāstiem un tā tālāk un tā tālāk. Vai tas bija divu cilvēku darbs? Nē, tas nebija divu cilvēku darbs. Paldies par šo sāpīgo jautājumu. Tad cik jūs pelnījāt? Tātad, <laughs> mēs nepelnījām ne cik. Mums vienā brīdī bija Patreon platforma, kur Visi mūsu atbalstītāji par kaut kādām konkrētām naudas sumiņām varēja atbalstīt uh, visu to, ko mēs daram. Un, uh, un tur, protams, kaut kāda nauda nāca, bet visu to naudu, kas nāca, mēs ielikām uh, vai nu studijas īrē, vai kaut kādā veidā projektu attīstībā, bet paši savās kabatās mēs to nekādā veidā neielikām. Um, Bet kāpēc tad mēs turpinājām? Tāpēc, ka mums bija nenormāli milzīgs entuziasms šo te projektu turpināt un darīt. Mēs viņam ticējām, mēs ticējām paši sev, mēs ticējām, ka tam ir jēga, ka tas ir jēgpilns projekts, ka tas ir vajadzīgs un ka vienkārši ir jāmauc. Un ja mēs mauksim, tad, tad vienā brīdī arī tas finanses kaut, kaut kā sāks nākt. Tātad jūs bijāt, tas nav jautājums. Tā, tas jau ir apgalvojuma teikums, un es varu atbildēt jau tikai tā kā Forest Scams kādreiz teica. Stupid is a stupid does. Saprotiet paši, vai tas, vai tas ir labi, vai tas nav labi. Um, protams, ka mēs paralēli veidojot šo te visu, mums kaut kāds nosacītais biznes plāns, lai cik rēcīgi tas viss šajā kontekstā neskanētu, bija. Um, mēs, tātad, kā jau es minēju, mums bija Patreons, kur katram bija iespēja atbalstīt mūsu projektu, un uh, nebija tā, ka tās naudiņas tur nāca maz, bet tā visa naudiņa, kas tur nāca, viņa arī iz, izgāja projektu vajadzībām. Loģiski, ka, ka visu pārējo darbu starpā mēs meklējām sponsorus un sadarbības, un ar to mums veicās tā, ka mēs arī vairāk kas dabujām, bet... Uh, Mēs, lai, lai šīs te sadarbības tiem cilvēkiem interesētu, mums vajadzēja podkāstus, piemēram, taisīt uh, video formātā. Paši mēs pie kamerām nosēsties īsti nevarējām tehniski to čakarīgi izdarīt. Uh, gribējās, lai viss ir uh, droši, uh, tāpēc aicinājām, aicinājām uh, tur gan Ritvars Tankēviņš, gan Artūra Valdmanu, gan uh, Šibiku, kas ik pa brīdim varēja vienkārši atnākt pieskatīt kameras, lai viņas rakstās, lai tur baterija neiet caur un tā. Un, Un tiem džekiem mums vajadzēja kaut ko arī samaksāt. Tāpēc līdz ar to daļa sponsora naudas, kas mums nāca, um, to mēs iedavām daļu džekiem, daļu ieguldījām atpakaļ projektā, kas bija vai nu, vai nu tehnikas īra vai, vai studijas īra vai viena nav, kas nu tajā brīdī mums bija par izdevumiem. Uh, tas, ko mēs iemācījāmies sponsors meklējot, ka ir nenormāls čakars, ja mums katru pirmdienu iznāk viena epizode podkastam, un mums uz katru epizodu ir jāatrod sponsors. Izdevīgāk bija atrast uz vairākā, vairākām epizodēm vienu sponsoru. Diemžēl tas mums neizdevās, ne tāpēc, ka nav tādu cilvēku, kas to gribētu atbalstīt, bet es domāju, ka mums vienkārši nepietik kapacitātes atrast šādu cilvēku. Uh, mums pietrūka komanda, mums, mums komandā pietrūka kāds, kas to visu laiku tā kā darītu, iet un piedāvātu, jo mums bija tur sataisīts prezentācijas un piedāvājums, ko mēs varam piedāvāt, kā tas izskatītos ar visiem piemēriem un tam līdzīgi, bet vienkārši pietrūka kapacitātes, jo es to it kā varētu darīt, bet uh, kamēr, kamēr es montēju un domāju par nākamo filmēšanu, es to tā kā īsti izdarīt nevaru. Līdz ar to uh, šis te mums neizdevās, bet bija vairāki, kā tas latviski, pavedieni. Uh, uz, uz... Cik tad mēs nopelnījām? Nu, tā, ka mēs, uh, tā, ka mēs varētu teikt, ka mēs nopelnījām sev algu, uh, tā pat tiešām nebija. Bet nebija tā arī, ka mēs nenopelnījām neko. Uh, proti, mums tā naudiņa visu laiku nāca, un mēs visu laiku viņu guldījām iekšā, kā jau es minēju. Uh, 
un līdz ar to šobrīd mēs esam izsitušies, nu, viss, tas, ko mēs nopelnījām, īsāk sakot, ir uh, studija, kur es šobrīd sēžu. Mums ir sava telpa, kuru mēs esam izremontējuši, pielāgojuši, lai tev var notikt dažādi audio ieraksti, podkasti, kaut kāds filmēšanas un tam līdzīgi. Tā kā es domāju, ka tas ir milzīgs, milzīga alga, ko mēs esam saņēmuši, jo mums ir šobrīd pašiem sava radošā telpa, kur darboties pat pēc karsts, karsts beigām, bet tā, tādā standarta ikmēneša nav algas izteiksmē, mēs nenopelnījām neko, kā mēs pelnījām nav, lai izdzīvot, uh, kā nu kurš, abram bija koncerti, man bija dažādi pasākumi, ko vadīt, uh, visādas filmēšanas, viss kaut kas. Uh, Paralēli šim te pilnas slodzes darbam, ko sauc par karsts karsts. Uh, protams, ka mums uh, šeit ir daļa no tā, ko mums vajadzēja darīt pilnīgi citādi, ka mums vajadzēja rakstīt projektus, uh, vajadzēja to darīt, vajadzēja vairāk kaut ko dot Patreonā, vajadzēja kačā to Patreonu visu, vajadzēja šito darīt, šito darīt. Mēs to visu ļoti labi zinām bet uh, tik, cik cilvēkam ir, um, nu, mums ir kaut kāds ierobežots kapacitātes. Pat, ja mēs esam nenormāli močītāji, kaut kādam mēram ir jābūt draugi, kaut kādam mēram ir jābūt, un mēs to mēru bieži vien arī atradām. Un, protams, uh, no visu šī te izejot ārā, es uh, gūvu gan es, gan ābra, gūvām ļoti daudz atziņas. Pirmā atziņa, uh, ka arī ar tei neizsīkstoši entuziasmu vien nepietiek. Uh, ko mēs, es domāju, pēc šīs visas stāsti par karsts karsts, jūs arī jūtat, ka mm, kas tie ir par elementiem, kas tur pietrūk, un ka, lai arī cik tas entuziasms būtu liels, reizēm ar to ir par maz. Ilgtermiņam. Uh, vairāku cilvēku darbs nav divu cilvēku darbs. Uh, šo ir ļoti būtiski apzināties, vispār kaut ko veidojot un saprotot, kādas tad ir tās ambīcijas un, un, un cik tad mēs katrs varam ieguldīties un ņemot vērā arī to, ka kaut kas ir arī cilvēkam jēd. Uh, šo es noteikti stabili ņemu līdz, kā vien no svarīgākajiem atziņām turpmākajos projektos, kurus es uh, veidošu vai ņemšu dalību. Satur veidošanai ilgtermiņā, tāpat kā dažai labai Rīgas centra ielai, vajag piķi. Un kā jau Kārlis minēja, pirms, pirms es sāku šo te prezentāciju, tā ir nauda, ir būtisks, būtisks sastāvdaļ, lai kaut kas notiktu ilgtermiņā, lai kā dažiem no mums nepatiktu visu šī te naudas sistēma un tam, ka naudu vienmēr vajag, viņu vajag. Un tas ir jāpieņem kā fakts, un Ir pat, varbūt, jāiemīl šis te fakts, ka naudu vajag. Visām lietām, ko mēs daram, naudu vajag. Bezmaksas pusdienu nav. Un, un ir jādomā, kā to naudu dabūt. Un ir iespējas. Nav tā, ka viņu nevar dabūt. Tā kā jautājums ir, nu, cik, cik, cik mēs paši esam gatavi tā lietu un pārkāpt sev pāri, lai, lai šis te finanses dabūtu saviem projektiem. Katram hobijam ir potenciāls nemanām pārta par pilnas slodzes darbu. Um, šis sākās nosacīt kā hobijs, uh, šī vienkārši likās jēdzīga lieta, ko darīt, un ātri vien augotām ambīcijām un vēlmēm uh, izplest šo te projektu plašumā. Mēs attapāmies pie tā, ka tas ir pilnas slodzes darbs, par kuru normāli nemaksā. Un uh, šī tas sajūta, ka tu nedabū atpakaļ, uh, tik, cik tu esi ieguldījis. Ne tāpēc, ka cilvēki nedod, bet vienkārši tu neesi izdarījis visu, lai saņēmtu atpakaļ tik daudz, cik tu esi pelnījis. Um, tas bieži zina iekšā tādās lietās kā pārdekšana. Nu, mēs it kā mīlējām to lietu, ko mēs daram, bet reizēm bija tā, ka nu, šitas nenormāli krit uz nerviem. Um, un tam līdzīgi. Un tā nav forša, forša lieta, ka forša sajūta, ka pret lietu, kur tu mīli, tu pēkšņi sāc izjust tā, tā kā, kā riebumu un vēl uzdod jautājumus, kāda vēlna pēc tu vispār šito dari. Tā kā esam, es nezinu, vai es iesaku būt uzmanīgam ar šo, jo šis ir forši, ka hobijs var pārtapt uh, par, par, par pilnas slodas darbu, man liekas, ka tas ir visforšāk vienkārši jautājums, uh, ko, vai mēs dabūjam atpakaļ tik daudz, cik mums vajag, lai mēs to turpināt darīt ar mīlestību rūpēm un tā tālāk. Lūk, Tas tādā ļoti ātrā pārskrēnā pāri tam, kāds bija tas karsts, karsts posms, tie bija trīs gadi no, no tās pilotas sezonas sākuma līdz, līdz tam, ka mēs izaugām par nu, 
diezgan, diezgan nopietnu mēdī priekš divu cilvēku komandas. Es domāju, ka tas bija varbūt pat pārāk nopietni. Bet bez izaugām un bija forši, un, un es vakardien ierakstītu vītu, ka gatavojoties šeit prezentācijā, ja man būtu iespēja atgriezties pagātnē, kur mēs pieņēmām lēmumu veidot šo projektu vai nē, es noteikti piekristu vēlreiz. Par spīti tām, cik reizēm tas bija mokoši, cik reizēm sāpīgi nācās pārdekt, ka bija viens jaunais gads, kad pārdekt nācās jaunā gada, tā kā vakars, ka pārdekšana bija tāda, ka es nokritu gultā ar temperatūru, kamēr man vēl bija jāmontē karsts, karsts materiāls un jāizdot gada atskats. Un viss vienkārši dega, un tev tas ir jāizdara, un tu sēdi pie kompja ar, 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 ar 38 temperatūru un, un, un cīnies. Un tas jau bija pirms šī, te jūs jau paši zināt kāda laika, kad, kad strādāt vai iet ārā ar temperatūru bija pilnīgi ok. Un neviens par to nebēdājās tik daudz, cik ja paši jūtās labi, tad gāja. Lūk, bet man prezentācija vēl nav beigusies, draugi mīļie, jo... Fļu! Artūra Jēnota ilgtermiņa degvielas formula. Prezentē Artūrs Jēnots. Fļu! 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 Pirmā lieta – entuziasms. Darbā ielikt sirds dvēseli mīlstību un rūpes. Citādi, kāda jēga kaut ko darīt, ja to nemīlu. Piebildi, ja nu vienīgi par to maksā baigi daudz, un tad moška ir kaut kāda jēga to darīt. Uh, Sākot, ka entuziasms nav ilgtermiņa degvīla, tā ir, bet um, ar to domājot, ka vienkārši ar entuziasmu vien nepietiek, lai uh, kaut ko ilgtermiņā da, da, darītu, vajag uh, vēl dažas komponentes, bet entuziasms ir visa pamatā. Nu, tas būs tas dzinuls, uh, kas jūs dzīs, tās lietas darīt, tā mīlstība, rūpes, uh, vajadzība reizēm, kas jums liks kaut kādos projektos lekt iekšā. Nav sarīgi, pat vai tie ir mēdīja projekti, tas varbūt arī kaut kāds bizneses vai nezinu, matemātikas ieskaita, vai es nezinu, pilnīgi vienalga, kas entuziasmam ir uh, liel, liels svars. Fiu, fiu, fiu. Komanda. Cilvēku grupa, kurā apvienoti dažādu prasmju esošie vai topošie profesionāļi, kurus vieno viens mērķis un motivācija uz to virzīties. Ilgu laiku es domāju, ka mēs ar abur bijām ideālā komanda. Uh, bet ideālo komandu nosaka tas, kāds tad ir tas mērķis, uz ko jūs virzaties. Tad, kad mēs veidojām podcastu uh, reizi nedēļā um, un, 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 un gājām katru nedēļu, tik ir kaut kādiem reperiem, mēs bijām ideālu komandu. Jo, ko mums vajadzēja, tehnikums bija, ja nu tas samontēt visu var, abri noorganizēt intervijas un sagatavot jautājumus un izpētīt reperu dzīves līdz tam brīdim, var izdarīt, ko tur vairāk vajag. Problēmas sākās tad, kad nu, tā laika un darba roku sāk trūkt, vai sāk trūkt kaut kāds tas um, profesionāls vai topošais profesionāls, kas mūsos iekšā nav, nu, proti kāds, kas var dabūt naudu, jo mēs ar abru gājām, protams, to darīt, bet nu, nav tā, ka tā ir lieta, ko mēs esam dzimuši darīt. Mēs droši vien lielu kļūdu no mums bija neatrast kādu, kas to varētu darīt. Nav tā, ka mēs, nebija tā, ka mēs nemēģinājām to darīt, bet tāds cilvēks, kas palīdzētu šo te lietu kārtot, ir būt bija svētīgs komandai. Bet, diemžēl, mēs to neizdarījām. Nu, vai par laimi. Ir, ir tā, kā ir, un es domāju, ka mēs rābri, jebkurā gadījumā esam laimīgi par visu to, kā tas izvērtās. Nauda. Nav bezmaksas pusdien. Nav bezmaksas komunālo rēķinu. Nav bezmaksas ziemas zābaku. Kā jau es minēju iepriekš, šis ir būtisks faktors, un par finansēm ir jādomā, un veidojot kaut kādas projektus, tas ir kaut kas, ko turēt pakausī kā vienu no svarīgām komponentēm šajā te ilgtermiņa degvielas formulā, kur jūs drīkstat un kur jūs varat piejaukt arī mazliet vēlāk, kad projekts jau ir iestartējies, ka jūs redzat, ka jums patīk, ka jūs to mīlat, ir izveidojusies forša komanda, ir tikai jāmačī, nu, ko mums vajag tikai piķi dabūt. Un Es domāju, ka ir gadījumi, kad, kad naudu dabūt pat ir vieglāk, nekā dabūt labus komandas biedrus. Tā kā nauda ir tajā visā ļoti būtiska sastāvdaļa, bet, bet varbūt pat pašā sākumā tas, tas nav tik būtiski. Bet par to ir jādomā. Ir jādomā uh, 
kā dabūt sponsors, kā to sponsors parādīt jūsu projektos vai, vai uz kādām iestādēm ir jāiet un jāraksta projektu, lai piesaistītu finansējumu, ir jāskatās uz visām iespējamām iespējām, kur ir nauda, kur viņu var dabūt. Skaidrs, ka ir uzņēmumi, bet ir arī visādi projekti, gan Eiropas Savienības fondu projekti, gan kultūra kapitālu fondu projekti, ja tas ir kaut kādā veidā saistīts ar, ar, ar kultūru Un varbūt tie ir kaut kādi privāti investori, kur jūs varat nav dabūt, varbūt tas ir šis te pūļa finansēšanas kampaņas, kuras jūs varat noorganizēt savu dažādām platformām, tas pats Patreons. Atliek tikai aiziet un pieklauvēt pie īstajām durvīm, uzdot īstos jautājumus, forši sevi noprezentēt, forši parādīt, ka projektam ir potenciāls un pārdot viņu labi, lai, lai tie potenciālajai finansē, finansējumu avoti arī jums noticēt un iedot jums to naudu. Un tad vienkārši, kā saka, dzīvo nost un tikai dara un riktējies. Lūk, zoom, zoom, zoom. tā bija Artūra Jēnota ilgtermiņa daļa vielas formula. Entuziasms, komanda, nauda, ideālā ilgtermiņa daļa viela. Prezentēts no Artūra Jēnota. Uh, bet, uh, jā, kā jau es minēju, ja nav komandas vai naudas, bet ir entuziasms, tas nenozīmē, ka nevajag darīt. Un šī te sakarā, man vēl ir kaut kādu minūtu vai divas ideāli, šī te sakarā ātri izstāstīšu, un mēs pirmais lielais projekts, pie kā es strādāju, bija revolucionāri, kas bija, neuzminēsiet, bet uh, intervijas ar iedvesmojošiem cilvēkiem. Un um, man vienmēr intervijas beigās bija uh, jautājums cilvēkam, uh, Vai no šī te projekta ir jēga, vai viņš kaut ko dod, vai viņš iedvesmo citus cilvēkus, vai ir jēga šo te darīt. Un tas bija tāds jautājums, ko es uzdevu, vai tie ir iedvesmoti mūsu pašus, ka, ka jā, tas, ko mēs daram, tam ir jēga. Un mēs nointervējām vairākus cilvēkus, līdz mēs nonācām pie Māras Upmanis Holšteinis. Un mums bija brīnišķīgi forši interviju, un tad pienāca šis te pēdējais jautājums, vai šis te kaut ko dod. <laughs> Un mēs bijām izveidojuši vairākas intervijas, bet šī bija tā atbilde, kas bija vissvarīgākā no tām visām. Noklausīsimies. Es izgriezu ļoti, ļoti, ļoti īsu fragmentu, nebūs daudz jāskatās. Man patīk jauniešu entuziasmas ļoti tikai tā var kaut kā izaugt paši. Un es domāju, revolucionāri vispansiskāk ir priekš šiem strījiem. Principā tas, ko Māra pateica, ka tas, ko mēs daram, ir uh, fantastiskākais tieši, tieši priekš mums. Uh, un tā ir tajā laikā, es vēl to tā uz 100% neaptvēru, bet um, paēt vēl kaut kādam laikam es sapratu, ka, lai ko mēs dzīvē darītu, uh, kādus projektus veidot vai kādās aktivitātes piedalītos, tas mums viss kaut ko māc, un mēs kaut ko iemācamies, un visi vienmēr uh, izceļu šo te lielo vārdu, ka tā būs pieredze. Un lai cik arī šis te vārds nebūtu novazāts, un reizēm šķiet, ka varbūt viņš pat ir savu spēku un vērtību zaudējis, bet tā ir taisnība. Tā būs pieredze, lai ko jūs veidot, lai pie kādiem projektiem jūs strādāt, vai tie ir jūs paši, vai jūs tikai ņemat, nu nevis tikai, bet jūs ņemat dalību tajā. Tas jums kaut ko dos, jūs kaut ko iemācīsieties. Gan par jomu, kurā jūs darbojaties, gan par savām prasmēm, stiprajām, vājajām pusēm, un kur vispār dzīvē uz kuru pusi virzīties. Un revolucionāri man iemācīja ļoti daudz, gan par mēdījiem, gan kā filmēt, gan, gan kā montēt, un mēs izgājām cauri entajām kļūdām, no kurām mēs mācījāmies uzreiz, kad mēs viņus pieļāvām un kaut kā visu laiku mēs kaut ko no tā ieguvām foršu. Un es nezinu, vai tie cilvēki, kas sēdēja mājās, pieņemsim, ka bija kāds, kas sēdēja mājās, skatījās šīs te intervijas un tāds, jā, es jūtos iedvesmots, tagad es iešu un darīšu, bet viņi neko nedarīja ar šo te iedvesmas enerģiju. Vai viņiem tas vispār kaut ko iedev? Jo mums tas iedeva daudz, mēs darījām. Tāpēc nebaidieties no tā, ka jums nav nejausmas, kā dabūt naudu, vai jums nav komandas, jums ir šis entuziasms kaut ko darīt, tad dariet arī jūs, jo procesā jūs daudz ko apgūsiet, daudz ko iemācīsieties un nākamreiz veidojot kaut ko jaunu, visticamāk, jūs jau zināsiet labāk, ko un kā darīt. 
Un es ticu, ka kāds arī klausās anglis, tāpēc for non-Latvian speakers, long story short, enthusiasm is not a long-term fuel, and eventually you will need money to eat, and also you need a good team, maybe more than two people. The end. Uh, es skatos, ka laiks man jau ir iztecējis, ja jums ir kaut kas man jautājums. Uh, es ticu, ka Kārlim kaut kas būs pajautājums, uh, bet ja jums uh, vienkārši gribas kaut ko pajautāt vai izklāstīt kaut kādu savu ideju vai palūk padomu, jūs man droši vienmēr varat rakstīt man Instagramā, e-pastā, atsūtīt īziņu Whatsappā vai jebkur es vienmēr esmu atvērts. Uh, un ja gadījumā es neatbildu, tad uh, uz, uzbāzieties man vēl, jo reizēm es neatbildu, jo tā ziņa kaut kur aizskrien, es viņās izlasīstu un viņu Tagad tā, ja jums vajag... Uh, kontaktus padomu vai atbildēt uz kādu no jautājumu par šo tad lielo tēmu, lūdzu, rakstiet man www.arturs.lv Kārli, vārds tev. Jā, paldies, Artūr, par iedvesmojošo un, un, un tiešām skaidrojošo stāstījumu par to, kāda ir dzīve, kad ļoti, ļoti daudz dara un, un ar kādām grūtībām un kādiem izaicinājumiem ir jāsastopās. Man viss šis, protams, vedināja uz, uz daudziem jautājumiem. Uz daudziem jautājumiem to jau atbildēju patiesībā prezentācijas laikā, tā kā tas super. Bet es pieņem, kad arī no skatītājiem un tie, kas skatīsies šo kādreiz vēlāk un, un centīsies rast iedvesmu. Noteikti ir daudzi tādi, kuriem nu, arī šī te entuziasms vēl varbūt nav tādā, teiksim, līmenī, ka š- nav šī entuziasma bāka, varētu teikt, nav pilna. Un es tā iedomājos, varbūt ir kaut kāds veids, kā šo pašu entuziasmu, jo tas ir tas, ar ko droši vien vajadzētu sākt jebkuram. Nu, nevar sākt uzreiz iedod man naudu un es izdarīšu. Vajadzētu droši vien būt arī tām degošajām acīm un tam entuziasmam, bet kā to uztrenēt? Ir kaut kāds tāds mehānisms, tur jāpiepumpējās vai, vai kaut kas ar smadzenēm jādara? Kas, kā, to, kā to panāk? Kā tās degošās acis sevī dabūt iekšā, kas tev ir? Ļoti labs jautājums. Es kaut ko atbildēšu tagad, jo es nevaru šobrīd palikt tā atbildi parādā, bet par šo es noteikti padomāšu vairāk. Um, ir, jā, nu, es, es ticu, ka nav pasaulē tādu cilvēku, kuriem absolūti nekas neinteresē un nerūp. Uh, mēs bieži, es pats esmu bijis jaunāks, Un uh, pats esmu meklējis, kas tad ir tās lietas, kas man dzīvē interesē, un tas ir, uh, tas prasa laiku uh, un enerģiju, un reizēm liekas, ka nekas jau neinteresē, un tu nevar īsti atrast, kas tevi interesē, bet tad, kad tu atrodi to, kas tevi interesē, un tad, kad tas, tā joma, tas, tas kaut kāds, nezinu, kultūras žanrs, jo nav manā gadījumā hiphops, uz tevi atstāja tik lielu iespaidu, ka tas tev sāk rūpēt, emocionāli sāk rūpēt, Tad arī parādās tas entuziasms tajā kaut kā sevi izlikt un kaut kā sevi piepildīt tajā un būt jēdzīgam, būt liederīgam pret šo te nišu jomu vienalga, lai kas tas arī būtu mākslas veidu vai, vai, vai profesiju. Un, un man šķiet, ka tas pirmais, ko vajadzētu darīt, ir, ir iet ārā pasaulē un meklēt, kas tad ir tās lietas, kas interesē, un tad, kad ir atrast tā lieta, kas interesē, pataustīties vēl dziļāk, varbūt jums viņi arī rūp, un ja jums viņi rūp, tad varbūt tā ir lieta un virzienas, kurā virzīties un savu entuziasmu audzēt un, 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 un likt, likt ārā, likt lietā un veidot kaut ko jēkpilnu un, un paliekoši šajā te nišā. Uh, tā kā es teiktu, ka jā, ka jās, jāsāk ar to, ar sevis atrašanu, un, un tas entuziasms viņš vienkārši, nu, viņš vienkārši uzplēksnīs. Um, kā viņu noturēt, un, un tā, tas arī varētu būt vēl droši vien tavs follow-up jautājums, bet uh, tas tā noteikti ir plašāk tēma. Es apsolos par šo te padomāt vairāk, jo šis te ir ļoti labs jautājums, kā atrast entuziasmu, lai kaut ko darītu. Tā es uzbrīdi laikam pazudu. Jā, viskārtībā mēs tev atguvām un, un arī sapratām tavu atbildi, un paldies, man liekas, ka vismaz no tās pirmās jautājuma daļas tu esi brīvs. Tu ļoti labi atbildēji tiešām, tad tā sevis meklēšana varētu būt tas viens no viens no risinājumiem atrast tās lietas, kur tev iedagās tās lacas, un tad to attīstīt. Droši vien tā otrā, otrā atbildes daļa būtu, un es atbildēšu tavā vietā, jo mums arī jāvirzās tālāk pie nākamās meistara klases, būtu droši vien trenēties 
šīs lietas darīt arī pusnaktī un darīt ar temperatūru, nu vismaz kādu laiku, kamēr to var, kamēr to var pavilkt un kamēr to var pacelt. Un tad, kad ir zināms līmenis, droši vien sasniegs, tad mēģināt tos pārējās degvielas komponentes pielikt klāt. Paldies, Artūr! Paldies, Artūr, par, par stāstījumu un, un savu pieredzi. Tik tiešām tas ir viss, ir, viss ir ļoti vērtīgi un... un, 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 un Un droši vien palīdzēs daudziem, kas ir līdzīgā situācijā, jā, vai šonakt palikt augšā un montēt, vai šonakt tomēr iet, iet gulēt. Varbūt, ka tas nav īstais, bet varbūt, ka tomēr ir tā īstā lieta. Nē, nu, Mātiņš, Mātiņš noteikti paliks pa nakti augšā un montēs. Es esmu redzējis, kā viņš naktīs montēs. Tas ir, tas ir dzīvnieks. Mātiņš, nu, nu, tu esi dzīvnieks. Es esmu redzējis to darbu etik no šī jaunā cilvēka, un uh, mums es visiem un arī sev novēlu tādu. Jā, mums nākamais, nākamais runātājs un nākamā meistara klase būs no Edgara Freša, kurš tieši arī strādā ar, ar video saturu uh, YouTube'ā un ir gatavs mums izstāstīt, kā izveidot noderīgu un iedvesmojošu saturu, lai salsniegtu vairāk nekā 20 tūkstoši sekotājs, nezinu, tur nav piebilsts, vai tas ir vienā dienā vai uh, vienā gadā vai desmit gados. Bet man liekas, ka tur varētu būt daudz vērtīgi padomi, tieši praktiski padomi, kas un kā ir jādara tajā YouTube platformā, kad ir sasniegts līmenis, kad ejam, publicējamies un, un, un mēģinam sasniegt uh, tam visam arī auditoriju. Bet tas būs pēc maza mirklīša. Mums ir uh, neliels pārtraukums, kad 2-3 minūtītes un tad Edgars Freš. Esam atgriezušies un sveiciens visiem, kas mums ir tikai tagad pieslēgušies. Es nojaušu un zinu, ka daudz no video būs arī pēc tam pieejam, tā kā varēsiet vēl pēc tam arī kādreiz noskatīties un, un atcerēties. Arī šobrīd to visu var skatīties Facebookā, YouTube, TV netā, LSMā un uh, visur citur. Un, uh, mēs turpinām mūsu meistara klases, meistara klases, kurās mēs uh, dalāmies ar uh, savu pieredzi, dodam uh, dažne dažādas padomas, un šis izklausās būs ļoti praktiski, Edgar, vai ne? 
Um, tad redzēsim. <laughs> Labi. <laughs> nav, tas... nav padomā, nekas pārāk praktisks īstenībā, nē. <laughs> Labi. Uh, tu droši arī dalīsies... Tā kā jēna, tam es domāju. Ar kādām beigām? Ar, <laughs> ar pozitīvām beigām. Tavs, tavs stāstījums saudzas kā izveidot noderīgu un iedvesmojošu saturu vietnē YouTube sasniedzot vairāk nekā 20 tūkstošu sekotāju. Vārts tev. Jā. Va, ā, ok, ok, es varu sākt, jā. Lieliski sveiki, no sākuma es iepazīstināšu ar sevi. Mans vārds ir Edgars. Un īstenībā tur ir kļūda nosaukumā, man ir 26 tūkstoši sekotāju, 26 ar pusi tūkstoši sekotāju YouTube, bet kurš skaita, vai ne? Um, un, principā, jau no bērnības es esmu bijis ļoti, ļoti, ļoti ambicijos. Es zināju, ka es gribēju, gribēju darīt daudz dzīvē, lai joprojām gribu sasniegt daudz. Es domāju, šis ir vēl tikai sākums. Un beigās es arī pastāstīšu jums par saviem nākotnes mērķiem, um, bet šo, šo, šobrīd gribu izstāstīt uh, jā, par to, kā es uh, sakrājušos te YouTube sakotājus, uh, par savu pieredzi darbojoties vispār YouTube, Instagramā, citās platformās, pārsvarā gan YouTube man patīk vislabāk, un... Uh, Tu jautāji arī, cik ilgā laikā, ja, tas akrātos 20 tūkstoši sakotājs, vai tas ir gada laikā, vai tas ir mēneša laikā, un es varu iesākt ar to, ka pasakot, ka es savācu sakrāju no nulles 8 tūkstoši sakotājus vienā mēnesī. Ne 20 tūkstoši, bet 8 tūkstoši. Tas ir Latvijas mērogā, no nulles, tā, ka man iepriekš bija pāris simti kaut kādi Instagramā, tas, man liekas, diez, diezgan tāds labs sasniegums, nu, tajā brīdī uh, man slikās kaut kas nereāls. Un tad, jā, šodien es izstāstīšu, sākšu ar to, kā tas notika. Um, sāku es filmēt video vispār pirms jau desmit gadiem, kad man bija 12 gadi, uz Ziemassvētkiem man sadāvināja naudu, Es palūdzu visiem, lai dāvina naudu, lai es varētu nopirkt savu pirmo kameru. Un tas arī, protams, kameras izvēle bija skatoties YouTube video. Tad es pastījos, kas kādas tur ir labākās kameras pa 120 latiem, laikam vēl toreiz. Un tad, tad nopirku attiecīgi Sony ziepju trauku un sāku kaut ko filmēt. Tad uz lēnā mājas datoru kaut ko montēju. Um, ik pa laikam uh, parādījās kaut kādi video, ko skolā iefilmē, tas jau vēlāk, tad es, uh, kad, es, kad es vidus skolā mācījos, bet uh, tā sākumā kaut ko ar draugiem, daudz fotogrāfē, daudz uh, filmē, un, man liekas, tas ir tāds stāsts gan arī visiem <laughs> mūsdienu youtuberiem, ka viņi jau no bērnības viņi vienkārši patīk filmēt un patīk fotogrāfēt, un jā, tad vēl, protams, tajā laikā es pats ļoti daudz, ļoti, 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 ļoti daudz skatījos YouTube, kas laikam ir arī svarīga lieta. Tajā brīdī es gan vēl neapzinājos, vai ne, vecāki domāja, ka, ka tas ir traki, ka es tik daudz skatos YouTube, tāpat kā vecāki domā par to, ka jaunieši, kuri spēlē video spēles, neko jēdzīgu nedara, bet tagad, ja mēs paskatāmies jau video spēļu, šī te e-sporta kultūra ir pārsniegusi vispār tad, um, Cenas ziņā ne, bet nu jā, tā apjoma biznesa ir lielākas e-sportam nekā parastajam sportam. Un tad um, 16 gados aptuveni, 15-16 gadiem es jau sāku saprast vairāk, ka es tiešām gribētu kaut ko YouTube pats darīt. Um, tajā brīdī vispār nu, man jau toreiz bija tādas augstākas ambīcijas, Mm, bet es sapratu, ka YouTube būs kaut kas liels, ja skatās uz kaut kādu jau, jau pasaules pieredzi. Um, Latvijā parasti viss attīstās kādus 5-10 gadus vēlāk, un tad jau varēja redzēt, vai ne, uz ko tad šī pasaule tiecās arī uz ko tieksies Latvijā. Uh, lielie YouTube arī jau tajā brīdī sāka, viņiem bija vairāk skatījumi nekā daudziem lieliem TV šoviem un, uh, tā teikt, tra- tradicionālajiem mēdījiem. Un es sapratu, ka tur ir jā, liels iespējas. Tad es ap to laiku, 2016. gads, 
sāku vairāk filmēties sevi, pirms tam es biju filmējis, mācījies montēt, filmējot dažādus tur um, klipiņus vienkārši dziesmas pavadījumā, ja, filmēju visu, kas apkārt notiek ar savu kameru, uh, bet tagad es pamēģināju, kā ir filmēt sevi. Pirms tam es biju ļoti bailīgs bērns, jāpiebilst, uh, man uh, negāja viegli runāt ar kameru, un uh, tad es vienmēr kalnējos, kad es ieraudzīju akvai, tas, ir, tas izskatās ļoti šausmīgi, kāpēc man nesanāk runāt tā kā, tā kā visiem pārējiem uh, lielajiem youtuberiem, bet uh, es turpināju, un tad uh, pirmo reizi tā publiski es to sāku darīt, vispār Facebookā, nevis YouTubeā, tad, man, tad es paskatījos to, ka Facebooks uh, arī ir tāda, uh, kļūst par diezgan populāru video platformu, un tajā brīdī bija uh, mm, tāds izaicinājums, kas saucās 22 dienu push-up izaicinājums, un tur cilvēki viens otru ietegoja, piemēram, es, es to sāku pildīt, un uh, es ietegoju vēl kaut kādu draugu vai vairāku, uz kuriem, nu, jūs zinat, kā šitie izaicinājumi strādā, man liekas, tagad tā ir populāra lieta visā internetā, un, uh, jā, man ietegoja, sākumā, Es nevēlējos tur piedalīties, un tas likās vienkārši garlaicīgi. Kā, kā tas ir, kad nu, vienkārši es 22 dienas filmēšu sevi pumpējoties 22 reizes vienā tajā pašā vietā. Nē, es tev nevēlos darīt, bet tad es atkal padomāju, varbūt var pārvērst to kaut kā nedaudz citādāk. Un tad es izdomāju, ka es katru dienu filmēšu sevi citā vietā un darīšu kaut ko interesanti paralēli sāku ar to, ka pirmajā dienā es pat neatceros, ko es īsti izdarīju. Laiks, ka iefilmēju. Tā, tā jau bija otrā diena, kad es aizgāju uz mājas jumta, pilnīgi nelegāli, uzkāpu kaut kur daudz tā mājas jumtā un uz, pumpējos tur ar skatu skaistu debesi, debesis fonā vai ne, citu daudz tā māju jumti. Un tad cilvēkiem patika tas video, tad es sapratu, ok, šitais būs forši. Es filmēju tālāk, nākamajā dienā man bija dzimšanas diena, es, filmēju, es pumpējos ēdot kūku, un tas bija diezgan smieklīgi, principā, ne, nezinu, kā lai parāda tagad, bet kad es piepumpējos iekodos kūkā, un beigās visa sejuma bija izsmērāta ar kūku, un tā es beigās izturēju šīs 22 dienas, katru dienu kaut ko citu, dažas dienas nebija, nebija tik radošs, un nekas īsti neizdevās, bet nu, galvenē, galvenais nosacījums bija kaut ko publicēt, un tas man katru dienu izdevās. Un tā, pēc tam kādu laiku man cilvēki prasīja, vai būs vēl kaut kādu video, tajā brīdī man vēl nebija par to domas, jo, un šeit ir svarīga lieta, man liekas, ko, ko, ko daudziem jauniešiem vērtīgi saprast, ko es tajā brīdī jau, jau sapratu, ka es nevēlos īsti, sāk to darīt bieži, regulāri, publicēšos te video, kamēr man vēl nebija 18 gadi, un kamēr es mācījos skolā, jo ir, protams, daudz labas pieredzes, kad cilvēki skolā sāk savu YouTube kanālu, un tad ir, ir, ir veiksmīgs pieredzes gan jau, bet tas, ko es biežāk dzirdu, ir šīs te pieredzes, kad cilvēki sāk šo te savu kanālu, un tad ir, 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 ir vairāk scenārija. Viens no tiem varētu būt, ka um, tiek apcelts skolā vai izsaukt pie direktora, kā skolotāji uzzina, apkārtēji uzzina, ka ir šeit notiek šī filmēšana. Un, nu jā, tas var veidot kaut ko nepatīkamu. Tad vēl uh, tāds viens variants, ka, ka aiziet prom no skolas, <laughs> jo tas aiziet tik labi pēkšņi, un tad uh, to vairs nevar apvienot ar mācībām un tad aiziet uz tālmācību un tā tālāk. Es izdomāju, ka es gribu pabeigt skolu, un tad uh, sāk to visu vēlāk. Pa to laiku es mācījos uh, vienkārši runāt ar kameru, sāku sāk domāt, kā es varētu uzlabot šo, šo te prasmi, jo katru reizi, kad es paņēmu kameru rokā, es kaut ko gribēju teikt, uh, man tas nāca ļoti grūti. Un tad es uh, parunājos ar vienu draugu, jo es redzēju, ka viņam tas labi sanāk, un viņš man pateica uh, vienkārši praktizēt to katru dienu, un tā es sāku, teikst, jau kaut kādā ap 17-18 gadu um, diezgan regulāri taisīt tādus uh, Instagram storijus. Principā tie bija uh, TikToki, 
Vēl laikā pirms bija TikToks, jo tie nebija parasti Instagram story, kur es vienkārši iefilmēju kaut ko un pielieku tekstiņu, bet es arī viņus montēju parasti vēl pat datorā. Um, tagad jau ir daudz iespējas telefonā samontēt šādu veidu video, bet toreiz es visu montēju jau datorā. Un tad, jā, cilvēkiem arī tie ļoti patika. Man pašam arī bija, bija interesanti šo visu veidot, un laiku jau palika vieglāk, un es sapratu, lēnām sāku saprast, kā, to, kā, kā es to vēlos darīt tālāk. Un te vēl, man liekas, forši piebildi paturpinot to jēnotu stāstu, ka es šo te izmantoju arī kā veidu, lai saprastu, ko es vēlos darīt. Ja es sākumā teicu, ja es zināju, ka es gribu kaut, kaut ko darīt YouTube, tādēļ, ka es to varu izmantot kā instrumentu, lai pēc tam tālāk attīstītu savu nākotnes karjeru vai kā to nosaukt. Un tad, jā, tad vēl joprojām es teiktu, YouTube man ir kā šis ceļš, sevis, iep, sevis iepazīšanas ceļš, kur es eju, un tai pat laikā dalos ar citiem, kā es eju par šo ceļu un sevi iepazīstu, kas ir ļoti vērtīgs, manuprāt, saturs tādiem cilvēkiem kā es, kas arī mēģina saprast, ko, ko vēlas darīt dzīvē. Um, tad kaut kad, jā, 18. gada beigām uh, izturēju skolu, teiksim tā, jo, jo arī tur gāja diezgan grūti, es jau zināju, Ka, ka, es, ka es, nu, vēlo tajā laikā jau arī sāku filmēt dažādiem klientiem video, pasākumu atskatus, tur reklāmas video dažādus, un vēlējos ar to saistīt savu nākotni. Un tad, pabeidzot skolu, es arī to sāku, kad pāris mēnešus pafilmēju, bet sapratu, ka nē, man, man jāpieturās pie mana YouTube sapņa, jo šis man galīgi neptīgi, Principā pāris mēnešu laikā es biju sarunājis daudz, daudz tur filmēšanas klientus, bet lielāko daļu no tiem nepabeidz, jo tā, kad es ķēros pie montāžas, man bija atklāsim, ka man nepatīk šito darīt, un es negribu, un es iespītējos, un tad, tad nu, kad es iespītējos, tad ir grūti mani pārliecināt kaut ko izdarīt. Un... Par... Tas, tas ir tāds stāsts, kas iet viss cauri vi, vi, visiem vēl joprojām šiem gadiem, ko, ka joprojām ir, es mā, mācos un ļoti vi, vi, ilgu laiku man diezgan grūti gāja sastrādāšanās ar klientiem, izcilā pasaulē es varētu veidot video un arī par šo te naudas jomu nedomāt, kā, kā Jēnots arī teica, ka Nu, laikam viņam, cik es saprotu, tā arī nav tā mīļākā lieta, ko darīt. Bet uh, arī to var padarīt par patīkamu lietu. Par to es vēl pieskaršos. Tad uh, sanāk tajā brīdī es uh, p- pirmā man tāda saskaršanās ar kaut kādu izdekšanu un depresiju. Un tad es uh, nonācu līdz tam, ka es vēlos tos YouTube video veidot. Un tad es uh, nu, jā, sāku kāpt pāri visām tām bailēm un sāku plānot, un tajā brīdī pirmais ir arī, ar ko, man liekas, daudz saskarās YouTube, ka sāk domāt, nu, ka, ka tam video, ko pirmajiem, ko tu publicēsi, ir jābūt perfektam, tādēļ, ka skatoties droši vien citus tur YouTuberus, tu redzi tos viņu pirmos video, ļoti bieži tie ir ļoti skaisti, vai arī tu pat neredzi pirmos video, rīzāk, ka tu redzi tos, ka, ko jau, kas jau ir publicēti, nezinu, Jā, kad tu redzi cilvēku, kad viņš jau ir publicējis video kādus piecus gadus, un tad tev liekas, ka tev jābūt tādai kvalitātei kā tam cilvēkam. Bet uh, patiesībā, ja paskatās ļoti bieži, bet YouTube ir pašus pirmos video, tie nav nemaz tik kvalitatīvi. Un tā bija tā lieta, ko es sākumā nesapratu. Un tad es jau kaut kādu pusgadu, man liekas, rakstīju scenāriju savam pirmajam YouTube video, kur es tā arī neuztaisīju, jo es ir pienāca vienkārši tā diena, kad nu ir jāsāk, ir, ir jādara, ir tā atklāsme, ka viss vairāk nevar gaidīt, jau man Instagramā bija jautājumi no cilvēkiem, kad tad būs, kad tad, es, kad tad es sākšu to savu YouTube kanālu, jo cilvēki reāli pat 
pat pirms es to izdarīju, bija interese, tad es sapratu, nu labi jāsāk. Tad es te varu arī parādīt savu ekrāniņu, jā. Ja? Līdzās. Vienkārši, tā, tā, turpinā, turpinot stāstu, vienkārši iesim cauri tad maniem pirmajiem video. Tā es esmu ieslēdzis no otra gala, no saviem vecākajiem video. Re, kur ir tas pirmais, ko es arī stāstīju, ir patiesībā jau toreiz bija, laikam, jā, pirms četriem. Man liekas, ilgāk YouTube nerāda vienmēr precīzi. Tas jau ir pirms pieciem gadiem tas push-up challenge. Tā ir tāds atskats uztaisīts, bet tur var noskatīties arī, ja kādam interesē katrs no tiem 22 video atsevišķi. Viņš tagad sāka skanēt, kā viņi izslēgt. Kāpēc viņi nevar izslēgt, es pat viņi neesmu atvērusi. <laughs> tā. Tad tā ir vēl kaut kādi daži video, no kaut kādiem pasākumiem. Atkal viņš skanā, viņi nevar izslēgt. Tā. <laughs> Atvērsim vēlreiz. Tā tad mani YouTube kanāliņi. Neliels tehniskas kibelītes. Tā, 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 tā. Nevar kaut kā šeit izslēgt ārā, bet es nevaru jau man. Ā, rekur. Tā tad uh, sort by date added oldest. Um, jā, pirmais video beigās bija nevis tas uh, ambiciozais, ko es tur biju ieplānojis uh, ar, ar, ar scenāriju un uh, vairākiem aktieriem un tā tālāk. Beigās jeb, jeb, bija Latvijas dzimšanas dienas, es domāju, iefilmēt video uh, par to, kā es uh, uz Latvijas simt gadu mēģinu apēst simts mandarīnas simts minūtēs. Ļoti briesmīga ideja nevienam to neiesaka darīt. Man bija pēc tam briesmīgas vēders āpas un uh, beigās apēdu. 39, laikam mandarīniem. Un, nu jā, šis ir tāds laiks, kad es sāku eksperimentēt, re, kur pir, pir, tad nākamais video ir jau pirmais ieskats tādiem vairāk video, ko es gribēju nākotnē veidot, un viņš ir arī ļoti briesmīgs, bet, nu, tā es varētu pateikt par visiem saviem vecajiem video. Um, tad tā tad pamācība, kā vlogot, es jau toreiz sapratu, ka es vēlēšos veidot video, kas ir pamācoši, bet taipat laikā izklaidējoši. Un tas ir tas, laikam, ko, ko daudz stāvs par to vērtīgo saturu. Um, un, ka būtībā no maniem sekotājiem es bieži dzirdu, ka, kad video noskatās, viņi pasaka, o, šis bija super interesanti, un es vēl kaut ko iemācījos. Un tā, man liekas, ir visforšākā lieta, kad ne tikai viņi ir pavadījuši šīs 10-20 minūtes kaut ko smieklīgu skatoties vai kaut ļoti bieži, nu, tas saturs ir tāds tikai izklaidēji, tad es gribu arī kaut, kaut ko atstāt vērtīgu šim cilvēkam. Un te man bija ceļojums uz Milānu, tas, tas, to mēs izlaidīsim, bet tad gribēju parunāt vairāk par šo te video, kā nopelnīt 100 dolārus vienā dienā patiesība par Svetcoin. Un tad kā tas tapa, bija, es izdomāju, toreiz um, bija, bija, bija tāda aplikācija, jā, ko es ieraudzīju Sindijas uh, Instagramā, un tad, tad, tad man parādījās pēkšņi tā ideja atnāc uh, nakts vidū pilnīgi tā kā tā, tāds šāviens, bliezienis, uh, Un, un kā motivācijas deva, kad es sapratu, ka, ak, Dievs, šī, šis būs, man liekas, pirmais video, kas uzsprāks manā kanālā, jo man liekas, ka tā ideja ir tik laba. Un tad es atkal sabijos, jo es sapratu, ka tur vajadzēs ļoti daudz darbu ieguldīt, lai to realizētu. Un, diemžēl, vai par laimu atkrīkst no tā, vai tas patīk vai nē, tas tā ir arī ar, vispār ar saturu YouTube, ja tiešām grib izveidot tādus kvalitatīvus video, tas ir, teiksim, salīdzinot ar TikToku, Instagramu, YouTube ir platforma, kurā ir visvairāk jāiegulda darbs tieši viens satura vienības radīšanā. 
ja 10 20 minūšu video izveidot bieži vien prasa, nu citiem pat vairākus mēnešus, man tā ir, teiksim, vienu līdz divas nedēļas atkarībā no no video veida un tā. Bet šeit arī tā tad video nosaukumā var redzēt, tā ir nu būtībā pamācība, ja ir kā nopelnīt, kaut ko, kaut ko tu uzzināsi. Šai šajā gadījumā uzzinās kaut ko vērtīgu, kā nopelnīt naudu. Tas tas visiem patīk. Un tad uh, patiesība par Svetcoin, tātad kas 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 ir šī aplikācija uzreiz rodās intriga. Um, tā, tā ideja bija tāda, ka es es paskatījos un es uzreiz ar savu iepriekšējo kaut kādām zināšanām par to, kā, kā šādas lietas strādā, jo es biju daudz YouTube skatījies, pētījis arī citas aplikācijas, kurš gan no mūsdienu jauniešiem nav kādreiz rakstījis YouTube, kā nopelnīt naudu caur telefonu vai ne, vai skatījies tos kaut kādas video, kā nopelnīt ar dažādām aplikācijām. Un, nu, atbildi tādi, ka tas bieži vien nestrādā, un šeit šis ir tas pats gadījums, un tad, tad, tad arī es to analizējot noskaidroju, ka patiesībā tur, tā, tā ideja tāda, ka var nopelnīt ar soļiem, bet patiesībā vienīgais veids, kā ar to nopelnīt, ir tad, ja padalās ar, ar šo aplikāciju, ar citiem, ar savu linku, un tad citi ielādē šo te aplikāciju, un tad tas ir tas veids, kā patiesībā no, var nopelnīt. Un tie, kas ielādē šo aplikāciju un tikai mēģina staigāt, nu viņi realistiski neko nenopelnīs. Bet kāpēc es zināju, ka šis video aiz, aizies, kāpēc, kāpēc man bija tāda pārliecība, jo tas bija tajā brīdī aktuāli, tas ir numur viens, ja gribi, lai, lai video strādā, nu, te nav jābūt obligāti aktuāli, bet es teiktu, ka izveidot tā, tā saucamo ever, evergreen, šis arī ir evergreen, nē, never mind, um, tādu, nu jā, saturu, kas ir kas nav par kaut kādu aktuālu tēmu, tā lai tas ir super populārs, ir grūtāk, tur vajag dažādas, nu, YouTube ir ļoti svarīgi, lai, lai sākotnēji tas algoritms to video pamana, un cilvēki viņi sākotnēji skatās, tad arī tālāk tas, tas būs tie, redzamāks citiem. Un ja visus analizējot visus video, kur šitais rakstas ziņas, es nevaru parunāt, kad man rakstas ziņas, es izslēgšu skaņu. Um, jā, ja panalizē citus manus video, kas, manuprāt, piemēram, ir tikpat kvalitatīvi, jo tā nav par aktuālu kaut kādu tēmu, tad uh, tur ir salīdzinoši mazāk skatījumi. Tad, uh, kas vēl nostrādā, ir tas, ka man jau bija kaut kāds uh, saturs uh, iepriekš kanālā, Un vēl te jāpstās noteikti, ka tagad tev ir tas lielais cipars 104 tūkstoši skatījumi. Tas noteikti daudz atbaida, nu vispār, kā, kā var dabūt tik daudz, bet te, te piebildi tāda, ka te, tas lielais skatījums skaits, ko es dabūju, tajā sākumā nebija 100 tūkstoši, tie bija 2 tūkstoši, kas man toreiz likās jau vāv. Wow, ja es salīdzinu toreiz, kad es sāku šiem te pirmajiem video bija maksimums 100 sekotāji, Un tos es dabūju tā tad, nu, no, no sekotājiem, kas man bija Instagramā, man tajā brīdī vienkārši bija draugi dažādi, un Facebookā, jā, tad Facebook draugi, tie ir vienmēr tavi pirmie sekotāji. Tie būs, jo, jo mums liekas, kā vispār dabūt, vai ne, manam, sekotāji, manam YouTube kanālam ir 20 sekotāji, tad, jā, pirmie vienmēr būs tavi draugi, tavi paziņas no Facebooka, no Instagrama, no vietām, kur tu, tev jau ir sekotāji, nevar teikt, ka tev nav sekotāji, vienkārši pasaka viņiem, hei, tev ir YouTube kanāls, lūk, tre, kur tev pirmie 100-200 sekotāji. Un tad, kas vēl nostrādāja, ka jā, tad es esmu ielicis, tre, kur Sindiju, gan video, gan tamnēlā, un vēl bija es speciāli pacentos pie tā, lai Būtu, būtu šitā atpazīstamība no jau, jau pazīstamiem satura veidotājiem, vēl bija šajā video Armands Jaunzems, kas arī padalījās ar šo video, tad man ir uzreiz vēl ekstra skatījumi no šiem tad diviem cilvēkiem, kuri ieliek to savā Instagram storijā, un, un, un jā, 
tā, tas ir kā es savāds tos pirmos 2000. Tad es paņēmu nelielu pauzīti, sāku domāt, nu, ko es veidošu tālāk. Un tad ar laiku jā, turpināju veidot pārējos video. Rekur līdz šim te latviešiem besī influenceri. Tā es reiz nedēļā kaut kur sāku domāt un ve- turpināt veidot šos te video. Um, tad tik aptuveni tajā brīdī, man liekas, aprīļa sākums, jā, uh, man sāka parādīties vairāk skatījumu tam video, un uh, tieši no tā, ka, jā, es, kā jau es teicu, par, ir vēl video manā kanālā, un tad uh, cilvēki ierauga to, vai viņi ierauga arī šo, šo, šos te video sāka ieraudzīt pēkšņi, um, tad tajā malā pie, skat, uh, kad, kas rādās, kad skaties uh, video YouTube, redz recommended videos, un mans video sāka parādīties tur, cilvēks sāka uz tās piest, un YouTube algoritms redz, ka manā kanālā ir kaut kāda aktivitāte, un cilvēki uzspiežot uz šī te viena video, pēc tam uzspiež arī uz pārējiem video. Uh, tas nozīmē, ka mans kanāls ir interesants, un galvenai, galvenais, ko YouTube's, kas YouTube ir pašam svarīgi šim algoritmam, ir cik ilga laika pavada skatoties manus video, un ja man ir šis saturs, ko es piedāvāju, un viņš ir interesants, un cilvēki ir noskatījušies, piemēram, trīs video, tas nozīmē, ka man ir labs kanāls, un tad jau tajā brīdī sāka vairāk cilvēkiem reklamēt šo te kanālu. Tas jau, kad man sāka dabiski piesakot, te, man liekas, līdz tam aprīļa sākumam, Jau es biju savāds vēl plusā 200, tie ir 500 sekotājiem kopumā. Un tajā brīdī man, man bija uzstādīts mērķis, ka es līdz vasarai gribu sākstrāt 5000 sekotāji. Un aprīlis jau bija gan arī sācies, un es savu, ka es esmu tālu no savu mērķa, un kaut, kaut kas ir jāpamaina savā stratēģijā. Vēl kas bija noticis šajā brīdī, Man parādījās ļoti daudz idejas, kad es sāku domāt vairāk par šīm idejām, kad es sāku jau kaut kādas video veidot, es sāku saprast, kas strādā, kas nestrādā, um, ko, ko, kā, kādas video man patīk taisīt, kādas nē, un tad uh, sāku parādīties ļoti daudz idejas, vai neko vēl varētu pamēģināt. Un to ideju vienā brīdī bija tik daudz, un tas mērķis bija tik liels, ka es izdomāju, ka vienīgais risinājums ir, sarakstīt visas šīs te idejas un īstenot viņas nevis reiz nedēļā, kā es darīju iepriekš, bet pamēģināt, tad, tad uztaisīt video katru dienu, 30 video, 30 dienās. Un es to tā pēdējā brīdī izdomāju, es vēl, ja tā, tā ir tāds tāds liels uh, komitments, ja, tāds tad tad uh, saprat, nu, ka man vajadzēs daudz laika tam veltīt. Es vēl nebī pārliecināts tādēļ es līdz pēdējiem brīdim domāju, vai to darīt, vai to nē, un tad aprīlī dienas vidū es izdomāju, nē, šis ir jādara, jā, šis ir jādara, un uh, sāku tam es iefilmēt vienkārši video, izstāstīt, lai izstāstītu, ka es to darīšu. Es vēl nebiju 100% pārliecināts, tādēļ es arī iedomājos, ka 1. aprīls ir izcilā diena, lai kaut ko sāktu, jā, šādais vispār ieteikums pa dzīvi, jo tad tu vari pateikt, ka tas ir aprīļa joks, un to nedarīt. <coughs> un tad es pieturējos pie tā, otrajā dienā samontēju video, kas man bija palicis jau no nesamontētajiem video, no ceļojumu uz Bulgāriju, tad nākamais video arī tas pats, un tad nonācām pie atkal video, kas ir par aktuālu tēmu, un šis bija pirmais video vispār manā kanālā, kas sasniedza um, vairāk nekā, man liekas, tur viņš pirmajās pāris dienās sasniedza 17 tūkstošiem skatījumu. Tieši tādēļ, ka šī bija aktuāla tēma, es uzliku kaut kādu atradu bildi internetā uh, smieklīgu, ka cilvēki brauc septītajā tramvajā, photoshopētu bildi, vai septītais, nē, kurš tramvajs brauc uz Akropolis, īsti neatceros, bet, jā, ka daudz cilvēku visi viņi brauc uz Akropolu, un tad šis te jautājums, vai, vai, vai šis veikals vispār ir vajadzīgs, vai ne? Un tad es vienkārši staigāju un uzdevu 
cilvēkiem šos jautājumus, jo tas bija tāds, šis saturs radās tīri no tā, ka man vajadzēja publicēt video katru dienu, nevienmēr var paspēt ierakstīt, sarakstīt scenāriju šiem te video, un tad es, tā, tā, tas mans risinājums bija iet un filmēt intervijas, jo tur es varu uz vietas izdomāt jautājumus un uztaisīt kaut ko interesanti, kaut ko smieklīgu. Protams, tas nebija tas, tāds saturs, ko es gribēju, nu, gribētu taisīt ilgtermiņā, bet jā, tas nevienmēr, nevienmēr tu sāks ar to, kas ir pats foršākais, tas ir arī viens secinājums. Dažreiz ir jātais arī video, kas ir, kas, kas ir tieši algoritmam labi, nevis tie, ko tu vēlies taisīt. Kaut gan tur varētu strīdēties, es domāju, var, to, to arī var apvienot, bet tam es vēl pieskaršos. Um, Jā, tad atkal bija ir viens video, kas patiesībā ar Young Media Sharks, uh, šarkiem kopā tā, ka tapa um, slack, pamācību kā staigāt ar slack, lai tur mans draugs uh, Dāvis, un mēs ar mēdīju komandu iefilmējām šo te video arī jau kaut kad pāris mēnešus iepriekš, un tad šis bija tas brīdis, kad es samontēju šo video. Vēl kas notika šī te mēneša laikā, uh, man Nā, sāk parādīties citi cilvēki, izrādi interesi, ka viņi arī grib piefilēt video kopā, tas arī man uh, par veidoju šo te jauno saturu, un tad šeit ir daudz video, ko es veidoju kopā ar citiem, šeit ar draudzenu samandu, samantu mēs par neidu parunājām, un tad uh, šis bija tas nākamais video, kas, uh, kas uzsprāga visvairāk, tas div, divu, trīs dienu laikā savāca, 100 tūkstošus, man liekas, ja nemaldos, vai varbūt mazāk, varbūt ap 80 tūkstošiem skatījumu. Un ar to gan es nelapojos, jo tas, tas arī nebija tāds video, ko, ko es vēlējos īsti taisīt. Un, nu jā, nonāca līdz mēnešu beigām. Mm, tā. Un tā atziņa kas man bija galvenā no tā, no tā izaicinājuma, ka vienkārši sākt, vai ja vienkārši sākt, ir vienkārši jādara, un tad tās pārējās lietas parādīsies um, pašas. Nu, tas ir kā uzsākt vislabāk, ir vienkārši uzsākot. Nevis domājot par to, kā darīt, 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 kā, kā, kā sanāk šitais un šitais, Man tajā brīdī pat nebija kamera. Uh, man bija saplīs uz kameru, es aizņēmu uz, uh, no draugiem vai arī filmēju ar telefonu. Visu šīs 30 dienas, un tāpat uh, cilvēki man skatījās un uh, jā, piesekoja ap 8 tūkstošiem cilvēku, un tad kāpēc viņi piesekoja tādēļ, ka viņi ieraudzīja mani, un tad, kad viņi noskatījās, viņi ieraudzīja vēl video, atvēr man kanālu, paskatījās, ok, viņam te ir forši saturs, un uzspiedu pogu piesakot. Um, tas, uh, jā, bišķiņ slims esmu. Uh. Viss kārtībā. Uh, Edgar, tiešām paldies par... par, Jā, par, par, par... Zinu, vienkārši jādara, un uh, viss, no, viss notiks tālāk, tas ir arī tas, kas šobrīd mani daudz, bieži atur, un tad es atceros par kāds es biju pirms tiem diviem, trim gadiem, un kad es vienkārši filmēju un pat neko citu nedomāju, un tad es saprotu, ka tagad es pārāk daudz bišķi dažreiz domāju, un ir vienkārši jādara. Um, kaut gan ilgtermiņā ir, protams, veidi, lietas, ko vajag izdarīt, un nevar vienkārši darīt haotiski, uh, nedomājot par, to, par neko citu, bet pie tā varbūt mēs vēl pieķersimies. Jā, tagad par to, kas notika pēc šī 30 dienu izaicinājuma un kaut, kaut kādi secinājumi. Um, jā, man parādījās uh, uzreiz, man liekas, kā, kā, bez mūsu vai tā kā pēc pulksteņa, Pabeidz šo izaicinājumu, ok, paņemšu pauzīt, jā, šis bija traki, tagad jāatpūšās, un tad parādījās sadarbības ēpasti, tur piedāvājumi, un tas, ka arī, ko, ko Jenots teica, nu, iespējas nopelnīt ir, ir daudz, un ļoti daudz, es pat teiktu, jo es tajā brīdī pēdējās divas gadus 
lielāko daļu sadarbības esmu atteicis, un tai pat laikā man, man tā patās bija pietiekami, ir bijušas pietiekami daudz sadarbības, lai ar to regulāri nopelnītu. Un, jā. Edgar, dzirdi? Tad, Edgar, Edgar. Tas, tas, tas ko es, uz ko es tiecos tagad, ir padarīt šo visu, Tā, lai ir interesanti, un tāpat laikā izglītojoši tas ir tas, uz ko es vienmēr esmu tiecies, vai ne, lai tas ir jā, izglītojoši, un, un, un kā, kā bija tas nosaugums vērtīgi, <laughs> un tas vārds liekas smieklīgs, bet uh, jā, kaut kāda vērtība tajā, tajā visā noteikti ir, un tad, bet nu, arī jāsaprot, ja, ka vērtīgu saturu neskatīsies visi, Bet būs tie, tie, kas gribēs, tie skatīsies, un tas ir arī viena no galvenajām lietām vispār internetā, ka um, daudz domā, ka ā, šāda satura neskatīsies, vai š, šādā veidā, ja es to pasniedzu, to neviens neskatīsies. Un te ir tas, tas biznesā, ja runā biznesa valodā, tad vienmēr ir tā, ka jebkuram gandrīz produktam nu, būs klienti, jebkam vienalaga, cik stulbs ir šis produkts, uh, ne, nevajag izdomāt atrums, ka to neviens nepirks, um, jo, jo vienmēr, ja pareizi to norekalmē, tad var, var atrast tos cilvēkus, un tad, uh, jā, tas reklāmas veids uh, YouTube'ā vislabākais ir uh, izdomāt, nu, ne, no manas pieredzes es nesaku, ka tas ir vislabākais, bet, uh, jā, šī tad thumbnail bildīte, tā maziņā, uh, kas ir uh, kas parādās pie katra YouTube video, ir pat, pat, pat svarīgākā, tas tas, ko pirma, pirmo ierauga, un tad patiesībā es vēltu laik, ilgu laiku veltīju neproporcionāli daudz laika tieši šai te bildītei. Pirms pat video ir uztaisīts, jau ir ideja galvā, kā izskatīsies šī te mazā bildīte, jo... Tas, tas pirmais klikšķis ir pats svarīgākais, pēc tam šī te, nu, pirmās video 5-15 sekundes, lai noturētu šo te uzmanību un tā tālāk. Tagad arī trīs gadus šo darot, gan es esmu jau bišķi noguris no tā, no tā, tā, tā mēģināšanas pēc iespējas vairāk skatījumus darīt, dabūt, un tad, jā, kā es saku, es vienkārši taisu, un apzinos, ka man jau ir kaut kāda auditorija, un ka tie, tos cilvēks, kuriem šis būs jāsasniedz, arī tas sasniegs. Um, man ir arī izveidota komanda, um, trīs cilvēku komanda, man šobrīd ir montētājs un dizaineri, kas taisa visu šīs te bildītes un dizainus, um, grafikas iekšā video, un palīdz arī ar visu kaut kādām citām grafikām, un montētājs, kas samontē, Arī tātad, jā, es daudz eksperimentēju šo te trīs gadu laikā, man tapuši jau divi podkāsti šobrīd, tad tas galvenais saturs, ko es publicēju, ir podkāsts, un arī tad kļu, pieļauju kaut kādas vecās kļūdas, bet lēnām sāku saprast, ka no sākuma, kā es sāku, izveidoju šo te nosākumu ideju, lai tā ir pietiekami interesanta, un tad tikai sāku domāt par to, kāds saturs būs. Kaut gan es zinu jau tās pareizās lietas, ko darīt, es bieži vien pats no savas nepacietības ne, ne, nedar šīs te labākās prakses. Um, bet es mācos un, un ceru, ka turpmāk tā, tā, tā vairs ne... Ceru, ka turpmāk viss sanāks. Jā. Un tad vēl, ja gribēju pastāstīt par vienu lietu, kas ir kas varbūt interesē tiem, kam šis viss ir ļoti, ļoti interesē, kas arī šā, šīs te visas lietas, ejot detaļās, analizējot, gribu mācīt cilvēkiem, jo es redzu, ka mums pietrūkst saturs YouTube un šī te salīdzinot tieši ar, ar, ar citām Baltijas valstīm, Latvijai ir šobrīd, man liekas, tur diezgan atpaliek, un mūsu ārzemju draugiem, kaimiņiem ir vairāk YouTube, ir vairāk skatījumi, un viņi to visi jau ir attīstījuši citā līmenī, 
tādēļ es esmu izdomājis šoreiz pirmo reizi pastāst arī publiski, ka es tagad uh, veidošu sākot ar martu tādu YouTube akadēmiju, Fresh YouTube akadēmiju, kur arī visi šīs lietas, ko es esmu iemācījies, uh, stāstīšu vairāk detaļās un uh, Jā, to, par to visu varēsiet dzirdēt uh, diezgan drīz, un ja kādam interesē, droši varat pievienoties. Paldies! Super, paldies! Super, paldies, Edgar, uh, par, par stāstījumu, par prezentāciju, un nu, tu stāstīji arī daudz par visādiem piedāvājumiem, kas tev nāk. Es domāju, ka vai... Uh, Vai ir tev bijuši arī kādi piedāvājumi, nu tādi nopietni sadarboties nezinu, žurnālistikā? Tā ir tas skaņa noslēdis, vai ne? O, es Jā. ieslēdzu skaņa. Super, super. Vēlreiz paldies tev par prezentāciju. Mans ātrais jautājums, tev ir bijuši daudz piedāvājumi. Vai tev ir bijuši arī piedāvājumi taisīt tādu ļoti nopietnu saturu, nopietnā mēdī kompānijām, nu teiksim, par žurnālistikas līniju? Uh, ja godīgi, man liekas, ka nē. Um, nē, nu, mums ir, es esmu izveidojis arī, mums ir klimata raidījums, tas ir tāds nopietnākais, ko es esmu darījis ar Satori kopā. <coughs> Bet tu gribētu? Um, tas, tas noteikti ir kaut kas, ko es gribētu, jā, mm, jā, jā, jā. <laughs> Mums arī šajā paneļa diskusijā bija tā tēze, izkristalizējās, ka sociālajos mēdījos jaunajās platformās ļoti tāds, tāds izteikts trends šobrīd ir nu, tāda patiesa informācija, nu, ka tāds pret, pretspēks visam tam viltus un, un, un visam feikam. Kā tev, kā tev ar šo ir visas tās attiecības vai tev arī tas ir svarīgi tad, kad tu šo saturu ražo? Nu jā, tas ir uh, man, man svarīgākā vērtība vispār tā, tā, tā ir, ir patiesība, atklātība. <coughs> Un es arī ar to, to spēlējos, es apzinos, ka cilvēkiem nu, ļoti interesē un patīk šis te atklātais saturs. Un tad uh, bieži vien tā ir tāda spēlīte, nu tā kā, kurš, kurš būs atklātāks bez maz vai kurš izstāstīs vairāk. Mm, un tad uh, es daudz, un tad tas pēdējais saturs ir tur ļoti, mm, jā, man patīk saturu analizēt, skatoties uz komentāriem, un tad ko komentē arī pēdējai maniem video ir ak, dievs, nezināju, ka latvieši var tik atklāti runāt, un tas ir par saturu, ko mēs veidojam tur par, par mūsu jauniešu pieredzi ar, ar seksualitāti un seksu un dažādām citām tēmām. Arī es par runāju atklāti tur par, par so, par, par kaut kādām narkotikām un nu jā, dažādām tēmām, par, kas skaitās tabu, man liekas, tas ir ļoti interesanti un tas arī man, man, manā, mans uzskats, ka tas vienkārši padara pasauli labāku un nu jā, daudziem jauniešiem palīdz saprast, ka, kā pasauli strādā, jo tā, bija, tā ir liela problēma uzaugot ka nu, nav, nav īsti pieeja, nav īsti saprašana, kas ir šīs te lietas un kāpēc par tām nerunā. Super, Edgar. Lai tev izdodās viss ar jauno YouTube akadēmiju Latvijā un stiprināt visu to saturu. Par žurnālistikas ieminējos tādēļ, kad mūsu nākamais... Nākamais runātājs Džims Džeikubīno Arizonas universitātes tieši par to arī stāstīs par studentu veidotajiem žurnālistikas darbiem, kas ir iegūš arī prestižās Emī Balvas, bet mēs kā vienmēr uztaisam pirms tam nelielu 2-3 minūšu pārtraukumu visu sariktējam, lai viss mums atkal būtu jauki, nevainojami un mēs varētu turpināt ar mūsu šī vakara pēdējo darbnīcu. Tiek mēs pēc brīžu.
uh, welcome back and uh, this time around we switch back to English and we have uh, the Thank very f the very last uh, the very last uh, workshop uh, of the day's uh, youth media conference which will continue of course uh, tomorrow as well and we have a guest uh, guest speaker Jim Jacoby from Arizona State University hi Jim hello and you will talk about the how to how to work with students to earn some Emmy awards and I see some some awards behind your back actually are these Emmy those, awards? Those, I'll claim those as mine yeah one's an Emmy award one's a telly award um, and then some from Broadcast Education Association um, but our students have many awards as well um, yes good morning or good evening to you all uh, I'm Jim Jacoby I work for Arizona State University uh, in the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism um, I thought I would jump in and just kind of tell about the background of our program and then kind of jump into specifics like what's challenging about it, how we got it off the ground, um, how others can get a program like this started, um, and then kind of like how we collaborate with youth. Uh, so let me give you a little background on um, the story, what we're doing here in Cronkite News. Um, can you guys see all that? There we go. So we're Cronkite News. Um, we are a division of the Cronkite School at Arizona State University. Um, it's considered a professional program. So Cronkite News is set up like a job for these students. They're here two, three, four, five days a week, eight hours a day. Um, we are the news division of the PBS station here, which has given us great opportunities and our students great opportunities. And I'll cover that in a minute. Um, because of that, it allows us to broadcast a lot of houses throughout Arizona. We also broadcast live on YouTube and our website. Um, we have digital partners for the web, um, partners for print, different newspapers throughout Arizona, newspapers in Southern California. Um, we also have bureaus in uh, Los Angeles and Washington, DC that focus on uh, Arizona related stories in those two bureaus. Um, and because of the sheer amount of students we have, we're one of the, one of the largest organizations in Arizona. So what is Cronkite News? Um, it is overseen by 15 faculty members. Um, and you can kind of see there three broadcasts, three digital. Uh, we have a Spanish language. Uh, so there's about 15 full-time people that are uh, overseeing this. Um, even though it's student-driven, uh, the, the faculty is overseeing it at any given time. Um, so there's, there's a lot of oversight, but yet a lot of freedom for the students as well. Uh, and Ultimately, the purpose is to produce journalists and newsroom leaders for news and to get these students jobs. Um, also, since we have such a large number of students, it allows us to report on stories that other news outlets might not. We take a different um, approach to the news. We don't do the, um, if you've ever heard the term, if it bleeds, it leads newscast. We are doing more in-depth, more political public policy stories, stories that affect Arizona and stories that affect underserved communities. Um, where can we be seen? Uh, broadcast, Arizona PBS is our largest outlet. Obviously, we talked about that before, 1.9 million homes. Uh, we came to Arizona PBS in 2018. Um, it was run by the Arizona State Board of Regents um, and through lobbying from our dean, uh, they gave us the keys, so to speak, to Arizona PBS and we took control of it in 2018. Um, that allows us to do more work on the air. We are on the main channel. We air at 5.30. We're the number six market in the US. Um, so there's a lot of eyeballs that see our students work. Um, because of the partnership with Arizona PBS, we also get seen on uh, the PBS network, the major network. Um, there's news stories like NewsHour um, and other things that allow us to work tandemly with uh, national news as well. Um, so our students get a lot of exposure. It's great for them. They get to be on the set uh, on the Arizona PBS side reporting their stories. And then of course their stories end up on the air. Um, we also do podcasts. We are on Alexa uh, every day with a news update. Um, we have digital presence website um, and a lot of social media as well. We're big on social media. So these are all different kind of platforms that students get to show their work. So they're not tied down to one platform. They can choose to report on anything. 
they can get used to reporting for web, but also doing a broadcast story for the same story or vice versa. Broadcast students are required to write a web story, a digital story for their story for their packages. Um, and then we have, we are in the Southwest, we have a large bilingual population. Um, so we do a Noticias show, which airs three times a semester on the local Telemundo channel, which is the national uh, Hispanic network, Spanish network, Spanish speaking language network. Um, and that also gives a lot of opportunities for students, a great partnership that we founded when the school started back in 2008. Um, and then of course we talked about Arizona PBS. Um, so you can see kind of lower left, Judy Woodruff is a host of a national show. Um, and she tweeted about one of our students packages. That student got a job pretty much right away from the national uh, recognition she got from her uh, news story. And then, of course, we're churning out students that win awards pretty much every semester, one way or the other. A lot of local Emmy Awards. Now, that's a that's a good differentiation to make. Um, there's the National Emmy Awards for national broadcasts. This is a regional Emmy Award that these students can win, which is basically California, Nevada, the southwestern states. It covers that territory, but they do win a lot of them every single year. Um, and I'll show you in a minute an example of a newscast that won this past year. Um, so how do we do this? Well, we start the semester with a two-week boot camp. So these students have had classes before that are coming in. They know some videography. They know some editing as well. Um, but when they get here, it's a totally different beast. They hit the ground running. Um, in this boot camp, so we give them refreshers on shooting and editing video. Um, the workflow that's specific to our newscast and our digital platform, we train them on podcasts and audio, vocal presentations, social media skills, um, and they also require them to attend sessions such as diversity and accuracy and reporting uh, to make sure they are thinking about every community that they're serving that they're reporting on, and we get a wide variety of diverse voices in our stories. Um, so that is a really intense, fast two-week boot camp where they're getting up to speed. And then two weeks after that, we go on the air. So we just actually started our first live newscasts this past Tuesday. A lot of stress, a lot of uh, nerves around the newsroom recently. Um, and then reporters start immediately. If they're returning students, they start immediately. Um, and if not, they're going to wait for two or three weeks after that boot camp and start reporting. So again, the students that are coming to us have had core skill classes. Um, they've taken the basics, but they haven't really put it into action. And that's the whole point of this program is treating it like a job. They've come here with the skills already. And now we're churning out newscasts on a daily basis, digital stories on a daily basis. So they feel the pressure. They feel what it's like to be in a real newsroom. And that makes all the difference in the world. Um, for our anchors, for our newscast, um, everybody has to audition. Everybody still has to do their main job, which is report on stories, whether digital, broadcast, um, anybody can anchor, um, sports, news, my, my studio production team, anybody who, you know, passes the test on air. It's based on so much more than just looks and presentation. It's current event education. Um, it's, again, diversity, equity, inclusion. We think about how they present themselves. Um, we look for pace and clarity of the reading and then a connection to the audience. Are they too stiff? Are they looking for, um, do they have the connection? Does it feel like they're reading to you and not at you? So small things like that we're looking for. Um, we choose 10 main anchors, two a day, but then we have reporters do on-air stories as well. And then we have opportunities throughout the semester for students to jump in and anchor as they wish. We sometimes do a Facebook Live in the middle of the day, like at noon, and that is a good uh, another place where students can get on-air opportunities. Um, so we give them plenty of opportunities, both on-air, digital, and then behind the scenes. I know I'm going super fast here. Let me show you this uh, award, this newscast that we did um, last semester that won our uh, Emmy Award. Hopefully you guys can hear that. After seven mass shootings in the U.S. in seven days, pressure is mounting for lawmakers to take action on gun control. 
We'll have the latest on what's being done in D.C. and here in Arizona. Plus, now that anyone over the age of 16 can get vaccinated in Arizona, how will that impact the older, more at risk age groups? And on Break It Down, how education can hide cultural truths. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Karina Espinosa. And I'm Jackson Zuber. Thank you for joining us. Ten people were killed in Boulder, Colorado yesterday in what is now the seventh mass shooting in the U.S. this week. Among the victims, a Boulder police officer who rushed to help at the scene. Police say the suspect is a 21-year-old man from Arvada. He exchanged gunfire with police and got shot. He's currently in the hospital in stable condition. No motive has been released yet. As the country mourns, the gun control debate takes center stage yet again. Tonight, we have full team coverage on the two very different battles state and federal lawmakers are fighting in the wake of this most recent mass shooting. Let's go first to Jake Holter in our Washington Bureau with the latest on today's hearing on gun control. Jake. The scene is all too familiar. Police tape stretched across the scene of a mass shooting as grieving survivors look on. And in Washington today, the arguments that came in the wake of that shooting were familiar too. Inaction has made this horror completely. So I won't make you watch all that, but basically um, we are a functioning news uh, newsroom. So we have, we have um, opportunities to report in DC, which that last student was in. So we, in, our, in DC, we have, we take that gun control initiative and we have an Arizona angle on it. Um, the other reporter was doing the local legislature and local Arizona gun control. So we take the national story, which is gun control, um, which I'm sure you all know is a huge battle here, unfortunately. We take that issue and we break it down, uh, students break it down, I should say, into how does that fit into Arizona? How does that affect viewers in Arizona? So although we have that presence on both coasts, we're still Arizona centric. Um, students are, I should say also, this is all students. You know, I oversee the people who, I train the people who punch the buttons, who uh, direct, technical direct, do audio. There are other professors that train the on-air reporters, the writing aspect of it. But when it comes down to the newscast, everybody that does input to the newscast is a student. They write their own stories. They stack the show, decide which stories are gonna air in what order. Um, they decide what's important with faculty input. Um, but it can't be stressed enough that this is truly student run. Um, we have oversight, but it's theirs to succeed or fail with. And that's an important thing to keep in mind when you're working with students, right? They're still learning the, their way. Um, you want to guide them, but you don't want to be um, controlling what they do. Um, and that's a big thing for us. So we give them a lot of freedom. Uh, what are the challenges we face with Cronkite News? Well, um, professionalism uh, among students. We're dealing with students that are anywhere from 19 to 22, 23, plus grad students as well. So they're a little more mature. They're graduate students that come in a little later in life. Um, but we're training them what it's like to be professionals in the in a newsroom, basically. So they have to dress professionally when they're with us. They have to, you know, make phone calls out to contacts to get their stories rolling. They have to know how to interact in a professional setting when they go out and do their interviews. Um, again, this is a student-run newscast, but they are not acting as students. They are acting as professionals, and that's the whole point of this experience for them. Um, another challenge is we have to get a product on the air every day, right? So we are relying on the students to meet those daily deadlines for us to get the product on the air. Um, and I'll tell you from a faculty standpoint, sometimes that's the biggest challenge, right? We have this 26 minute window that our newscast is, and we are planning on students giving us pieces to fill that 26 minutes. And when they don't meet deadline, it kind of throws the whole thing off. Um, but then that also creates a opportunity for the producers of the newscast to figure out a real world situation like that. So even something like a student missing deadline for the newscast, we turn into a real world situation for them and have them decide how do we handle it. Um, again, for the most part, if it comes down to the wire, the faculty will jump in, um, but everything's, everything's a learning opportunity for these students at every turn. 
And then finally, our biggest challenge has been COVID. Um, last 2020, March of 2020, we went virtual. Um, everybody was on Zoom for the remainder of the 2020 semester and summer. That was a challenge. Students recorded stories on their phone. Um, they edited remotely and uploaded to the cloud, and we put together a web-only show. Um, students are back in now, but we're still social distancing. So even on our new set, we have people separated. When they go out in fields, they have to social distance from their interview subjects. So COVID has been a huge challenge for us as well, but we've kind of wrapped our head around it. The important thing, collaborating with youth. Um, and again, it's 80% students, 20% faculty, maybe 70, 30. Um, they are coming up with the ideas. We expect them to pitch the stories. So we engage them. We get them excited during those two weeks of boot camp. Here's what you can do. Here's where your skills will get you. Um, we interact with them on uh, with peers and alumni. We bring people who have done this program before, either fresh out of school or alumni who have been out numerous years and are successful and on the air. We have many graduates on all the major news networks, including Fox, CNN, MSNBC, um, NBC, ABC, CBS. So all the major networks in the US, we have quite a few grads and they're all happy to come back and give back and get these students excited about the, um, the experience and what it can lead to for them. Treat them as adults. That is a big piece of this is we do not talk down to them. Um, we have to be in manager mode sometimes and we have to reprimand them for, you know, if they don't meet deadline or if they come back with video that's not usable when we expect a 20 minute, uh, you know, 10 minute piece from them. But we have to treat them as adults. We have to bring them into the fold, into the professionalism of the newsroom, um, not quite as peers, but treat them with respect, treat them as adults treat them as if they were working for us in the in the real world, quote unquote. And then finally, give them the responsibilities. Again, we I spoke earlier about deadlines. They need to be in charge. They need to know what the fallout is if they don't meet their deadlines. They need to know what the fallout at if they don't make those calls, if they don't go out and interview the people they need to and get the voices they need to for their story, whether on air or digital. So really, they are feeling the brunt of the pressure um, when it comes to turning product. It is on their backs. It is not only a grade that they feel the pressure for, but it's the product, getting the product out in the public eyes, getting um, viewers on our web page, getting viewers watching Arizona PBS. They know they have to turn this product out and they take that responsibility uh, seriously. 99.9 .9 of them take it seriously, uh, the other ones we do. So how did we get here? Well, we came down in 2008. We moved from an old building in Tempe, Arizona, and now we're in Phoenix, Arizona, in what was considered a state-of-the-art building. It's pretty still state-of-the-art. We keep it up. Um, broadcast ready equipment for our newscast. We have three studio cameras we use. We have 24 editing bays available to our students. Um, we have an Adobe partnership, so every edit bay, every computer in the building actually has the Adobe Creative Cloud Suite, allowing students to access it anywhere. Um, they also get to download it for a discounted price because of our partnership, so students that have laptops can work off-site. Um, unfortunately, we don't have cloud-based editing, so they have to take it on a hard drive. Um, broadcast studio and control room, so just like a major news network, you know, not quite as many bells and whistles, but they are using equipment that is probably better than when they go to their first job out of here. Um, field cameras, we both use video and DSLR. We're shooting in HD, um, 4K for some projects. Um, students learn both DSLR and video before they get here. And then depending on which path they take, they'll shoot one or the other. We also have a lot of still photographers on staff. Uh, and then finally, the instructors are people who have done these jobs. For instance, I oversee the behind the scenes folk. I oversee um, the directors, the technical directors, like I said before. And that's, that's all stuff I did for 25 years before I took this job and still do in the freelance world to keep my knowledge up so I can then bring it back. Also, having professors that are in the field allows us to make contact with people outside of here that students might want to get in contact with when they graduate. 
So we set up mentorships, we set up internships, we have a lot of guest speakers in the industry come and speak to our students. Um, so because we are out there still working in the field, um, students get a, a deeper kind of knowledge about uh, the industry from people who are actually in it. Money, partnerships is a huge thing, right? We have, uh, again, a state-of-the-art building, state-of-the-art equipment. Um, a lot of that was made possible because we partnered with Canon and Adobe and Sony um, to get either donated equipment or to get uh, equipment at a reduced rate. And that's more often than not how we get it as a reduced rate. But then they sponsor us as well. Um, when we first came in the building, Apple was a huge partner. Every computer in this building is a Mac, either an iMac. Um, actually, they're all iMacs now. We don't have any towers anymore. Um, so Apple was a huge partnership with us. When we first started, um, we had Final Cut, the whole suite of Final Cut. Obviously, that kind of went away for us and we switched to Adobe. So now we have that partnership with Adobe. Um, Sony, our studio cameras, our switcher in our control room, um, they gave us a lot of equipment. They gave us a large donation. We named one of our studios after them. Um, so it kind of goes hand in hand. We, we kind of, uh, I don't want to say work the system, um, but partnerships are huge when it comes to things like this. So students can get state-of-the-art equipment. We're not using tape to tape. We're not using old school things that people have donated. Um, we're actually using the equipment that they'll be using when they go out in the field. And then grants. Um, the Knight Foundation um, has given us lots of money to hire. We have a health initiative that's funded by the Knight Foundation. Um, we have another one, Howard Center for Investigative Journalism, that they pay for that's allowed us to start an investigative journalism program. Um, and we've partnered with Google for technology purposes. Um, they fund what's, what's called a collab, a news collab for us, which finds innovative ways to tell news stories. Um, and that's based out of here. But all this kind of ties back to our product. So even if these other entities are standalone, their product ends up on our air. So students have a lot of opportunities to get um, well-rounded experience uh, and then still have their product seen outside of um, the building. So it's not just a campus newscast. It's not a campus newspaper. Um, it is a public. The public can see all of everything we do. Um, and that's great for students who get um, experience, they get to build a portfolio, um, and they are ready for a job. They've had the on the ground, on in hand experience um, to start a new job day one. And that's the biggest thing for these students is walking away with feeling confident and knowing what they've learning what they've uh, learned at a professional setting. That's my spiel. I'm happy to take questions about any of this or expand on anything I've talked about. Um, it's a great program. Um, we are in the 13th year of Cronkite News at this point, and um, our students are wildly successful at getting jobs, um, winning awards, and getting a great amount of experience. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you for, for your talk and, and, and sharing. Uh, this experience of how Arizona works with the young students. I, I know when I, yes, when I looked at the, the video you um, you presented, how students cover the story of mass shooting in Colorado, I noticed mm -hmm. that this is very uh, much alike how the big networks, big uh, news networks would, would do it actually. So, uh, and I kind of feel how, uh, and I want to ask, how much uh, are you willing to experiment with the with the content? Well, not maybe with the mass shootings, but like journalism works. Uh, how much do you like allow this innovation? I know you mentioned Google and and things you are collaborating with. So how much you kind of allow students to experiment with new uh, storytelling? Uh, well, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, a lot. I mean, that is one of our biggest goals, actually, is innovative news. Um, we stream our newscasts on Twitch. Um, we use different software to create um, animated infographics. Um, we do a lot of work with Google software that allows us to um, interact with Google Earth. We have a big touch screen that we can use that Google has, has donated to us. 
Um, so innovation is key. Um, we do a lot of non-broadcast and non-digital uh, things. A lot of them take care take place on social media. Um, so innovation is key. Innovation is big with our university president. Um, if you've ever if you ever come to Phoenix, uh, there's buses everywhere that say ASU number one in innovation. So that's a big a big thing for us. Um, the newscast itself is pretty standard when it comes to the ways we present the news. Um, most of our innovation ends up on digital uh, because we have more freedom um, and the platform allows for a little more innovation. Um, but we have done inno innovative stories for on air as well, the way we present it. Um, we try to not do anything that's just uh, straightforward, so to speak. We try to give it a little slant and a little innovation. And again, you know, it depends on the student that's reporting the package. It depends on how far along we are in the semester and if they have the capabilities. But what we're striving for is innovation. And we have a whole innovation squad, so to speak, um, that are students that are nothing, doing nothing but brainstorming on how we can present ideas in um, being innovative. Uh, yeah, I think we have a question on, on chat. I, I can see it. Uh, um, pop, what do you think makes your news out. different? Okay. Yeah, the yeah. question is, what do you think makes your news different? And I'm, I'm assuming you're meeting other local news stations or, or network news. Um, it really is the stories we cover. We really cover a lot of public policy, political stories, community-driven stories. Um, you know, we don't cover... Uh, the robberies, we don't cover the killings, we don't cover, um, uh, you know, unless it's breaking news and it's impactful to the entire state, you know, we do a lot of COVID stories, but then we do individual stories like, how is COVID affecting the Navajo Nation? Um, indigenous people are a, a huge underserved community in Arizona, and we work a lot with storytellings on um, Indian communities, Native American communities in Arizona. So with COVID, um, for example, we did a huge story on um, the Navajo Nation. We did an in-depth couple day piece that ran I think last semester. Um, so we try to break it down. And again, because we have the number of students we have and because we have the flexibility we have, we're not governed by ratings. Um, we're not governed by advertising sales. Um, we can pretty much cover what we wanna cover. Um, and that allows us to be innovative, but it also allows us to cover stories that you will not see anywhere else to um to an in-depth um level and and not just a 10 second reading the headline of the story so we're different in in the in the fact that we have more time to tell a story and that we cover stories that are not seen elsewhere a lot of politics a lot of um yesterday our first section of our newscast was all about upcoming bills and the legislature and what these bills are and what they will do to the Arizona communities if they pass or if they fail. Um, so there's a lot of, um, again, community-driven news. Uh, you mentioned that there's no pressure on, like looking at ratings, but do you monitor your audience? And do you uh, is there a goal to reach also a younger audience? And what kind yes. of audience, what, what kind of content uh, the younger audience is looking for in your uh, in your uh, stories, for example, yeah, that you know, that's uh, the younger audience is the big thing, and that's that's kind of the back and forth that we have. Number one, PBS, public television station, their audience skews older. Um, our lead in is uh, called Arizona Horizon, and it's a local talk show. Their audience skews older, uh, so people that turn into our newscasts is a little are a little older on the older side. And the big thing is, how do we get the young audience in? And so we're focusing on digital. We're focusing on streaming right now to bring in that young audience and then cross-platforming them to the broadcast. So we're, we're bringing younger eyes in through Twitch, uh, through TikTok, um, through Instagram. Um, we have uh, a big presence on all three of those platforms and Facebook, not as popular as the other with the younger audience. Um, but at the end of it, we're driving those people. Don't forget, we also have this broadcast as well. Um, People, youth are more um, used to on-demand programming, right? There's no such thing as really appointment TV anymore. This, this age group, millennials, Gen Z, they don't sit down at 5.30 and watch their favorite show. They don't sit down at 7 o'clock and watch their show. They go on Netflix and they go on Hulu and they go 
you know, wherever they're going to go, Apple TV, um, and they're watching it on demand. And that's our next step is trying to figure out how we can get an app and make our newscast on demand. Um, we have the website where you can go and watch newscasts after the fact, watch digital video stories after the fact. Um, but we're working towards making it on demand because that's obviously for years now where things have been going. Um, and that's really where you reach the younger audience. But then also, what are the stories that the younger audience wants to hear? And that's kind of the back and forth we go through. We want quality stories that cover topics that need to be covered, but are those interesting to younger folks? So we kind of have a, a balance of it. I would say the most of it is public policy, community news, um, but then you know maybe three or four times a week we'll have a, a package that's more innovative, um, more driven towards um, a younger audience. Um, but it's not like we cover campus news. Uh, we don't, unless it's, you know, it's a large uh, news story affecting um, somehow Arizona State is affecting uh, the community somehow. But otherwise, you know, we don't do this club is meeting now or news stories on teachers. Um, we act as a local professional newsroom and we're covering community based news. Um, but getting to your back to your point, getting a younger audience is our main challenge. Especially here on is PBS another. Uh, yes. Here is another question from the audience. It's not a sure. secret that uh, uh, American society is very politically polarized. Mm -hmm. And how do you tackle this uh, in your news programs or in your journalism pieces? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, we obviously present both sides. We cannot be biased. Um, that is something we teach them day one. They enter the Cronkite School long before they get to us. It's about diversity of voices. Um, it's about not taking sides. Um, it's the old school journalism and not opinion. We don't have any opinion here. We are presenting the facts one way or the other. Um, where that comes into play is when we send our students out, and mostly this is pre-COVID, to rallies uh, during the Trump era, um, we would have to have faculty members go with the students to a Trump rally or a Republican rally, to be honest with you, um, because there was so much hatred and vitriol aimed at reporters, um, which again is a good life experience for these students, but nothing we want to experience in a negative way. So that the political polarization really affects us more on access to these people. Um, we have two liberal senators in the state, and we have uh, three very conservative representatives. The liberal uh, senators will speak to us. The conservative representatives say, you know, they don't trust media and they won't speak to us. They'll, they'll maybe issue a statement. And so that makes reporting both sides um, challenging. But then we are, we're transparent and we say we reach out to so-and-so and they will not answer for comment or this is the brief statement they gave us. So it's really right now, the press is the enemy of the conservative movement um, in America so to speak. Um, even after Trump, it still leans that way. Uh, and that is the challenge. But again, it comes back to life experience, right? That's a challenge that they face now. And if we can figure out how to cover that now, they have that experience when they leave this building. Do you collaborate with big, uh, big uh, networks? For example, if you have a great story and they email you and say, we want this badly. So what do you do? Um, we do that, yes, mostly with PBS. So the national PBS, there's a show called PBS NewsHour. Uh, that's an hour-long national show. That's where most of our content, we have a partnership with them. So they'll reach out to us and say, hey, we saw that story on XYZ and we really want to air that. We'll have to tweak it a little bit because national shows have um, stricter forms and, and, and how they present their news. We don't tweak the content, but we make tweak the presentation a little bit. Um, but yes, as far as NBC, CBS, ABC, our product doesn't really air on those stations a lot. Sometimes they'll reach out to us for just B-roll, just generic video that they want, and we'll give them that and they'll credit us. Um, but they rely on their local affiliates. So the national news, national NBC network would rely on the local NBC network to feed them stories. Now, having said that, we do feed a lot of stories to the local affiliates. So those stories are not getting national news but we have a content director here that puts out a list of every story we're covering that day. Um, it's our uh, 
Cronkite catalog for the day, if you will, of here are the digital stories we're covering with a link to every digital story. Here are the broadcast stories with a link to every broadcast story. So local news stations can log in and download those. And as long as they credit us, they can put them on their air. Um, same thing with digital outlets. They can grab our stories and run them on their website, um, run them on their print newspapers if they want to. Again, as long as they credit it. And, and it's so exciting for students to get bylines in like the Arizona Republic, which is the Arizona's largest newspaper, or to see their um, package, news package, show up on the six o'clock news on the ABC affiliate. Um, and again, it's more exposure for them. Um, so yes, we partner with a lot of networks, but really nationally, we're only partnered with uh, Yes. Uh, okay, and my last question is about the competition. Sure. Is there a big competition to study journalism, and how that that has been changed, like pre-Trump era, Trump era, and now post-Trump era? So, can you can you sure, see the yeah, difference? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, our numbers, our enrollment now, post-Trump era, are larger than they've ever been. Um, you know, number wise, our school has grown and that might be a coincidence, but we have the most students enrolled last semester and this semester than we've had in probably since we came into this building. Um, so there is excitement, but a lot of students want to go into sports journalism. So and that's a big thing here as well. And we do have a sports segment of our newscast. So a lot of students want to go into the sports journalism. A lot of those large numbers are sports journalism students. Um, but as far as, you know, I think there is uh, more excitement. I think I think students that are coming in now see what's happened in the in the press and how the press has been treated. Um, and I think they want to make a difference. I think they want to make a change in that. Um, and I think a lot of them are coming now because if they were wavering between journalism, something else, they're choosing journalism. Um, because even though it's a really tough time to get in journalism, um, the platforms are changing greatly. Uh, how we report is changing greatly. Um, there is still a large excitement for students uh, to come be journalism students or be journalists. Um, and they, they're excited when they get out of here and they get their first job. Um, and some of them stick with it for years. Some of them do it for two years and realize, eh, maybe this is not what I want to do. Um, but we know they can do their jobs once they leave here. Um, and that's, again, you know, the polarization of the political sides, how to report that. They know that when they leave here, they've gotten good guidance on um, how to do it in an equitable fashion. I hope that answers your question. Yes, that's, that answers uh, uh, my question. I think we have uh, uh, answered all of the questions also from the audience, Excellent. and uh, we need to wrap this up. Thank you, thank you, Jim, for sharing uh, the work you've been doing with the with the students and how you uh, earn those awards and how you produce uh, programs and, and do journalism. Uh, stuff. Um, so uh, we need to wrap up uh, this day as well. So Youth Media Conference uh, day number one is uh, just about over and we still have another day uh, to come where we will talk more about politics, about political initiatives uh, and we will also have another panel discussion uh, and also some uh, uh, workshops and experience stories from 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 TVNet, from Delphi, from uh, all kinds of uh, media, and uh, you all of this you can find on our uh, webpage uh, youngmediasharks.eu. There's a full uh, full program and full schedule, and uh, hope I will see you tomorrow as well. But for this day, I'm. Uh, Thanking my team behind this uh, youth media conference and the organizers for setting this up. And uh, let's meet tomorrow uh, at 9.45. Until, goodbye.